Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Calpine TV. Some of the world's top tourist attractions might not be here much longer. So let's count down seven disappearing destinations. Starting with the European Alps at number seven. If you've ever dreamt of skiing the high peaks and endless slopes of the European Alps, well, you better book your flights while you can. Since the Alps are situated at a lower altitude than other mountain ranges, they're way more susceptible to the warmer weathers brought on by climate change. In fact, temperatures in the region are rising at more than twice the global average. Experts have estimated that the glaciers only have until 2050 before they're gone. Coming in at number 6 is Venice, Italy. This is probably the first one that comes to mind when you think of disappearing destinations. The city of Venice and the 118 small islands that make it up have been sinking now for centuries. But as the sea levels rise faster than ever, alarm bells are ringing. Experts predict that the floating city will be completely underwater by 2100. Number five is Sub-Saharan Africa. The region's desert has been gradually advancing south with it thanks to a change in rainfall patterns and an increase in land use. If this shift continues, the landscape of Sub-Saharan Africa will be drastically changed. And if that's not bad enough, the rare glaciers in Nairobi, Kenya are set to disappear in the next two decades due to global warming. Number four on our list is the French vineyards. Lovers of the renowned French wines better start stocking up because rising temperatures in the traditional winemaking regions of the country, like Bordeaux, are causing widespread concern among winemakers. This is because grapes are hypersensitive to changes in climate, and so any increase in temperature could devastate the vineyards and France's wine industry. Coming in at number three is Glacier Bay, Alaska. While the state of Alaska is home to glorious snowy peaks and over 100,000 glaciers, a whopping 95% of them are shrinking. Worldwide temperature increases affect higher latitudes at faster rates, which is why Alaska's annual average temperature is rising twice as fast as the rest of the US. Although sadly, just like the European Alps, melting snow and glaciers is a global theme of late, thanks once again to climate change. Number two on our list is the Maldives. Situated in the southwest of India, this 1,190 island archipelago is the lowest lying country in the world, which is what makes it so vulnerable to the rising sea levels. As a matter of fact, about 80% of the Maldives is just a meter above sea level, and the majority of the population live by the coast. If these waters continue to rise, the country will be the first nation to disappear into the ocean. And number one on our list of disappearing destinations is none other than the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. A long known fact, the world's largest structure made up of living organisms, aka the Great Barrier Reef, is vanishing before our eyes. The iconic World Heritage Site that can be seen from space will likely be gone in our lifetime thanks to increasing sea temperatures and mass coral bleaching. And that concludes our list. It goes without saying that these sites vanishing is saddening for locals, conservationists and tourists alike. So while you might be making plans to visit them while you still can, remember to be as ethical and eco-friendly as possible to ensure that you don't contribute to their decline. Are there any places we've missed? Let us know in the comments which disappearing destinations you're visiting first. And stick around next time for more travel insights.
Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. A very good morning to you and welcome to the Morning Outlook Report. I'm Rachel Jones reporting live from Calkine TV Sydney Studios. Now the Australian share market is expected to inch higher this morning. Yesterday the ASX carried its losses through the afternoon session as consumer staples and banks continued to weigh on the market. While the tech sector failed to hold on to gains and also closed lower. At the closing bell the S&P ASX 200 was 0.8% or 57 points lower at 7,390. The best performing sector yesterday was materials up 0.03%. The worst performing sector was consumer staples down 2.1%. The best performing stock was Polynovo. Their shares closed 25.2% higher at $1.79. The worst performing stock was ARB Corp closing 12.3% lower at $46.32. Now, looking to some business news from this morning, the block has received Bank of Spain approval for an afterpay deal. Now, the block was formerly known as Square and has received the approval in respect of the acquisition of Lanai by wholly owned indirect subsidiary Opblock of afterpay by the way of scheme of arrangement. Now that the Bank of Spain approval has been received, the scheme is fully unconditional or will be implemented without the need for further shareholder or court approval. Afterpay shares will be suspended from trading on the ASX from January the 19th. Block CDIs will start trading on the ASX under the ticker code SQ2 on January the 20th. Moving on, and the main pharma group has begun distribution of tacrolimus ointment into the U.S. Now, tacrolimus ointment is a generic version of protopic for the treatment of atopic dermatitis. According to the IQVIA, the annual U.S. market sales for tacrolimus ointment were 18 million U.S. dollars for the 12 months ending in November 2021. Maine Pharma entered into a license and supply agreement with Sandos to distribute tracolomous ointment in non-retail channels. And Oz Minerals has finalized recruitment for several new positions on its executive leadership team, positioning the company for its next phase of growth. Now, the operations executive, Matt Reed, he joined the team back in September. He will be accountable for operational performance across Oz Minerals, including the prominent Hill, Capentina and Carriages assets, as well as operational readiness for West Musgrave, should it be approved for construction. Asset general managers will be reporting into Matt. We also have Claire Parkinson join the team in October as integration executive. And also strategy and growth executive Brian Quinn will join the team in April 2022. He'll be accountable for investigating and negotiating external growth opportunities. And Michelle Ash will take up the newly created role of technology executive in March 2022. Now on that note, we'll take a very short break here, but we'll be back very soon with everything you need to know about the trading day. Stay tuned. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Calkine TV.
Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. Welcome back. I'm Rachel and you're watching the Morning Outlook Report. Now over to the U.S. and on Wall Street, the Dow Jones was up 0.51%. The S&P 500 surged by 0.92% and the Nasdaq ended 1.41% higher. Now earlier, Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell had said he expected the Fed would raise rates and end its asset purchases this year. However, the U.S. Central Bank had made no decision about the timing for tightening of monetary policy. On the other hand, the pan European Stock 600 index rose 0.84% and the MSCI's gauge of stocks across the world gained 0.72%. Oil rose to nearly 82 US dollars a barrel, supported by tight supply in hopes the rise in coronavirus cases and the spread of the Omicron variant would not derail a global demand recovery. Brent crude gained $2.69 to $83.59 a barrel. WTI last rose 3.82% to $82.22 a barrel. Gold prices rose, and that was after the U.S. dollar and U.S. Treasury yields softened. U.S. spot gold added 0.6% to 1,811 U.S. dollars an ounce. U.S. gold futures gained 0.39% to 1,805 U.S. dollars an ounce. Meanwhile, stronger risk appetite supported Bitcoin, which rose 2.05% to 42,705 US dollars, dropping below $40,000 the previous day for the first time since September. Well, that's all for your Morning Outlook report here on Calkine TV. Have a great day trading and stay tuned for more market updates and economic news live throughout the day. This is Rachel signing off for now. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Kalkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal. What's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon, you'll be notified of the latest videos. Today's video covers what is Ninja Flocky Crypto and why has NJF Coin rocketed to its all-time high? Sage here for Kalkine Media. Launched back in 2021, Ninja Flocky cryptocurrency operates on the Binance Smart Chain and has a maximum supply of 100 billion. The Ninja Flocky coin is a play-to-earn cryptocurrency and helps users generate passive income. 
The cryptocurrency's price witnessed an unexpected price surge very recently, and the Ninja Flocky crypto's price was up 98%. In this episode, we'll explore this crypto, its scope, and what else we can dig up around it. A play to earn cryptocurrency. The Ninja Flocky coin is a play to earn cryptocurrency and helps users generate passive incomes. Although it's not clear when the full version of the game will be available, users can play the demo version to understand it better. Game development is ongoing and the white paper mentions that holders can win tokens by playing games. And notably, the game comprises 50 chapters and its users can finish all the chapters, if they will, win a prize. So when a user passes a level, tokens are allotted immediately. To play the final version of the game, users will be required to have Ninja Flocky coins. And as per the white paper of the Ninja Flocky project, the mobile version of this game will be launched soon. It will be available on the Google Play Store as well as Apple Store. Transactional details. The project's website mentions tokenomics as 3% of every transaction is meant for redistribution among the holders of the Ninja Flocky coin. So meanwhile, 5% is for marketing and 1% is for liquidity. In total, 9% fees are deducted on every sale and purchase of the Ninja Flocky crypto. According to CoinMarketCap data, the self-reported circulating supply of Ninja Flocky coin is 80 billion. So to sum it up, as Ninja Flocky is a relatively new cryptocurrency, its price is expected to remain highly volatile and crypto enthusiasts should do their own research before investing in any new cryptocurrencies. Also, anyone can create a BEP-20 token on the Binance Smart Chain. And as Ninja Flocky is new, it is advisable to be cautious before investing. Thanks for your company in the report. If you do like this information, please let us know by liking, sharing and commenting on the video, especially if you have invested in Ninja Flocky. How's it going? Let us know. For more information like this, head to the website, it's calkinemedia.com. And don't forget to subscribe and press the bell icon to be notified every time there's a new video. Stay here for Calkine Media. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calpine TV. Dash Crypto gained a heap of traction on Friday, with the price rising over 4% and the trading volume up by 5%. But what is Dash? Hey, thanks for tuning in. Holly Shields here for Calcane Media. Dash is an open source blockchain that provides a fast and cheap decentralized network for global payments. According to the project's white paper, it aims to offer secured, faster transactions. The name is a portmanteau of digital cash, and it was launched in January of 2014 as a branch of Litecoin. After going live, it added more features like a two-tier network with incentivized nodes, including master nodes and decentralized project governance, InstaSend, Chainlocks, and PrivateSend. InstaSend enables instant settlement of payments, while Chainlocks aids the Dash blockchain immutable instantly, and PrivateSend provides additional transaction privacy. Software developers Evan Duffield and Kyle Hagen co-founded Dash. It was initially known as Xcoin and then Darkcoin for just two weeks before rebranding yet again to Dash in March of 2015. The maximum supply of Dash is just over 18.9 million and it can be purchased on exchanges like Binance, Coinbase Pro and Kraken. Dash has a market cap of 1.34 billion US dollars and its price has jumped by 32.55% over the past year. What's your take on Dash? Let us know in the comments and check out some of our other videos to boost your financial IQ on the world of crypto and stay up to date. Holly Shields for Calpine Media. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. 
Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV. Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Calkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal. What's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. Welcome to the Expert Talks by Calkine TV. I'm Sage, and today's guest is Mr. Joe Rowitz, the founder, CEO, and architect of the award-winning blockchain business called Dragon Chain. Known as America's Blockchain and originally created at the Walt Disney Company back in 2014, Dragon Chain is a hybrid blockchain platform focused on solving business problems at an enterprise scale. So Dragon Chain holds multiple cornerstone patents on blockchain technology ranging from scalability, interoperability and enterprise process orchestration. And we'll find out more about these today and much more, so keep watching. Very excited to bring you live today, Mr. Joe Rowitz, founder and CEO of Dragon Chain. Welcome to the show, Joe. Hello, thank you. <laughs> Great to have your company today, and I'm sure the viewers are keen to hear your insights. So let's get started. Incorporated back in 2014, Joe, that is very early on in the history of crypto. Can you share the inspiration behind your brand, please? Ah, uh, yes. Um well, I, I, I'm a longtime architect and uh, I had gotten into blockchain in 2010 and I, I was focused quite a bit on uh, the scalability and uh, ma making the technology work for a, a normal business. And uh, when Disney brought me in, uh, we started building in 2014 and, and uh, you know, at first we were called the Disney private blockchain platform. And uh, when we open sourced all of the code and released everything in 2016, uh, we had to come up with a name that did not include the the, uh, the name Disney or any of their trademarks. And uh, uh, you know, dragons seemed fitting for a Disney uh, sourced brand. And uh, you know, we have a we have a nice mascot. In fact, you can you can see the uh, the mascot here. Uh, the old that's the oldest version, but but either way. It was a very uh, friendly form of uh, branding for uh, what at the time might have sometimes been a little scary to some, or at least very abstract technology. So that was the gist of it. That's fantastic. Thanks for sharing with us. So that was a very friendly yes. blue looking mascot dragon there. <laughs> And very yes. fitting for the metaverse and the development of blockchain um, as dragons may have been seen by some people and maybe not seen by others in the very distant past. So thanks, Joe. Great to have you on the show. As a sector leader, you've been ideating blockchain since the beginning, helping businesses now getting blockchain ready as this emerging tech makes its way into the mainstream. What services does Dragon Chain offer? Or wait, should I pose that differently? What do you not do? Because you're involved in quite a lot, I noticed from your website. <laughs> right. Um, it's very, uh, we, you know, we try to take a very agnostic, uh, industry agnostic approach. So we don't focus on a single industry at all. Um, we tend to, uh, focus on, uh, I, I guess, the, the platform side of the business where, you know, blockchain as a service, uh, which would include, 
advanced types of tokenization. Um, we do a lot of scalability uh, work and, you know, bas basically making uh, real systems work with blockchain or, or leverage uh, blockchain for either proof or compliance proof or um, some of the more advanced uh, uh, capabilities are what I like to call behavior systems where you know if you look at the core uh, result of every single crypto out there um, key, key uh, being Bitcoin itself uh, is that the technology is obviously useful and valuable and very unique in influencing human behavior you know and in, in the case of bitcoin it's it's to get people to mine uh, bitcoin um but in uh in a lot of the other systems that we've uh, we've built we're looking at more advanced ways to influence the way that people work with the system um and very you know both with the tokenization but also with uh, uh some other number of other things that we can plug in um and you know but we keep it we keep it very open that uh uh if there is a use case that someone might have uh, uh focused on these all of these various capabilities that blockchain can provide uh you know we're we're there so that that's great to hear because i think people are coming up with new ideas a weekly maybe even daily so it's great to hear that you right. do provide this type of service is it open globally or do you mainly focus on american clients Definitely globally. Um, we have actually we're, we do a lot. We probably do more work uh, outside of the U.S. than inside. But uh, you know we're we're U.S. based. Uh, but uh, we we don't uh, we definitely don't restrict anything. We're we're open to working with anyone. Fantastic! Great to hear it. Well, a lot of our clients are APAC based, so hopefully you'll hear from some of them soon. So, Joe, please right. tell us a little bit more about your Holy Grail blockchain. Sorry, blockchain patterns. What does this mean yes. for Dragon Chain? Okay. Um, yeah, and we 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 went in there, and you know, primarily we we patented uh, a few of these things to protect ourselves because we knew we were uh, quite early, and we knew with our architecture we had some uh, unique uh, potential to to build some of the things that people really you know. Uh, no, uh, we're going to be uh, important, uh, like interoperability. Um, the, you know, we we filed for that patent because our system was already implemented; it was already operational. We knew uh, that we could already do that and scale and uh, effectively uh, interoperate with a lot of different systems. In fact, we have uh, what we call out as four dimensions of different types of interoperability, all the way from. Uh, the typical thing that you would, that you'd hear about on uh, crypto Twitter, like uh, tokenization, uh, interoperability, all the way to a functional, utilitarian-focused uh, interoperability between uh, traditional systems and blockchain, and we have a, a, a lot of really unique ways to handle that. Um, we also received a patent on uh, blockchain scaling, which, uh, although it's a little abstract, it, it actually defines the uh, use of an, uh, an objective measure of time as scarcity in a blockchain network and uh, we've proven it out it, it really works and uh, it's pretty amazing but it's very abstract it's very unique it's kind of hard to describe um, and then we also have things like a smart contract orchestration which because of our unique uh, model uh, we can effectively tie smart contracts together into an advanced orchestration so if you had uh, you know an enterprise business that uh, already understood in their infrastructure how to uh, orchestrate a process from beginning to end which in might include you know lots of complexity uh, we can model that entire process including the human elements uh, with smart contracts and it's very powerful and um, you know we're just getting uh, started uh, with you know seeing how people are going to use it you know the, the entire uh, reason that we built this is for the unanticipated things that people will come up with um, you know to build on blockchain so it's pretty interesting 
Absolutely. I've heard that the technology in smart contracts can save a lot of businesses a lot of money if it starts operating in this new envisioned way. So it sounds like the system's catching up with you, Joe. Sounds like you've been there waiting for all this to start to uh, unroll and unfurl around you, and it's, it's starting to happen. So a very exciting space to be watching and what Dragon Chain's up to. Um, yes, yes. I mean, I'll, I'll say the... the uh, we're, a lot of people will say it, we're very early, but I think, uh, you know, people who watch the price movements and things like that, um, it's sometimes hard to tell because it, it looks like, uh, if you come from the financial world, it looks like a bubble. Um, if you come from the tech world, it it's very foreign to a lot of uh, uh, technology people, but um, I do think that uh, what we've seen is probably going to be a blip because once... Uh, a lot of the projects understand and realize the, the real fundamental uh, uh, use, you know, primarily in my, like in my opinion, again, on the uh, <clears throat> human behavioral components and how to incentivize people to follow a certain workflow. Um, it's going to be a radically different world because uh, there's, there are a lot of things that you can really make efficient with uh, by applying marketplaces you know where where right now people you know you think uh, uh in, in some situations there's no way to measure what really is a marketplace uh, it could be a political marketplace um you know between between groups inside of a company and once you can model that and really measure it um then everything can be much more effective and more transparent it's not even that it's uh, uh an issue where you're pushing people to do something that they wouldn't want to do. It is uh, uh, much more akin to opening up an objective and mer you know, uh, merit-based system that they can see how they can be rewarded um, and let them do those things that they, uh, that, they, that they can already do with a lot more fairness. So um, there's a lot of really neat applications coming. Yes, I've heard of some bridges being built now between NFTs and DeFi, which will hopefully create hopefully create more liquidity is what I'm trying to say. But Joe, very interesting points you just brought up there. Do you think that people's behavior with blockchain and cryptocurrency will be impacted or uh, influenced by whether they view it as an asset class or a commodity or emerging tech? Do you reckon, is that what you're saying, that their um, view of it may then influence the way they behave with this technology? Uh, yes, um, and it, it is, uh, it's hard to describe very quickly, but um, if you can imagine uh, that you lay out goals. So uh, you, you, you have a business or even a, you know, a simple website and you lay out some goals and normally you have to have moderators trying to push people to do things the right way or to train them to do things the right way. Um, but with a properly applied uh, blockchain or crypto system, you can take those really, those, uh, those, how do I say, sometimes complex, sometimes not, uh, real world activities and tune them by uh, providing the transparency, providing the rewards, and then openly showing people what the, re what the rewards are. That, and and the, uh, so you have the incentives and disincentives um, for various uh, actions, in including things like security or uh, people trolling each other on the internet um, that you can effectively apply, uh, apply behavior systems to those issues and clear up a lot of what you would otherwise um, have happen, you know, um, and that maybe that's not the best way to describe it, but it's it's very interesting because it's it's all it's all combined. And uh, if you look at uh, the crypto space right now, uh, a tremendous number of people look at it in terms of uh, you know the charts and the numbers themselves, the uh, the price of Bitcoin, the price of Ethereum, the price of anything else, and that's all, that's always uh, going to be there. And it's not a negative; it is a positive thing. Um, especially to, to gather attention, but uh, effectively the fundamental uh, utility of those tokens is, in my opinion, far more important uh, because once that's tied in, um, you could say that utility tokens applied to a project are, you know, if, if you want to look at it from a financial angle uh, or from that context, that 
those tokens could effectively be a much more powerful uh, and much more direct indicator of the value of the, the uh, project itself because they're tied directly to the utility. It isn't like I can take a share of Apple uh, stock and do something with it. You know, I can buy it, I can sell it. But, you know, with uh, a, a crypto token, I can, uh, in many cases, not always, but I, in many cases, I can do something with it, which might be tied to DeFi, it might be a financial action, but it might be a totally... Um, a, 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 a transaction or action completely unrelated to any financials at all. It might literally be uh, like a token at a laundromat. I can go in and I can I can wash some clothes. I can take a token to the arcade. I can I can play a game. Um, and when you tie those things to the tokens and make the tokens more advanced than uh, just a static thing that I can put in, and uh, uh, if instead I can have other measures, you know, how long I held it, um, how I used it in the past, um, how often I'm in the facilities. Um, uh, all of those things can be taken into account and can reward me more with either mining or with uh, production of other tokens or uh, with better access to the system. Um, there are all types of really interesting advanced capabilities you can you can plug in. And we're just getting started. I mean, uh, uh, probably I'd say 80% of uh, my job over the past uh, few years has been uh, trying to figure out the best way to communicate these concepts that are uh, really abstract, right? And, uh, you know, knowing that everybody has different uh, angles to look at, at uh, this technology, um, it's, it's really unique because you have, you know, you have extremely advanced technologists and then you have people who are uh, very focused on the financials uh, all coming together and it's it's kind of messy but uh you know we're we're really we're moving far so it's taken a while i'm i'm impatient but <laughs> well you've been there right from the beginning uh, i can see why yeah. but uh, things are developing quickly um as we can see a lot of people are jumping on board a lot of institutional investment into the space and yes. those emerging economies, the developing countries that are adopting the payment transactions, peer-to-peer -peer transactions of crypto. That's interesting to see because it is helping out those people um, to gain access to this type of technology. But Joe, on that note, uh, do you think people with limited um, in knowledge or information about computer science will be disadvantaged as crypto develops into the mainstream more? I hope not. Um, <clears throat> a lot of what we're working on is focused more on, uh, I, I guess you could say the governance side uh, of things where you have people who understand either human nature or they understand uh, uh, a particular role in a system. Um, you know, uh, they might be a master at doing one thing in a system and they can effectively help tune the system to better do that one thing. Um, and you know, at some level, uh, of course, you will need uh, software people uh, to to implement those and, and integrate various things. But uh, in my opinion, a lot of uh, the issues that we have with uh, adoption and even scalability, oddly enough, um, in the crypto space, uh, come from the fact that it is largely right now. Uh, uh, controlled by, I wouldn't say controlled by, but uh, influenced by engineers that aren't looking at the business aspects. So they're, they they tend to get a little more dogmatic or religious about some of the technology. And, uh, you know, we, we try to, to step back and take a little more, uh, well, a little higher level view of things. And <clears throat> across the board, one of our biggest uh, goals that I think we've uh, we're still in the middle of it, uh, probably, but uh, but we've made great strides in simplifying the user interfaces on our systems uh, in a way that you do not have to be a technophile. You don't even have to like technology to use our systems. Uh, what we uh, you could go to Din Social and see uh, one of the probably the prime example of this. Uh, but there are others. There's Rainmaker um, and uh, there. Eternal, if you go to eternal.report, um, that <clears throat> it uses really advanced uh, forms of blockchain tech on the back end, but the front end 
is usable by a normal person. You don't have to have a hardware wallet. You don't have to have MetaMask installed. You don't have to have um, anything that a normal uh, crypto system would typically have. And yet people can use these uh, straight out of the box right away. Uh, it just feels like a traditional uh, website. Um, but we're using all of this technology in the back end to do the things that really matter. And uh, there are so many different ways to look at that. Um, it's really interesting. And uh, that, that's been a huge goal because if you can't get normal people in and using this technology, it's going to take a lot longer to, uh, to, to build the adoption that we really need. Exactly. And that's why it's so important to have these dialogues and conversations with people like yourself, the experts right. who know all about it. And we're just helping to raise awareness of the ordinary folk who will hopefully one day also adopt this technology or, or just pique their interests a bit. So, Joe, Disney yes. has its own municipality currency for use in the park grounds. That's been going for quite a while now. And so it seemed like a perfect fit for crypto and blockchain to begin there. But these days, anti-money laundering, know your customer, it's all becoming a lot more important with these type of peer-to-peer -peer transactions too. How does Dragon Chain help to keep the crypto sector safe from cyber criminals, please? Okay, um, some of, we have a lot of different angles there. Um, uh, one of the primary things we did, which turned into our scalability patent, um, was the development of a technology focused around uh, measuring time on, on blockchain. And we, uh, our very first uh, capability that we plugged in on uh, with that was to, I wouldn't say train, but to, to, uh, to educate the people who were uh, Dragon Chain fans because they were already Disney fans. Um, and a lot of those people we're not crypto people. So we were really worried because there were so many scams going around in you know, 2016, 2017, 2018, and people lost a lot of real money. So we put this system in place to uh, effectively reward people with a measurable value um, for doing certain things that uh, vastly increased uh, their security, which you know, primarily moving their tokens to a hardware wallet rather than keeping them on exchange, um, and it turned into something that we could that we uh, plugged into our network to scale it. Um, and that's just one thing. We also have, uh, uh, I guess, a lot of what we look at is any of the um, fintech products that we provide, uh, where they are uh, a lot of times uh, focused on uh, fraud prevention. As an example, you know, and uh, with identity systems, uh, AML, KYC, um, that what we try to do is to establish a, a framework where any business can come in from anywhere in the world and uh, work with their legal team or whatever they already have uh, uh, down as a policy and effectively codify that into smart contracts, um, which with Dragon Chain is extremely easy. It's built to do uh, what would normally be very complex things like that on blockchain. Um, it's a very simple uh, uh, process to do that, but by codifying those, the great thing is uh, no matter who you need to prove something to, you know, if you need to prove to a customer that you followed uh, the privacy uh, policy that you've uh, established with, with uh, you know, publicly or under GDPR or in the US under CCPA, um, you can codify that and you can prove to your own user uh, where they can end I should say they can independently prove that you are following that policy uh, by just giving them that data and it can be you know selective exposure hey look uh, you're this is your data you're about to delete it I'm going to give you the all of these records and you can actually check uh, your these transactions all the way up to uh, Bitcoin and ethereum and know that we're telling the truth and it would cost us billions of dollars to lie to you about this. Um, and then you think about it on the other side, any other uh, KYC or AML or any other bank regulation that could be attached um, can effectively be proven to the regulators or to the tax authorities that look, we really did X, Y, Z uh, as required. And um, that becomes really powerful because it's all automated. You know, you, you don't have to have uh, a thousand accountants in, um, in a room to, uh, to be able to pull together that data um, and, and 
what's better, uh, whoever you are uh, providing that data to uh, does not have to trust you. They can, you know, they can view the data, they can view the circumstances, and uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, more detailed nuances to it um, and proving that data and having data quality, but uh, the fact that it's on chain and the fact that we can scale it to uh, make it uh, inexpensive uh, 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 to put on chain uh, means that you can prove anything that uh, might uh, be a risk right now in a traditional business. So, and then, you know, it could go into identity. There, there, there are very amazing things. Uh, we built a system in uh, 2019 related to COVID that was effectively using decentralized uh, identity uh, platform to let someone prove to their boss uh, that they had uh, either had the proper tests or whatever was necessary without exposing anything of the medical data. So we were able to, to uh, in the US, uh, have a HIPAA compliant uh, system uh, very quickly uh, because it was decentralized. So, you know, I could show to you that my score is a certain amount, which uh, has a threshold either provided by the state or the company to say, okay, you can come into work um, without exposing my actual medical data, what my test results were, um, if I'm vaccinated, anything else. So there's some neat stuff there. And, you know, we do a lot of that, but it's, it's very typically uh, a little bit um, counterintuitive. Well, I'm hearing you. What you're saying there sounds very interesting about blockchain itself being public ledger and a record keeping system that's open source. It sounds great. So, Joe, what about the future trend predictions? Quantum computers aren't that far away. How impactful are the regulators going to be? Like, do you find clients are hesitant because they don't know what the regulations are going to do and how much they're going to stir things up? Or is it because by jumping on the blockchain, do you think people feel that they may be isolated in a separate universe that's not yet part of the real world? Um, what are you finding right. from your clients? Um, it, it looks uh, to us like uh, behavior systems are uh, a golden ticket. They're, they're, uh, they're so powerful and so effective. And when people see them, they don't even know they're in place. They, they just tend to work. And so it becomes a very organic, very natural way uh, to, to build these capabilities into what your real business goals are. You know, not coming up with, oh, we need to get into crypto, so let's uh, put together some NFTs and sell them, which, you know, there's nothing wrong with that, but you think about what could really be done in the, uh, you know, the, with the main mission of a company, it's remarkable. So I. I think that's uh, really where things will be, go will be going. Um, there are a lot of other trends. There's definitely decentralized governance, which in my opinion is even a really good key component of building behavior systems um, because the, uh, the more uh, influence that your best users have on the future developments of your systems, uh, the better off you're going to be. Um, you, your systems will be more efficient, they'll be more natural, they'll be far more powerful than your competitors. And um, that's that's a big big part of what, uh, what I see coming. Um, there are, of course, a lot of other uh, utilities that will be added, uh, even with some of the NFT projects that are going on. Um, I think, uh, and it's an interesting world, but the, the gaming uh, world is there's a little bit of pushback right now on some of the play to earn and NFT modeling that's going on. But it's it's interesting because I think there might be, we might need a little more time before some of it rolls out, but there are some intensely important capabilities that can be added to traditional gaming uh, platforms that I, I, I know are coming, but it might be another um, another season before we get to that. So. We'll see. Great. Well, thank you so much for sharing your valuable insights. Really found that very informative and interesting. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And viewers, if you just joined us, we just had a very interesting discussion with Dragon Chain CEO and founder, Mr. Joe Rowitz. Please watch the full interview at Calkine Media's YouTube channel. And keep watching Calkine for more of these expert talks and live market updates. And as we say, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine.
Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calkine TV. of a Crypto Royale coin is witnessing a boost and is currently at 16.22 cents on CoinMarketCap. Let's take a closer look. I'm Rachel and you're watching Calkine Media. Over the last few months, games based on blockchain technology become popular as they give users a chance to earn cryptocurrencies. Crypto Royale is one such crypto that can be earned by playing blockchain-based games. It's a game that runs through a browser and is free to play. In addition, Crypto Royale attracts crypto enthusiasts as it's a play to earn game. To win cryptocurrency, players have to compete with each other. It does not require any upfront investment or sign up. Crypto Royale allows users to enter a game by entering a battlefield, and whoever is the last person standing gets a little profit by winning a cryptocurrency. Moons represent users in the games, and a player's character can be of three colors only blue, yellow, and pink. The ROY Crypto is the native token of Crypto Royale and it's a HRC 20 token. The maximum supply of this crypto is 400 million tokens and its circulating supply is 40 million, according to the game's website. If you are interested in the ROY Crypto, you must know that this digital asset can be held inside the game wallet, or if you want to store it externally, you have to set up a MetaMask. To withdraw, buy or sell this crypto, users will first set up MetaMask and then add the Crypto Royale token to it. By doing this, users will be able to buy, sell and withdraw this crypto. Now, if you like the information in this video, you can like, share and comment on it. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get notifications for our other videos. I'm Rachel signing off for Calkine Media. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. With the crypto space currently navigating a regulatory crackdown from governments left, right and centre, it's easy to lose sight of the guiding philosophy that cryptocurrency was built upon. When you read about crypto, a couple of adjectives that will often precede it will be peer-to-peer -peer and decentralised. But what does this mean? And are the new regulations that governments around the world, including Australia, are trying to impose undermine the central philosophy of crypto in the first place? Peer-to-peer -peer and decentralized. Cryptocurrency is the financial equivalent of a bunch of kids having a party and saying, no parents, on the invitations. In 2008, the global financial crisis hit and it was considered to be the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression in 1929. The most notable, amongst a number of contributing factors, was the issue of predatory lending by banks and other institutions where low-income home buyers were offered huge loans that they ultimately had no way of paying back. In 2009, after it became clear that many of these same banks wouldn't experience any retribution for their gross mismanagement, the first crypto blockchain, Bitcoin, was created, promising a system which was to be free of interference from third-party institutions. Whereas the traditional economy is centralized, Bitcoin was to be decentralized, ungoverned, and completely democratized, essentially giving power back to the people and away from traditional institutions and government structures. What is a DEX? 
A DEX is a decentralized exchange. And a decentralized exchange is a marketplace where transactions are peer-to-peer -peer and free of any third-party interference. DEXs fulfill an important part of crypto's foundational aspects by enabling financial transactions without banks, brokers or any other third-party institutions sticking their big old beaks into things. So how do DEXs work? One of the main aspects that differentiates a centralized exchange from a decentralized exchange is that a DEX doesn't allow exchanges between fiat and crypto. Rather, exclusively trading cryptocurrency tokens for other crypto tokens. Take Coinbase for example, which is one of the more popular centralized exchanges. Using Coinbase, a user can trade fiat for crypto and vice versa. Users of centralized exchanges can also make more advanced moves like margin trades or setting limit orders. A DEX, on the other hand, uses a special algorithm to establish the prices of various cryptos against one another. Furthermore, all the transactions on a DEX are recorded on the central piece of technology upon which crypto is built, the blockchain, as opposed to an internal database. Happy searching. If you're focused on keeping an eye on the wider crypto space, a DEX is the place to be as they offer a practically limitless range of tokens. Of course, with a wider net catching more fish, be careful with some of the tokens out there, but enjoy the variety that can only come with a decentralized exchange. If you enjoyed the information contained in this video, then please make sure to like, share, subscribe to the channel, drop us a comment about what other crypto related info you'd like us to break down, and of course, don't forget to press the bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Kalkine. For more information, just head across to the website, kalkinemedia.com. I'm James Preston, reporting for Kalkine. Good morning everyone, welcome back to Kalkine TV. This is Sage, your host for today's Executive Corner Expert Talks. And we're very lucky to have with us today Mr. Anthony Kwok, the CEO of Zilio. Have you ever bought something online and found it just doesn't fit right or look different on the website? Well, you're not alone. And in today's show, we're going to learn more about how technology and fashion confuse advantageously, creating a 3D fitting room for online shopping. And in today's show, we have Mr. Anthony Kwok, the CEO of Zilio. Welcome, Anthony. Hey, Sage. Thank you for a lovely introduction. <laughs> nice to meet you guys. Excellent. Well, being a mover and shaker in the fashion e-commerce industry, I'm keen to share your insights on the show. Thank you for joining us. Sure. Thank you for so having me. First things first, a big salute to you for rising above all the challenges thrown at you. Our audience must know that Anthony has suffered two strokes after his retirement from professional kickboxing, but emerged fitter, stronger and hungrier. Please tell us what inspires you, Anthony. Well, love the uh, first deep questions, jumping straight into deep end. But um, yeah, when I was younger, I was, for a very long time, I was bullied. So for as long as I can remember, um, I, I felt ashamed and I felt weak. I felt like a disappointment to my family, to my you know, my mum and my dad. So so I started martial arts and learned it for myself. And I became a professional fighter to take control of the situation with my own hands by force. And ever since, same with the stroke, ever since I've just been fighting in life and you know, going through challenges the same, same way. Amazing. Uh, Anthony, I don't know what to say, but I think the way that you've taken control of the situation, that is the most inspiring for me. And the technology that you use allows shoppers to see exactly how clothes fit on their bodies when shopping online. Now that sounds amazing. I don't think I've ever seen that before. I may have seen change your hairstyle or change your eye colour, but I haven't seen clothes actually 3D being fitted onto bodies. So what was your inspiration behind launching Zilio, please? I mean, I can start off by saying the business inspiration, which is, you know, we're, we're solving a trillion dollar problem. but. My, my real inspiration about it is I used to work in fashion retail and um, more, David Jones specifically. Um, and there'd be clients or customers that come in who's looking for an, an outfit for the first date, the first job interview, the prom, the formal, something life changing. And they're always, you know, a lot of them are always lacking in confidence or self esteem. 
and when we put them in the perfect fitting outfit and they look in the mirror and they see themselves like that it's magical like just the change in them it's like they're a whole different person and it was something i related to because the fashion and the sense of style did the same to me so i guess that empowerment through fashion is what is what inspires me Amazing. And the fact that you are actually genuinely sharing that experience with those girls who came shopping in your store, that's just truly remarkable. So you are changing the game of online shopping, obviously. How does Zillio's AR technology help businesses and customers? Yeah, so like I said before, we're solving a trillion dollar problem, right? And this fashion e-commerce problem of, like, online shopping has been blowing up. It has been before COVID and now with COVID it's blowing up like no tomorrow. So and what we see is that, you know, people either buy ten things online just to return eight religiously because of sizing and fit, or they avoid shopping online just to avoid the hassle of buying the wrong sizes. And the numbers back this up. Up to thirty percent of everything bought online is returned with sizing and fit being the number one biggest reason. Only three percent of all online traffic is actually converted into sales. Right, sit with that for a second. If you have a store and 100 people go into your store and only three people buy, like you don't have a business. Or you probably should shut down, but that's what it looks like for every single online fashion store. And on top of that, up to 70% of all, cart, all online shopping carts are abandoned. So by letting, and you know, with sizing and fit being the number one biggest reason, letting them off, and the numbers show this, so by showing shoppers how the clothes fit on their bodies, you know, with their own 3D avatar, and by giving them that confidence, they'll have the confidence to buy more online and to return less. Therefore helping the businesses and also helping the shoppers have a better experience. Absolutely, and sometimes postal times can take more than a couple of weeks depending where it's being posted to and from. So it's really adding extra benefits there because I know it's just such an inconvenience when something doesn't fit properly. So yeah. what do you think are the biggest challenges and opportunities today in the online shopping segment? Biggest opportunity I like to start with is social media, right? A lot of experts are talking about this topic, how if you're trying to build a brand on social media, you better do it now. You better do it well because in three, two or three years time, like Kerwin Ray, you know, says all the time, we've got three years till D-Day. Most of the money spent on marketing in the world, in the global market, is on TV. And and not much of it is, and that's by big corporations, and not much is spent on social media at the moment. But in a few years' time, social media is going to, you know, be what SEO became, or like, you know, Google search, search words and stuff. So um, in a few years' time, you won't have the opportunity anymore to build a brand unless you have a lot of capital behind you. The biggest challenge I'd say is sustainability, the environmental factor of um, online shopping, right? And there's two there's two parts to that. One of them that directly directly relates to us. The high amount of returns and yeah, the high amount of returns from online shopping. Most of them don't get you know go end up back on the, um, on the shelves. They either get burnt or they end up in landfill. And on top of that, the emissions, out of emissions from deliveries going back and forth, the numbers, if you look into it, are crazy. It adds up a lot. And yeah. Um, the second part is that because of our culture of buying so much and, and, and throwing away so much new clothes, the, the production process and creating those clothes and the landfill, like the, the whole process environmentally um, is killing our world. And I don't think we've found a solution for it. I don't think there's enough awareness for around it. So without, you know, the whole world giving it attention that it deserves, it's not an, a problem that's easily fixed. Absolutely. Having a more efficient process can definitely stop wastage and, and reduce our carbon footprint. So, Anthony, you mentioned about changing those site visits and clicks into actual sales. I wish there was some magic theory that we could apply and I love that advice you gave our viewers to act now don't delay and enter into their social media shopping um, plans and yeah. goals because soon it might be too late unless you have a lot of capital behind you so yeah. in your opinion we have to start winding up now but 
hopefully we can get a little bit more of your insights shared on the show. In your opinion, what makes Zilio unique in the market? So in a nutshell, a lot of people have tried to solve this trillion dollar problem, but no one's been able to, no one in the world's been able to pull it off. What makes us different is our solution is really like our technology is very, very scalable, which means that we can we can digitize garments in 3D on the spot, allowing us to launch into fashion labels at a very fast rate. And like uh, yeah, and this is we this hasn't been seen in the industry before. On top of that, we have a solution that actually provides a lot of value and a lot of like information about the fit. All our, all our users we've spoken to, everyone said that after using Zilio, they fully understand how the garment fits and they'll use it every single time they shop because it just wouldn't make sense not to. So having these two you know, elements, having a product that uh, you know, shoppers love and also having a technology that is scalable with what's available in the world right now is what makes us different. And these days, it's not just about serving customers, is it, Anthony? It's about a shopping experience. And it sounds like you're really making some major advances in that area. So before we wind up, are there any last closing comments or near pipeline goals you'd like to share with us? Are there any major clients who have jumped on with Zilio yet or brand partners? There have been. There have been. So we've signed up. We haven't launched commercially yet. We've launched our pilot, you know, um, but we've signed up nine fashion labels. And if you want to jump on our website, they're all listed there. But one of the biggest ones is by Bettina Liano, the Jean Queen. I'm not too sure if you if you know if you're aware, but um, massive names like Madonna, Britney Spears, they've all worn her worn her designs, and she's one of our fashion mentors and and early supporters. Um, and we have lots of brands like that. Um, and with yeah, with our technology, you'll be able to make your own 3D Zillia avatar, and you'll be able to see the fit of garments with coloured heat maps showing you where it's loose and where it's tight garment outlines showing you where it starts in the body or where it ends or how far the sleeve goes down in your arm and specific fit measurements of the garment on every single area of your body in 3D. Thank you so much for joining us and yes Bettina Liano I absolutely know about her helping to make denim the sixth element in Victoria. Yes yeah. um, absolutely she's got a lovely shop in Flinders Lane I believe. Um, yes, yes, I think Street. yes and yeah. thank you so much for joining us today anthony really appreciate the time and the thought you gave our discussion and yeah, viewers thanks. if you've just joined us we just had a very inspiring in discussion with anthony kwok the ceo of zilio and you can check out his website uh, anthony before you go do you mind sharing your website with our viewers of course it's www.zilio.com.au Perfect. Thank you so much. And you can check out the full discussion on our YouTube channel, Calkine Media, later today. And please stay tuned as we've got more expert talks and live market updates coming up for you. And as we say, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV. subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon you'll be notified of the latest videos. Today's video covers what is Ninja Flocky Crypto and why has NJF Coin rocketed to its all-time high. Sage here for Calkine Media. Launched back in 2021, Ninja Flocky cryptocurrency operates on the Binance Smart Chain and has a maximum supply of 100 billion. The Ninja Flocky coin is a play to earn cryptocurrency and helps users generate passive income. The cryptocurrency's price witnessed an unexpected price surge very recently and the Ninja Flocky crypto's price was up 98%. In this episode, we'll explore this crypto, its scope and what 
else we can dig up around it. A play to earn cryptocurrency. The Ninja Flocky coin is a play to earn cryptocurrency and helps users generate passive incomes. Although it's not clear when the full version of the game will be available, users can play the demo version to understand it better. Game development is ongoing and the white paper mentions that holders can win tokens by playing games. And notably, the game comprises 50 chapters and its users can finish all the chapters, if they will, win a prize. So when a user passes a level, tokens are allotted immediately. To play the final version of the game, users will be required to have Ninja Flocky coins. And as per the white paper of the Ninja Flocky project, the mobile version of this game will be launched soon. It will be available on the Google Play Store as well as Apple Store. Transactional details. The project's website mentions tokenomics as 3% of every transaction is meant for redistribution among the holders of the Ninja Flocky coin. So meanwhile, 5% is for marketing and 1% is for liquidity. In total, 9% fees are deducted on every sale and purchase of the Ninja Flocky crypto. According to CoinMarketCap data, the self-reported circulating supply of Ninja Flocky coin is 80 billion. So to sum it up, as Ninja Flocky is a relatively new cryptocurrency, its price is expected to remain highly volatile and crypto enthusiasts should do their own research before investing in any new cryptocurrencies. Also, anyone can create a BEP-20 token on the Binance Smart Chain. And as Ninja Flocky is new, it is advisable to be cautious before investing. Thanks for your company in the report. If you do like this information, please let us know by liking, sharing and commenting on the video, especially if you have invested in Ninja Flocky. How's it going? Let us know. For more information like this, head to the website, it's calkinemedia.com. And don't forget to subscribe and press the bell icon to be notified every time there's a new video. Stay here for Calkine Media. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calpine TV. Virgin Australia has cancelled almost one in four of its flights due for January and February as the Omicron COVID-19 outbreak disrupts crew availability and also disrupts people's travel plans. I'm Rachel Jones and this is Calkine Media. Also along with that, it has put its sole international service to Fiji on hold that's as it navigates the current Omicron outbreak. They've slashed capacity across their network and suspended all flights on 10 of its routes, including the Fiji one, which was resumed less than a month ago. 
According to the airline, customers with existing bookings on the impacted services will be reaccommodated. The airline has apologised and encourages customers to reach out for more information. Virgin Australia Chief Executive Jane Hudlicker said that one thing that the company has learned from the past two years is that they need to keep adapting to the circumstances as they change. She added that the surge in COVID-19 cases had affected customer confidence. The industry continues to face an ongoing staff shortage with frontline workers repeatedly sent into seven-day isolation when exposed to the virus. Australia recently surpassed the mark of one million cases of COVID-19, around half of which has been recorded in the last week alone. The airline had been hopeful of restoring its services to pre-pandemic levels and had planned to add seven more Boeing Co. 737NG planes to its fleet. That's to help meet a goal of obtaining a one-third share of Australia's domestic travel market. Yet the new variant came as an obstacle to those plans. Now, if you like the information in this video, you can like, share and comment on the video. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can press the bell icon to get notifications for our latest videos. I'm Rachel signing off for Calkai Media. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV. of a Crypto Royale coin is witnessing a boost and is currently at 16.22 cents on CoinMarketCap. Let's take a closer look. I'm Rachel and you're watching Calkine Media. Over the last few months, games based on blockchain technology have become popular as they give users a chance to earn cryptocurrencies. Crypto Royale is one such crypto that can be earned by playing blockchain-based games. It's a game that runs through a browser and is free to play. In addition, Crypto Royale attracts crypto enthusiasts as it's a play-to-earn game. To win cryptocurrency, players have to compete with each other. It does not require any upfront investment or sign-up. Crypto Royale allows users to enter a game by entering a battlefield, and whoever is the last person standing gets a little profit by winning a cryptocurrency. Moons represent users in the games, and a player's character can be of three colors only, blue, yellow, and pink. The ROY Crypto is the native token of Crypto Royale and it's a HRC20 token. The maximum supply of this crypto is 400 million tokens and its circulating supply is 40 million, according to the game's website. If you are interested in the ROY Crypto, you must know that this digital asset can be held inside the game wallet, or if you want to store it externally, you have to set up a MetaMask. To withdraw, buy or sell this crypto, users will first set up MetaMask and then add the Crypto Royale token to it. By doing this, users will be able to buy, sell and withdraw this crypto. Now, if you like the information in this video, you can like, share and comment on it. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get notifications for our other videos. I'm Rachel signing off for Calkai Media. I'm Sage and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. With the advent of a pandemic, 
Innovations in the field of medical healthcare and biotechnology have gained serious momentum. The need of the hour and a strong dependence on the medical system pushed these sectors to a new high. The biggest benefactors of the recent rally are the healthcare, technology and wellness solution related players who have been involved in exploring, developing and operating such beneficial projects. And in Calco Media's upcoming InvestNest webinar, you'll get the chance to discover the different innovations in the biotech and healthcare space from a host of experts. The Beyond Science Future of Biotech and Healthcare Harnessing Inventive Approaches webinar on January 28 will give you the opportunity to hear from and have your questions answered by esteemed leaders in the healthcare and biotech space who are valued clients of Calcine Media. That includes the CEO and Managing Director of PainCheck, Philip Daffis, CEO and Managing Director of Prescient Therapeutics, Stephen Yutomi Clark, and Executive Chairman and MD and CEO of Holista Coltec, Dr. Regin Marnika Vasagar. Why wait? Register now and book your space for Calco Media's upcoming InvestNest webinar on January 28, 2022 at 12.30pm Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. The registration link is mentioned in the video description below. We hope to see you there and remember to stay apprised and invest wise with Calco Media. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkind's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkind TV. Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Calkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal. What's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. Hello and welcome to Smart Market Insights on Calcane TV. I'm Holly and today we'll be looking at how disruptions in the supply chain have left customers of food businesses frustrated due to nationwide shortages. It's become increasingly evident in the past couple of weeks that the Omicron variant of COVID is posing a major problem for the Australian supply chain, with some businesses having been left with no food for customers. Specifically, the chicken shortage brought about by the supply chain woes has resulted in a number of KFC outlets vastly reducing their menu options. And it's unclear when this issue will be remedied. One particular KFC restaurant in Perth reportedly has a sign outside its store alerting customers to the absence of original chicken, zingers, fillets or wings on their menu due to shortages brought about by these issues. KFC stores have addressed this issue on the website, saying that, like many Australian businesses, their supply chain and workforce have been adversely affected by COVID-19. However, they've promised that they're working towards getting back to frying everyone's favourites as soon as possible. 
A few KFC customers have expressed their frustrations on social media, with one customer posting on the KFC Facebook page claiming they haven't been able to order their iconic Wicked Wings for two weeks now. Others took to Twitter to voice their disappointment, with one claiming that a large portion of KFC stores along the Victorian and New South Wales border have been closed altogether due to shortages. On Monday, the National Cabinet endorsed new guidelines for workers in critical supply chains, including food delivery. Prime Minister Scott Morrison announced the changes, saying it would allow close contacts between those working in food and grocery production to be able to work under certain requirements if they are met. Morrison then assured Australians that these changes had been approved by the Australian Health Protection Principle Committee. However, those workers will be required to get a negative rapid antigen test result on the first day and then take further tests every second day until day six. The PMM also said that the government would also be scrapping mandatory testing requirements for employees of small to medium businesses. Woolworths and coal supermarkets are also being adversely affected by the new Omicron variant of COVID. And Australia's Chief Medical Officer, Professor Paul Kelly, said that the Woolworths and Coles absenteeism rate has been between 30 and 50 percent, resulting in empty supermarket shelves and meat shortages. Kelly also said that he's looking into whether supply shortages had been caused by this absenteeism, I should say, or a shortage of close contact workers, and said that it was a mixture of both. The Omicron variant has been by far the worst contagious so far, which has caused major disruptions to the Australian economy. Fortunately, the side effects of this variant appear to be much more mild, and hopefully a herd immunity combined with a high vaccination rate will result in more close contact workers being able to return to work. Well, that is all for now on Smart Market Insights, but we'll be back next time for more. Tune in for those market updates only on Calcane TV. This is Holly Shields signing off. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. Good afternoon and sorry for that interruption. Thank you once again for joining us. Holly Shields here for Calkine TV. Welcoming you all to another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks. On today's show, we're joined by Charlie Gunningham, Managing Editor and Startup News, a digital publishing service dedicated to celebrating the achievements and successes of Western Australian startups and entrepreneurs. Welcome to the show, Charlie. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you, Holly. It's great to be here. Pleasure's all mine. Great to have you on. So to kick things off, in today's pandemic-induced volatile climate, many businesses are struggling to get by. Though despite this, Startup News and perhaps you yourself take pride in supporting startup spirits in WA. So what was your inspiration behind launching this company? Well, thanks, Holly. I'm not the original founder. I took over in 2018, but it was started in 2013 by a couple of startup guys here in West Australia um, who'd found that it's quite difficult to get the news of the Perth startup scene out to normal startup channels that tend to focus on eastern states. There is actually a flourishing startup scene over here in Perth, West Australia. I actually did a startup myself back in 1999. If you remember the dot-coms, I, I set up a, um, I suppose, a bit like realestate.com before realestate.com, a one called aussiehome.com back in the day. And we ran it for 10 years before we were acquired. And um, so I've had 20 years in the startup scene here in Perth. It's a flourishing ecosystem, I'm glad to say. All right. So it's flourishing, which is good to hear. And um, mm. how would you describe the co-working spaces in Western Australia? 
Yeah, probably the first uh, co-working space of, of the sort of modern type was Space Cube that set up in 2012 by Brody McCulloch. But there are now actually 55, would you believe, 55 co-working spaces around Western Australia and Perth. And about 40% of them are outside Perth, are in the regions. So uh, it's become a way of, um, I suppose, getting your startup going, not just to hire a seat or uh, a table or an, or an office, but really it's the community that is around the co-working spaces. And Space Cubed have been one of the most successful at that. They've now got, uh, I think, five, six, or even seven different locations that they either own or manage around Perth and uh, the CBD and also outside of Perth. So there's a good ecosystem here. I've, I've plotted it on Startup News. If you go to startupnews.com.au and click o Ecosystem, we've actually got 147 different co-working spaces, funding groups, accelerator programs and the like that service the tech startup early stage sector. That's incredible. It sounds like a really thriving ecosystem you have there. Mm. It and is. And it's great to see. I've sort of grown up in it myself the last 20 years. Right. So you've seen it evolve, I imagine. Definitely so. There was no co-working space, uh, Holly. There were no accelerators when I started my startup 20 years ago at all. In fact, we had to go around and try and find like-minded, crazy dot-com entrepreneurs such as ourselves uh, to get together. And we formed something called eGroup, which still meets to this day. In fact, that's one of the, the groups that meets up to give each other emotional support and advice about getting your startup going. Um, and now there's some angel groups, um, not just one in Perth, but one in Bunbury called Southwest Angels. There's a little bit of VC, not a lot of venture capital. Um, there's one group called Better Labs, and there's a, a few others now bubbling along, and others I've heard that are getting going. Um, but it's it's a good positive scene, I suppose. We're used to being isolated in Perth, and so we look after our own. We look after each other. Well, that is always good to hear. So in your opinion, what are the factors that are currently posing a challenge for those startups? Well, a couple, probably, Holly. Um, over the last year, obviously, we've had the pandemic. Um, at the time it hit, I was working for a federal government startup fund called Accelerating Commercialization, and we um, rang around all the companies that we'd given federal government money to in forms of a grant to make sure that they were okay. And we found broadly, that a third of them were unaffected by COVID. A third of them were affected a little bit, but within a few months they were fine. And a third of them were severely affected and it was sort of almost life-threatening for the business. But I'm sad to say, glad to say that within a few months, sort of this time last year, um, once we're two or three months into COVID, most of those had got over the worst, as in fact had the state. And we've been relatively unaffected by COVID, even though last week we had a um, lockdown and this week we're all wearing masks, uh, even though we're back in the office. Um, so that's sort of one thing. The other thing that probably is unique to Perth is a lack of early stage venture funding. We don't have the venture capital that you'd have and you'd see on the eastern seaboard. And um, Perth is a great place, Holly, if you want to fund a mine or if you want to do commercial property development. But if you're trying to fund a startup, it's pretty much few and far between. Um, I looked at uh, the total amount of money that was invested in WA companies last year, which was around $8 billion in WA companies. Um, I'm very sad to say only 0.3% of that, 0.3% went to early stage private sector tech businesses. So it's, it's woefully small and um, it needs it we need more early stage fund not every startup needs funding but uh, though some do and those that do need the rocket fuel to fuel their growth well those figures are certainly surprising there in your opinion mm. how can we get that rocket fuel for the growth what needs to change for that to happen Oh, Holly, if only I knew the answer. Someone could tell me the answer. I've been looking at it for 20 years and it hasn't got much better. Um, you know, back in the dot-com days, it was maybe weirdly easier to raise money. I was a school teacher and set up a crazy dot-com but raised a couple hundred thousand dollars in a few weeks. Look, there is money around. Perth's a fairly wealthy place, I think. I heard a stat. I'm, no long, I'm not sure if this is true, but I'll keep repeating it. 
that I think Perth has more self-made millionaires than any other city in the world. Um, we have a average income I think is 30 or 35 percent higher than the Australian average. So we're a fairly wealthy community, um, but we're just not used to making money in tech or funding early stage tech. We're used to making money in mining and in property. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that at all. That, that fires a lot of innovation. There's lots of good mining tech and prop tech businesses around. But um, people, I suppose, aren't used to making money by um, investing early in tech. And therefore, because they're not used to doing it, they don't do it. And because they don't do it, they don't have good experiences from it. And therefore, the wheel hasn't really turned. But I think it's changing slowly. Um, and there's now talk of more funds being set up. But um, for, for your average plucky early stage startup entrepreneur, it's still pretty lean pickings. Mm, all right. Well, that is quite unfortunate to hear, but hopefully we do get that shift that you're hoping for. Yeah, I think so. Um, I think more and more people are aware of the sector. They just don't know how to start. They don't know how to value a business and they haven't had experience of doing it. So, that, I mean, nor did I when I started, nor does any investor before they start. So, I mean, the thing to do is to get started, I suppose, and go down to Space Cubed and get involved in some accelerator programs and maybe some angel groups and, and start investing and, and seeing how you can help. Because for startups, as you know, Holly, it's not just the money, it's the mentoring, it's the advice, it's the opening doors. And someone like me, an old startup guy like me, um, I've been through the, out, the other side and been successful. I think it's important for those people then to give back and mentor the next generation. So we're seeing more of that happening. We're still early. I'm impatient, but it, it is happening slowly. And I'm sure the more we get successes, you know, we claim Canva as one of ours. I remember Mel and Cliff from Canva when they started in 2012 and they're now worth $20 billion. Um, um, obviously, they moved to Sydney almost immediately. We couldn't keep them, but they stayed in Australia. And there are some good startups coming out of Perth. And, that, you know, Health Engine and others and Sector have done well. And there's others like Isatana and IntelliCare that have listed on the stock market in the last 12 months. So there is more happening. And as more of those succeed, then I suppose that'll give more confidence to the investors coming through for the next round. All right. Yep. Fingers crossed there. And um, just on that note, with uh, with kickstarting the startups, how would you suggest people position their startups for success? Well, I think the most important thing, Holly, is to think about the customer. I think um, too many people do whinge about, like me, whinge about oh, there's no money around and we can't raise money for our startup. Look, the best money always is from customers. So if you have a if you're a founder out there and you reckon you've seen a customer problem that can be solved elegantly elegantly with technology uh, and the, the best thing is you know just build something work with your early customers get them paying you something try and uh, spin it out and, and scale it up organically the best funding for any business of course is customer income is customer revenue making sales so if you can do that then by the time if you do need money you're going to be worth more you're going to be giving less of your money away so I always tell clients look um, those in the tech businesses work with your customers love them to bits knock their socks off wow them five star stuff um, and then hopefully they'll come along with you for the ride as you scale and grow and you'll get more and more customers on you know love love the ones you're with I suppose and, and work hard on getting that product market fit with your customers Absolutely. I think that's really solid advice there. Now, I understand you do a podcast, Startup West. Could you tell us a bit about that? I do. So Startup News is a site where you can, if you look at the, if you're interested in WA Startups, we, we publish stories on startups. Nothing unusual about that. And then three years ago, um, when I took over the Startup News in 2018, because I'm an ex-property media guy. In fact, my latest venture is is the Property Tribune, which is property and media combined. So I took over Startup News. One thing I wanted to do was a podcast and get the startup founders in WA to tell their stories, partly as inspiration to people who are doing it tough on their own, that there's other people like me struggling with these issues too, and also to put them on a pedestal and, and highlight some of the better ones. So if wherever you get your podcast from, Holly, or the people listening to this, you just plug in Startup West, Startup West, you will get to our podcast. So I think we've had about 50 or so 
episodes. They're not too long. They're just a commute, about 30 minutes. So you can listen to it on a commute. And it's uh, quite fun, uh, different ones. We've had Health Engine on, we've had Sector on, we've had Functionally and other ones that I think are coming up, the next run of successful WA startups. So if you want to hear from some of them, hear some of their stories, some of their challenges, some of their mistakes, things they wish they'd known when they started, then Startup West Podcast is the place to go. That's terrific. And I think it's obviously really important to hear from the best. Mm, absolutely right. Yeah, it's inspiring for the for the for everybody else, right? And um, you know, I've done it myself, so I've made loads of mistakes, got the badge, got the T-shirt, and it's important to maybe help those others coming through, not to make the same mistakes you did, and to <laughs> highlight some of the gaps and things that they can improve on. Definitely, definitely. But apart from the podcast, do you have anything else coming up at uh, Startup News that our audience could look forward to? Yes, well, one thing we've done is plot the ecosystem. So if you, that, that's quite interesting. So as I say, at the moment, it's rather a boring Airtable. Uh, I don't know if you know Airtable, but it's one way. It's like glorified, webified uh, spreadsheets. So it's a bit of a boring list at the moment, but you can filter it, and that's quite clever. We want to really map out the ecosystem with who's involved and who's in the zoo. And that would make anyone hitting the ecosystem um, aware of uh, what's going on. Um, we've launched a new website for the podcast, startupwest.com.au. That just lo launched last week. Um, but just more of the same, really, in um, just throwing a light on the interesting and wonderful and quite um, quite large um, Perth ecosystem in, re in regards to startups over this part of the world. Right, definitely. First of all, congratulations on the launch of Startup West. And um, I hope to see that expansion of the new startups on your map. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in, love the sector and uh, really enjoy giving back and also promoting, very proud of the sector. And there's lots of people doing that, not just me, uh, that give back and mentor and advise. And um, I think I, you talked to my good friend Peter Van Brookham recently. Uh, what he does at Tech Board is great. Um, but there's a lot of people pushing the sector and really helping, uh, helping kicking it along and hopefully finding the next Canva. Right. <laughs> well, that is always good to hear, and we'll definitely be keeping an eye on that, especially at Startup West. So on that note, it's just about time to wrap up. But I've got to say thank you so much for joining us today. It's been great to hear insights. Great to win you, Holly, and thanks for everything you do as well for the business community. Great to have you on. And thanks for your time as well, viewers. Stay tuned for more live updates. And as we say here, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Calkine TV. Watch the Crypto Buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. Dash Crypto gained a heap of traction on Friday, with the price rising over 4% and the trading volume up by 5%. But what is Dash? Hey, thanks for tuning in. Holly Shields here for Calcine Media. Dash is an open source blockchain that provides a fast and cheap decentralized network for global payments. According to the project's white paper, it aims to offer secured, faster transactions. The name is a portmanteau of digital cash, and it was launched in January of 2014 as a branch of Litecoin. After going live, it added more features like a two-tier network with incentivized nodes, including master nodes and decentralized project governance, InstaSend, Chainlocks, and PrivateSend. InstaSend enables instant settlement of payments, while Chainlocks aids the Dash blockchain immutable instantly, and PrivateSend provides additional transaction privacy. Software developers Evan Duffield and Kyle Hagen co-founded Dash. 
It was initially known as Xcoin and then Darkcoin for just two weeks before rebranding yet again to Dash in March of 2015. The maximum supply of Dash is just over 18.9 million and it can be purchased on exchanges like Binance, Coinbase Pro and Kraken. Dash has a market cap of 1.34 billion US dollars and its price has jumped by 32.55% over the past year. What's your take on Dash? Let us know in the comments and check out some of our other videos to boost your financial IQ on the world of crypto and stay up to date. Holy Shields for Calpine Media. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calpine TV. Hello everyone, I'm Rachel and I welcome you all to Executive Corner Expert Talks. Today I'm with Robert Briffer. Robert is the Business Development Manager at Efficiency Works. They help to optimize business performance through people and process. Here at Calkine, we bring you industry leaders, successful business owners, market and equity advocates, all under one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock market and help you understand how you can create multiple passive income streams. Welcome to Robert from Efficiency Works. Uh, thank you. Now, first up, Robert, can you tell us about Efficiency Works and what you do? Yeah, sure. Uh, Efficiency Works is a business transformation company. Uh, we help businesses uh, through the path to operational excellence and uh, yeah, being at world class. And we do that through uh, consultancy and training. Excellent. And Robert, you've been delivering industry-leading developmental programs since 2007. Now, in your mm -hmm. opinion, why are developmental programs necessary? Yeah, sure. Well, development programs are very necessary um, because the only constant in our world is change. Uh, if we do not develop, uh, changes will obviously occur around us. Uh, and uh, will you know, then stagnate and uh, eventually decline. And there's uh, plenty of examples of that uh, in, in recent times. Well, yes, a lot of businesses have been suffering through the COVID outbreak. Now, um, mm. can you tell us, Robert, about your unique approach that results in immediate efficiency improvements to teams and organizations? Yeah, sure. Uh, our approach is to look at transformation holistically. Uh, so many organisations uh, just look at uh, people and culture uh, separately from process improvement. Uh, process uh, changes uh, are driven by people. Uh, and uh, you would only get accelerated growth in activity uh, uh, adaptivity uh, comes from organizations ability to resolve that is to find solutions and gain results uh, imagine there's discovery and new ideas uh, alignment through values and engagement and to analyze through information and proof so you really need you know, to uh, develop uh, people and then your processes uh, and you'll find to be far more successful uh, than just doing one or the other. And if we could go into a little bit more detail now, what are the range of industry leading training packages that you offer? Yeah, sure. Uh, our company Efficiency Works, uh, we provide training in the areas of process improvement, of course, uh, and leadership. Uh, process improvement training uh, is underpinned by lean methodologies. Uh, this, obviously, this is not unique. Uh, it's been around for about 70 years now. Uh, however, Efficiency Works approach is to deliver training that aligns with strategic goals and training that relates to real problems and gaining immediate results. 
Uh, we don't believe in doing training for training sake. Uh, process improvement product uh, and training that we have developed uh, is called Greenstream Planning. Uh, this training allows organisations to understand uh, where, where they will see the biggest effect of training uh, and hence apply the training to those these areas uh, as a priority. Uh, again, leadership training is not unique. Uh, however, what we deliver uh, is our training focuses on neuroscience and, uh, and change management. Uh, so these are the these are the areas that we really focus on. Again, like I said, through people and, and process. And Robert, could you share your strategies and tools that you use to deploy to engage and motivate frontline workers? Yeah, sure. And this is the biggest challenge that uh, we find that uh, all companies have. You have know, very easy to motivate uh, the leadership group, well, it should be, uh, but uh, the the front line is is where the uh, where the rubber hits the road. Um, but in our approach uh, is to understand the strategic objectives of the organisation, and then to diagnose the the organisation's ability to enact change. Uh, through assessments uh, like the uh, organization growth indicator. Uh, another one is the uh, growth leadership indicator. We have thinking intention profiles. We use the synergy values fit assessments. All of these to diagnose operational effectiveness uh, through lean maturity assessments, through probe, we really believe this is how you need to start the consultation process is to diagnose what the problems are. Um, we need, and doing that, we'll understand the current state. Uh, Efficiency Works can then map out exactly what is required to reach the strategic goals. And then we provide specific consul consultancy and training for an organization's development and process improvement where it is needed and not just a broad brush. Obviously, there are very many different strategies that you use, but how do you help organizations assess and maximize their returns? Um, we, we're looking at the in, engagement um, that comes through communication, and, and that comes from the feeling of, uh, of, of belonging. And self-motivation uh, comes from uh, what you do, or in other words, the the role uh, does a role fit with natural behaviours and cognitive ability. Uh, Efficiency Works uses uh, job fit uh, technology um, to to ensure that that personal and team development uh, is done uh, quite precisely. Uh, we can also measure engagement and exactly what is needed to improve uh, and where. Uh, other strategies we have at our disposal, uh, a strategy deployment through uh, a lean methodology called Hoshan Canary, uh, and neuro, neuro leadership of frontline and, and managers uh, in short course and uh, sort of certified course form. So this is how we, we really get to how to uh, to uh, engage those uh, frontline leaders uh, and uh, or frontline workers, and uh, and that's where you'll get your maximum benefits from. Robert, it sounds like such a fascinating space to be in, to be helping workers and businesses to achieve their best. Yes. Thank you for your time today, and thanks for the chat. No problems at all. Thank you. Now, with that, I'll sign off for now. Watch this space for more. Till then, stay abreast and invest wise with Calkine.
Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. With the advent of a pandemic, innovations in the field of medical healthcare and biotechnology have gained serious momentum. The need of the hour and a strong dependence on the medical system pushed these sectors to a new high. The biggest benefactors of the recent rally are the healthcare, technology and wellness solution related players who have been involved in exploring, developing and operating such beneficial projects. And in Calcine Media's Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. Radix touched the $1 mark, let's take a closer look. Hey and thanks for tuning in, Holly Shields here for Calcine Media. Radix Crypto is the first layer one protocol, which means it's easy for the developers to build and scale decentralized finance, reducing congestion and smart contract leaks. As Radix optimizes cross shard synchronicity, it's able to seamlessly execute smart contracts through its system. And with its unique protocol, Radix takes care of four key issues, which developers often face while building DeFi and DLT applications. So what makes it unique? Well, first of all, it was founded by Dan Hughes, and Radix Crypto uses the Byzantine fault tolerance based Cerberus consensus protocol, which allows the DeFi to scale without any friction. This helps the crypto to do all the transactions automatically across multiple shards. Radix also offers the developers incentives to ensure that the applications are properly deployed on the protocol, and the automated rewards function helps them to create a decentralized autonomous marketplace for Radix components. On top of that, users can also stake the tokens and gain rewards in the process. The crypto is available for trading on the leading crypto exchange Bitfinex and is expected to be listed on other exchanges as well. So how is Redix faring? XLD Crypto is ranked number 3340 on CoinMarketCap and even though Radix hasn't gained much momentum, it could become one of the strongest DeFi tokens by 2026. The listing on multiple exchanges should help the token to grow further, but for now, with just one exchange, some feel that its range is too limited. Its first goal is to ensure a decent rally in the market so that the investors can gain some confidence in the token. What's your take on Radix? Share your thoughts in the comments and check out some of our other videos to stay up to date. Holly Shields for Calcon Media. Hi, 
Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. Coming in VestNest webinar, you'll get the chance to discover the different innovations in the biotech and healthcare space from a host of experts. The Beyond Science Future of Biotech and Healthcare Harnessing Inventive Approaches webinar on January 28 will give you the opportunity to hear from and have your questions answered by esteemed leaders in the healthcare and biotech space who are valued clients of Kalkai Media. That includes the CEO and Managing Director of PainCheck, Philip Daffis, CEO and Managing Director of Prescient Therapeutics, Stephen Yutomi Clark, and Executive Chairman and MD and CEO of Holista Coltec, Dr. Regin Marnika Vasagar. Why wait? Register now and book your space for Calcar Media's upcoming InvestNest webinar on January 28, 2022 at 12.30pm Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. The registration link is mentioned in the video description below. We hope to see you there and remember to stay apprised and invest wise with Calcai Media. Please subscribe to the channel, press the bell icon to be notified of the latest videos. Today we're covering why is Splinter Shards or SPS crypto gaining popularity? Stay watching till the end to find out. Sage here for Kalkai Media. Splinter Shards Crypto has been gaining traction in the market after experts gave a bullish view on the token. And on Tuesday morning, it was trading flat at US $0.2195. So what is Splinter Shards? Splinter Shards tokens are governance tokens for the SPS Decentralized Autonomous Organization, or DAO. They were launched in July 2021. It mainly represents the game named Splinterlands, which is rapidly gaining popularity and earning investors' attention. Splinterlands is a digital collectible card game based on blockchain technology. It's inspired by similar games like Magic the Gathering, Hearthstone, etc. In the competitions, players build a card collection with different attributes and battle with each other and other players in matches based on skills. In the Splinterland game, players can buy, sell or trade digital currencies just like they could do in games like Magic the Gathering, Pokemon, etc. It was started back in May 2018. Splinterlands was created as a solution to players who could not own assets as the games became digital. So with the aid of blockchain technology, the players can hold and trade digital assets freely. In addition, it maintains transparency in the game, meaning all the cards of the game have a verified supply and historical record. The players battle with each other by choosing different battles, like ranked battles and practice battles. The ranked battles help players to increase their rating, and on the plus side, the beginners can also play the ranked battles without any trouble, as rating below 100 does not lose any ranking points. The battles generally happen between players having similar strengths, and in the game, the players from both sides must choose six monster cards and one summoner card for the battle. One can win the contest by destroying all the opponent's monster cards. The game, in general, is free to play, but the players must buy the summoner's spellbook for 10 US dollars to unlock the complete game. With the summoner's spellbook, players can assess several other features that could be redeemed for real currency. The game's daily users are over 0.3 million, and according to Dapp Radar, it is one of the most popular games on any blockchain. In addition, the game doesn't promote itself, so its popularity comes from word of mouth. Pricing and other details of Splinter Shards SPS token. So the SPS token was up 0.47% to reach 0.2195 US dollars on January 4th. 
Its market cap is US $76.58 million and its fully diluted market cap is $658.62 million US dollars. Its 24-hour trading volume through Tuesday morning was $2.64 million US dollars, up 39.95%. The SPS token saw the highest price of US $1.27 and the lowest price of US $0.132 in the last 52 weeks. It reached an all-time high of US $1.27 on July 28, 2021. In conclusion, the Splinter Shards SPS token gave an 18.94% return in the 12 months. It has traded on exchanges like PancakeSwap version 2, Gate.io, etc. Its maximum supply is 3 billion. Around 7,000 people check out the free basic game daily, of which about 3,000 people opt to pay 10 US dollars for the additional features. Its growing popularity is catching investors' attention. And if you do like this information, let us know by liking, sharing, commenting on the video below. Subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon. You'll be advised every time Kalkine has a new video. But for more information like this, there's a website, kalkinemedia.com. Please have a look. Thanks for watching. Stay here for Kalkine Media. Sage and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. Hi there, James Preston for Kalkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. Boarding pass, please. Hi, I'm Holly Shields, and I'll be your host for Kalkine TV's new show, Travel Insights. Tune in to get the latest developments in the travel and tourism space, from updates on restrictions to travel guides to info about recreation and outdoor activities, or tour guides to the financials of the sector. Though the travel industry has been hit hard from the pandemic, there is still potential left for a revival on the back of economic uptick and COVID safe travel measures. So if you want to know where the travel and tourism space is heading, dust off your passports, pack your bags and watch Travel Insights every Monday exclusively on Calkine TV. Hello and welcome to Kalkine TV. I'm James and you're watching The Early Trades. Let's get started with our market open commentary. Shares jumped 0.8% to 7,447.2 in the opening minutes of trading on the ASX on the back of strength in the materials and technology sectors. Liontown Resources surged by 7.1% after signing a binding offtake agreement with South Korean based LG Energy Solutions. Afterpay also jumped 5.1% on news that the Bank of Spain had approved Block's takeover of the buy now pay later giant. Zipco also advanced by 4.1%, while Mesoblast rose 4.9%, Nickel Mines added 6.7%, and 
Pilbara Minerals firmed 3.1% and TPG Telecom climbed by 5.8%. Fortescue Metals declined 0.7% after City downgraded it to a sell rating. A number of ASX companies have also provided updates this morning. Mesoblast announced positive results from a phase 3 trial of its allergenic cell therapy drug. It's used in treating chronic lower back pain associated with degenerative disc disease. The 36-month follow-up results from the 404 patient trial, which showed durable reduction in back pain. It lasted at least three years from a single intradiscal injection, and Mesoblast's share price rose 4.6% in morning trade. And now we'll take a very short break before we come back with the early trades here on Calkine TV. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calpine TV. With the advent of a pandemic, Innovations in the field of medical healthcare and biotechnology have gained serious momentum. The need of the hour and a strong dependence on the medical system pushed these sectors to a new high. The biggest benefactors of the recent rally are the healthcare, technology and wellness solution related players who have been involved in exploring, developing and operating such beneficial projects. And in Calcine Media's upcoming InvestNest webinar, you'll get the chance to discover the different innovations in the biotech and healthcare space from a host of experts. The Beyond Science Future of Biotech and Healthcare Harnessing Inventive Approaches webinar on January 28 will give you the opportunity to hear from and have your questions answered by esteemed leaders in the healthcare and biotech space who are valued clients of Calcine Media. That includes the CEO and Managing Director of PainCheck, Philip Daffis, CEO and Managing Director of Prescient Therapeutics, Stephen Yutomi Clark, and Executive Chairman and MD and CEO of Holista Coltec, Dr. Regine Marnika Vasagar. Why wait? Register now and book your space for Calcar Media's upcoming InvestNest webinar on January 28, 2022 at 12.30pm Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. The registration link is mentioned in the video description below. We hope to see you there, and remember to stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkai Media. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Calcine TV. Welcome back to the early trades. Let's continue with our market opening commentary and taking a look at a few of the announcements made by ASX companies so far this morning. Block formerly known as Square has received approval from the Bank of Spain regarding its acquisition of Afterpay. The approval marks the final step in the transaction, meaning the acquisition is unconditional and will be implemented without the need for further shareholder or court approval. Afterpay's chair, Alana Rubin, said that Afterpay, its leadership and team have shown that groundbreaking fintech innovations built in Australia can reach global proportions. Afterpay's shares will be suspended from trading on the ASX from January 19. Block CDIs will commence trading on the ASX under the symbol SQ2 on January 20. Invictus Energy has reported overwhelming demand for a share purchase plan on its opening day. The company has been undertaking capital raisings to help fund its 80% owned and operated Kaborabasa gas con condensate project in Zimbabwe. Invictus launched its share purchase plan on January 10, receiving strong demand from the share purchase plan on the opening day, hitting its target of $2 million. Given this, the company has started to accept oversubscriptions of a further $1 million, increasing the share purchase plan total to $3 million. 
Now there's further updates from ASX listed companies, but we'll get to those shortly on the early trade. Stay tuned to Calcine TV. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Calkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Calkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Calkine TV. Thanks for tuning in to Kaukine TV. This is the early trades. Let's continue with our opening market commentary and some of the announcements made by ASX listed companies this morning. Liontown Resources has signed a binding offtake term sheet with South Korean based LG Energy Solutions. The agreement is for the supply of up to 150,000 dry metric tons per annum of spodumene concentrate produced at Kathleen Valley. The initial five year term of the agreement is expected to commence in 2024 with the ability to extend for a further five years. LG will purchase 100,000 dry metric tonnes in the first year, increasing to 150,000 dry metric tonnes per year in subsequent years of the agreement. The offtake agreement with LG is the first offtake arrangement secured for Kathleen Valley. Rio Tinto's 3.34 billion Serbian lithium project contracts may be cut following last weekend's protests and road blockades by environmental activists. Rio previously planned to build a mine in the Jadar Valley near Loznica, but the local municipality has already scrapped the plan and reallocated the land. According to sources, Rio's involvement was part of an economic plan for the country, but environmentalists say the plan could cause irreversible damage to the region. In response, Rio stated all projects would meet the European Union's environmental standards. Protesters have forced President Alexander Vukic into the light in the few months leading into his next presidential campaign. Well, that's all for now on the early trade. Stay tuned to Calkine TV for the latest market insights, business news and exclusive interviews. I'm James Preston reporting for Calkine. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Calkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Calkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Calkine TV. Good morning and thanks for joining us. Holly Shields here for Calkine TV. Welcome you all to another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks. The show where we bring you industry leaders, successful business owners and market experts all under one roof to help you discover the latest economic insights. On today's show we're joined by Kurt Sandman, the Managing Director of Tractor a company that lives and breathes agribusiness to help businesses bring greater depth to their communication efforts. Welcome to the show, Kurt. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Thanks for having me on board. Great to have you on. So to kick things off, we know that the future generations depend on companies like yours to extract greater value from natural produce. To achieve this, I'm told Tractor has five distinct pillars. Could you please explain what they are? Yeah, sure. I think um, just to kick off, you know, the, the statement um, that future generations depend on us to extract greater value, well, you know, that, that in itself is really, um, I think, you know, the agricultural environments in both Australia and New Zealand at present is experiencing quite a heavy amount of disruption, um, whether it's regulation, um, whether it's environmental um, pressures or uh, technolo technological disruption as well. I think that you know there's quite a significant um, or complex environment that they're all facing, and 
Yeah, it's really, um, as agricultural marketers, we feel that, um, you know, we've both New Zealand and Australia have high quality products um, that they provide to the world. And I think that, you know, we believe that we in the markets that they're operating in at the moment are heavily price driven and there's not much sort of brand or quality that stands behind it. So our job at Tractor is to really extract more value for these uh, producers and growers who are really telling their stories and, um, you know, putting more brand in front of the products that they sell so they're worth um, to provide greater value to export markets. So within that, you know, we've got five distinct colours that um, are our, is our service model that we step behind to help them do that. And the first one's obviously quality of research. So all of our communications um, is informed by some sort of market research. And I think that we've got a really strong network of um, rural people across New Zealand and Australia that we work with to obtain insight before we start um planning and developing and executing communications. So we very much specialise in the positive research space, so we run a lot of focus groups, um, in-depth interviews and um, customer journey mapping. And then from there, um, we also offer strategic services, so we work with um, a lot of clients on advertising strategy, communication strategy, marketing strategy and right up to business strategy for small business. And it's really just helping them sort of develop a plan to really, um, you know, navigate that complex environment that I talked about earlier and get their product to market, um, whether it's nationally or internationally. And then from there, we'll then develop um, either uh, full advertising or communications plans or digital tools that help, um, you know, create a direct servicing model um, to really help them grow their, grow their product base. So, yeah, all of that's kind of underpinned by our creative offering, which is obviously developing the messages and the look and feel that, yeah, filters for all those channels. So we've got the research, we've got the strategy, we've got the advertising, um, and we've sort of the creative and digital to put it all together. So we really are a one-stop shop for agricultural marketing. Right, and they sound really key as well to the business's success. Yeah, yeah, I think um, it really depends to what level that our clients want to invest to, to help them on. But, you know, I look through and we've got today with a, with a startup business that was um, about to launch their product um, international markets and yeah it's a pretty exciting space like um, I think there's a lot of disruption happening but with that disruption um, there's a lot of opportunities so yeah we're, our job is to really help those businesses navigate that and I think that's kind of what we're doing. Absolutely and how are you managing to navigate that disruption? It's not that easy at the moment um, I think that you know, there's a lot of different factors at play. Um, the main one being the political side of things. I think that, um, you know, we always try to stay ahead of the curve by doing a lot of insight work. So we speak to a lot of farmers, we speak to a lot of industry leaders, we attend a lot of events. Um, and yeah, just try and get a general sense of yeah, where the market's going and we try and take our, uh, our clients along along that journey. So yeah, it's, I, I actually think at, uh, New Zealand and Australian agriculture has never experienced so much disruption than what it's experiencing currently. So, yeah, it's probably half of my week at the moment is just trying to keep up with what's going on. Well, that is quite surprising there, but it um, seems like you've, uh, you're tackling it quite well. And I understand that you have a project called Revealus Irrigation. I apologise if I'm saying that incorrectly. Could you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, sure. Rivulus is a global, it's actually a company, it's a global irrigation giant um, company that's actually based in, out of Israel that we've been working with for a number of years. And yeah, we've done a number of campaigns and worked with them, but um, I think the project you're referring to was the um, Vegetables Love Rivulus um, project. And it was a really interesting one because um, it was it was targeted, or it was irrigation um, communications that was targeted at growers. And we had a look at... Um, competitors and what they'd been doing in the space and they very much focused on talking about what I'd call the rational side of um, customer justification so they're talking about the return on investment their products gave they're uh, talking about the quality and durability and and all those sorts of features that their products had and we kind of looked at it and there was four or five competitors all saying the same thing so in the way we went to market with it is we actually communicated the fact that um, we, we focused on the emotional side and the, the whole tagline which is vegetables love rivulus um, with a really sort of um, good looking creative behind it and yeah it's, it's worked really well because I think that at the end of the day you know the inside is farmers pride themselves, farmers and growers pride themselves on the vegetables that they produce not the tip lines that they have to produce them so yeah we very much focused on that factor and it, it paid off well. Mm -hmm. That's really good to hear. So that sort of 
part of how you distinguish yourself from your competitors? Yeah, very much so. I think that, um, you know, we operate in the only in the agricultural space and there's not many um, agencies that actually do that. And that really helps us um, create a, a strong point of difference. And, you know, we only, all of our clients are in the same sector. So we get a lot of sort of cross pollination of insight into different subsectors that make up the ag game. And I think that it really helps set us apart from um, those other agencies that sort of dip their toes in with one or two clients. All of our clients are in the one sector. So, yeah, we get a pretty good insight into how the industry operates as a whole. I don't doubt that. And um, in the past, brands like Suzuki Marine, KPMG and many more have worked with you. Could you maybe shed some light on your current clientele? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, we've got a pretty good um, mix of clientele across the agricultural landscape. So we work with um, everyone from agricultural, uh, ag chem suppliers, fertilizers, machinery, to um, uh, vet, veterinary, to pretty much all aspects. We've, we've got some, some form of client at the moment. I've actually got a monopoly board with um, all of the different sectors in ag and I think there's probably about 10% that we haven't either work, worked with now or we haven't worked with in the past. So yeah, we, we've got a pretty broad mix and um, I think, you know, with some of those clients, we work with them um, very on a very in-depth basis. So we do all of their strategy and their planning and their research and their execution. And then other clients, we just do um, execution work for. So we might develop a tool or a website or an advertising campaign. But yeah, um, we, we kind of mix who we work with depending on their needs. All right. It sounds like you've got a very diverse client base there as well. Yeah, we do. And I think that, um, you know, they are diverse, but they are all in the same sector. Um, but it does allow us, like one of the things we're really looking at at the moment, back to trying to help navigate through that complex landscape is how can we bring our clients together um, so they can actually form kind of groups and collective um, yeah, to have a collective understanding of where the market's going instead of operating in silos. So there's a few sort of exciting things that we've got planned at the moment to really help help kind of steer the agricultural market in the right direction. Well, that sounds very promising. Now, just to touch on another of your projects, reconnecting with growers. What would you say is the mission and vision of that project? Um, that is a really interesting project because we that's for insights that could fertilize one of our biggest um, parts of the sector and they are a fertilizer company and you could argue that a fertilizer supplier is primarily operating in a commodity market um, and yeah when we when they came to us and we looked at planning an initiative we we sort of did a bit of an analysis of the market and spoke to a few farmers and what was very clear to us was at the time you know farmers were crying out for partnerships and they're crying out for support um, an understanding of what they were going through because it was actually um, when the Australian droughts were on and there was you know a lot they were there was a lot they were getting hit with a lot of sort of tough things and if you looked at any sort of industry or um, agricultural publication you'd see all the same advertising where they were offering deals and services and um, trying to sort of what I'd say put out a hook to get them in and just sell them something so at the time we thought, well, what's, you know, what's Insitec's biggest um, point of difference? And, you know, it was their people. And we knew that the, the industry actually was crying out for partnerships. So all we really did was we went out to market with a campaign that heroed the Insitec pivot um, fertilizers staff and people, you know, down to their first name. And, you know, it really helped resonate with the farmers because that's what they wanted. They didn't want to see a deal in front of them. They wanted to, you know, associate with someone that actually had the care for them, their operation and what they're doing. So in a way we were just reconnecting growers with you know with people that actually wanted to have a proper partnership with them and that's why it was called reconnecting with growers right so you were essentially filling a need that was unmet by other industry personnel yeah yeah i think the ag game particularly um has a few stuff in want is to general um what i'd call sort of doing general advertising you know like um we know that the agricultural um, market, they're, they're slow to trust, but once they've got a partnership, you, you can have a very sticky tenure, so they last a long time and they're very loyal customers. And I think a lot of agricultural brands get it wrong because they try and do a hard sell up front. Um, whereas, you know, like the initiative of the IPF, they're actually putting the people up front and saying, hi, my name is you know, um, Tom, for example, and I actually want to get to know you. I don't just want to come in and facilitate a transaction and then walk away. So, yeah, I think that's one of the main, I'm giving a bit away here, but, you know, that's one of our main mandates here at Tractor is 
let's help build brands that want to get to know their customers and not just go and save them Would you say then that customer loyalty has been really key to your success? Um, yeah, in terms of the um, farming market or our clients? Farming market. Yeah, definitely. I think that, um, you know, in the marketing game, there's obviously two kind of um, facets to it. There's what we call acquisition, which is getting customers in the door, and then there's um, retention, which is, which is keeping them. And yeah, I think, you know, the, the acquisition side of agricultural marketing is quite difficult because the yeah, area of farmers have got loads of trust, the farmers have got loads of trust, loads of trust. But as long as you've got the quality product and you have a convincing story, they will come. And as long as you do your job and, you know, it goes well, they'll continue to buy off you. And, yeah, that's definitely something that we really pride ourselves in. Like, um, there's been a lot of talk around whether we're a B2B or a B2C agency. And my honest view is we're not really either. I don't really believe in splitting B2B and B2C because, you know, if you have a customer, you have a customer. And as long as you can service them in the way that they want it, doesn't really matter what their background is. Um, if you can keep them, they're going to remain a customer. Definitely, and I think I can imagine that's helped you build those long-lasting client relationships. Now, currently, you're settled. Your business is settled in uh, New Zealand and Australia. Do you have any plans for expansion on the horizon? Yeah, well, we kind of fell into Australia, really. We, we started in New Zealand and um, we went quite well, and then we picked up one Australian client, and then now that's turned into sort of eight to ten Australian clients, and now we have over, you know, well over half of our um, revenue is derived out of Australia. So it's funny how that kind of came about. And um, yeah, that being said, I think that um, we, we've got quite a strong footprint in both countries now, and we are potentially on the future looking into Asia, um, given that there's quite a close connection there as well. But um, yeah, it's early days and yeah, I think it's just a case of keeping up with the growth. <clears throat> Absolutely. Well, that'll be really good to see and we look forward to your potential expansion to Asia. So keep an eye out viewers. And on that note, it is just about time to wrap up, but I've got to say thanks so much for your time today, Kurt. It's been great to hear insights. No problem. Thanks for having me. Okay. Pleasure, to have, pleasure to have you with us. And thanks for your time as well, viewers. Stay tuned for more live updates. As we say here, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Sage and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. With the advent of a pandemic, innovations in the field of medical healthcare and biotechnology have gained serious momentum. The need of the hour and a strong dependence on the medical system pushed these sectors to a new high. The biggest benefactors of the recent rally are the healthcare, technology and wellness solution related players who have been involved in exploring, developing and operating such beneficial projects. And in Calcine Media's upcoming InvestNest webinar, you'll get the chance to discover the different innovations in the biotech and healthcare space from a host of experts. The Beyond Science Future of Biotech and Healthcare Harnessing Inventive Approaches webinar on January 28 will give you the opportunity to hear from and have your questions answered by esteemed leaders in the healthcare and biotech space who are valued clients of Calcine Media. That includes the CEO and Managing Director of PainCheck, Philip Daffis, CEO and Managing Director of Prescient Therapeutics, Stephen Yutomi Clark, and Executive Chairman and MD and CEO of Holista Coltec, Dr. Regin Marnika Vasagar. Why wait? Register now and book your space for Calco Media's upcoming InvestNest webinar on January 28, 
2022 at 12.30 p.m. Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. The registration link is mentioned in the video description below. We hope to see you there and remember to stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkai Media. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. The Morrison government first started a pandemic leave disaster payment back in July 2021. With surging infections of coronavirus now, Prime Minister Scott Morrison has reminded fellow Aussies about financial help for people affected by COVID. I'm Rachel and this is Calcine Media. So how can you claim the $750 payment for COVID-19 isolation? Well, firstly, you need to download and complete the claim for pandemic leave disaster payment from servicesaustralia.gov.au. The COVID-19 assistance provides $750 a week for a person under isolation, quarantine or for care of a COVID-19 infected patient. The eligibility criteria means you have to be above the age of 17 years and an Australian resident or a visa holder with a work permit. If a person needs the payment after seven days, they need to submit a new claim every week. Initially, the scheme was set out at $1,500 for a 14-day period. However, this has been changed to weekly support of $750 since the 9th of December. The person claiming the money must also be unable to attend work or earn any income. The condition also includes claimants not having any sick leave entitlements, pandemic sick leave or personal or carers leave. If couples claim the assistance together, there's no need to fill out separate forms. The support is taxable, which means people will need to include it in their tax returns that they file. Now, if you like the information in this video, you can like, share and comment on it and you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can also press the bell icon to get notifications for our latest videos. I'm Rachel signing off for Kalkine Media. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. So will we see stagflation in 2022? Well, let's take a look. I'm Rachel Jones and this is Kalkine Media. Amid changing headwinds, the inflation forecast for Australia remains complicated. The country has now entered another year marked with uncertainty. 
While inflation anxiety is dominant among some economists, other experts believe that inflationary expectations might be overblown. These diverging views come as uncertain policy changes lie in the backdrop. The Reserve Bank of Australia has hinted at the possibility of a rate hike. However, the bank has not given a clear timeline. The supply constraints taking shape globally have also contributed to the uncertainty around inflation in the coming months. The Australian property price journey has been unmatched by any other sector within the country. Housing prices have risen at an alarming rate, perpetually reaching new highs. However, it's important to note that an interest rate hike might put downward pressure on inflation. A rise in interest rates would have a direct impact on housing prices. As lending becomes expensive, the housing sector is expected to cool off, especially as buyers develop expectations of further rate hikes. Stagflation is a combination of low economic growth as well as rising unemployment and extremely high levels of inflation. It can be assumed that stagflation may not be a realistic possibility for Australia in 2022, though a proportion of experts are speculating inflation could persist. The indications for the job market seem positive. Rising job ads have provided a better than expected outlook for 2022. Even as surging Omicron cases loom in the background, the predictions for employment remain upbeat. Data by Australia and New Zealand banks suggests that job ads rose by 7.4% in November 2021, and this momentum is expected to continue in 2022 as well. So in a nutshell, economic recovery is expected to continue into the new year, with the labour market developing resilience along the way. Additionally, a recovery in wages could further bring out a radical change in policy action. If wages growth exceeds inflation growth, then it's highly likely that contractory policy measures would be adopted. Now, if you like the information in this video, you can like, share and comment on it. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel and you can press the bell icon to get notifications for our latest videos. I'm Rachel for Calchi Media. With the advent of a pandemic, innovations in the field of medical healthcare and biotechnology have gained serious momentum. The need of the hour and a strong dependence on the medical system pushed these sectors to a new high. The biggest benefactors of the recent rally are the healthcare, technology and wellness solution related players who have been involved in exploring, developing and operating such beneficial projects. And in Calcio Media's upcoming InvestNest webinar, you'll get the chance to discover the different innovations in the biotech and healthcare space from a host of experts. The Beyond Science Future of Biotech and Healthcare Harnessing Inventive Approaches webinar on January 28 will give you the opportunity to hear from and have your questions answered by esteemed leaders in the healthcare and biotech space who are valued clients of Calcio Media. That includes the CEO and Managing Director of PainCheck, Philip Daffis, CEO and Managing Director of Prescient Therapeutics, Stephen Utomi Clark, and Executive Chairman and MD and CEO of Holista Coltec, Dr. Regine Marnika Vasagar. Why wait? Register now and book your space for Calcar Media's upcoming InvestNest webinar on January 28, 2022 at 12.30pm Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. The registration link is mentioned in the video description below. We hope to see you there and remember to stay apprised and invest wise with Kaokai Media. Sage and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV.
Good afternoon. Great to have your company for another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks. I'm James Preston and in this discussion I'll be touching on the one thing we probably need more of and that is sleep. Peace Lily is a company that manufactures high quality yet affordable non-toxic products made from natural latex and covered with certified organic cotton. The company aims to increase the sleep quality of all Aussies through the use of sustainable products. Megara or Migs Tenekun is the founder and CEO of Peace Lily. He did indeed create the company back in 2018 and to talk more about its continuing growth, he joins me live on the show now. Migs, hopefully we can hear each other and if so, a very good afternoon to you. Thank you. Good afternoon to you. It seems like uh, you know we're all in the clear now, so that's great. Yeah. Oh, look. Let's uh, let's knock every piece of wood surrounding us. Make sure that we can get through this one. But look, great to have your company on the program now. Look, first and foremost, I've been scrolling on the phone today. I've seen all sorts of ads for the likes of koala mattresses, spinal ease pillows, all sorts of fancy tech related to sleeping. But can you put an end to the debate for us? What is the best material for mattresses? Right. So I would say latex. So when I first came into this industry, I didn't really know about uh, mattresses, didn't know about the materials that went into them. So essentially, uh, latex, uh, memory foam, EU foam and spring are the primary materials that go into mattresses. Um, and a lot of customers don't really know about the differences between them. So when I first entered, I was trying to figure out, okay, what is the best mattress material? So when I started doing my research, I figured out that you know, natural latex uh, performance wise and for a lot of other reasons is benefit more beneficial than memory foam, which is what is normally in the uh, other mattress in the box uh, companies that you see out there. So, you know, Koala, Koza, Eva, all those other ones. So what natural latex is, is it's a uh, natural material made from rubber sap, from rubber trays, and uh, it's far more durable. So we have a 25 year warranty on our products. It's uh, better for the environment um, and it's non-toxic. So in general, the performance of the latex is superior to memory foam. It's just that people don't really know about it. There's a lot of marketing towards memory foam and you know spring, uh, but I would definitely say um, natural latex is is the best material that you can use for mattresses. Oh no, I've lost the audio, James. Uh, I'm imagining for yourself, back in the day, potentially had quite a poor mattress. Is that what set you on this path to creating the world's most comfortable mattress, essentially? Did you have a, a story that really made you get into gear to get into this line of work? Yeah, so I was consulting for a bedding company uh, here in Australia. And uh, when I was consulting for them, I found out that uh, you know, there was quite a lot of practices which I didn't see as really positive for the customer. So it wasn't really about providing the best quality sleep for a customer. It was more about how can I market this product to make it sell more? And you know, you see all the uh, discounts out there, the salesmanship, you know, 50% off, 40% off. And uh, there's a lot of smoke and mirrors. You don't really know what you're getting as a consumer, which is a bit of a shame. And so, you know, when I first entered, I realized, you know, I can really try and um, change things up here and, uh, you know, provide more transparency and really try and provide uh, a better sleep experience for the customer. So yeah, that's where I came at it from, just seeing that there were some flaws in the industry and um, realizing that I could help out. Um, yeah. Now you talk about transparency there, Migs. What kind of information do you provide when someone purchases one of your products? Are they listed sort of what goes into creating the product, how much material is made up from it, and the, the actual processes? What kind of information do you supply? Yeah, correct. So we try and provide as much information as possible. So we list out all our products. We try and list out all the specs uh, for the materials within our products. Um, so for example, we use organic cotton. It has a GOTS certification to certify that it is organic. Our natural latex has its own certifications. So we try and back up everything that we provide um, with certifications uh, and showing you know, the origination of those uh, materials as well. Um, so yeah, we try and source the highest quality materials, yet we try and provide a price point which is still affordable for most customers. So we're trying to give the best of both worlds. High quality, yet still a good price point. Yeah, brilliant. So why the focus specifically to use sustainable materials in the products? Right, yeah, well as you know, someone who's seen uh, you know, how many negative impacts there are on the environment these days, 
uh, it feels like using sustainable materials, sustainable products, running a sustainable business should be the basis of what people are doing. I don't see it as something that's, you know, totally out there. It should just be what everyone's doing because, you know, we should all try and contribute to the environment in our own way. So um, that's the basis of our company. We have sustainable products. We're trying to better the environment. But of course, our aim is to improve the sleep quality of, of people because that's the industry we're in. But I just think that, you know, companies should be looking to have sustainable supply chains no matter what. Um, so yeah, that's, it's just the basis of our company. No, you're 100% right. I mean, yesterday we were having a chat with a member of the uh, Sustainable Schools Education Resources Program, essentially, which looks to provide that uh, beginning to end sort of supply chain, making sure that it's as sustainable as possible, that it's contributing to a green economy. So I think you're right on the money there. There's a huge push across all industries to get into that greener space. So I commend you for getting ahead of the curve in that sense. What are the different kind of products that your company offers? Got it. So our flagship product is a mattress. So uh, it's an all latex mattress uh, which has adjustable firmness. So when you flip it, it changes from medium to firm uh, and has a 25 year warranty. We have an adjustable bed base. So you may have seen them out there which, you know, and they're mainly for seniors or they have been in the past. So we've tried to recreate that to make it a little bit more modern and something that's suitable for all age ranges. So essentially an adjustable bed uh, you can adjust the foot, adjust the head position. There's also massage features in it. Uh, so it's a bit of kind of like a techie, uh, techie bed base, but it's something that's suitable for all age ranges. And then on top of that, we've got the regular uh, bedding products like pillows, mattress protectors, uh, and, and toppers. And, uh, but the mattress and the bed base are our flagship products. Now look, I know there's plenty of tech that goes into designing these bed bases and the mattresses itself, but I can't help but think about when you're talking about adjustable positioning of the mattress, it's very much Homer Simpson, bed goes up, bed goes down, bed goes up, bed goes down. <laughs> but no, that's incredible, the tech that's behind it. So how, how do you actually get that to work though? Is there software that runs through the mattress or is it all very mechanical? It's mechanical. So there's a linear actuator, essentially um, there's two motors on the head and the foot. So the head and the foot can uh, lift when you use a remote and uh, yeah you can select the position that you would prefer so some people who um, you don't know, prefer their head being raised a bit it can help mm. with um, you know snoring so in certain cases depending on uh, you know the kind of body that you have but there's varying benefits for uh, different kinds of sleep positions so zero gravity is one that we have so mm. it gives you kind of a weightless feeling so the head is tilted up a bit the foot is tilted up a bit and it feels like you're almost weightless, which is kind of cool. Uh, and also, you know, for people, uh, athletes with injuries, you know, if you lift your feet and you've got some kind of foot injury, it helps with your circulation. So, um, yeah, it's varying benefits with, with the adjustable bed. Yeah, it's brilliant for athletes too. I mean, I remember back to the, the PE days, we always talked about RISA, which is rest, ice, compression, elevation, referral. So we've certainly got the elevation there. So making sure that it's basically covering all bases. It's, it's pretty incredible tech. How do you put it all together? Is there a big warehouse or something that you, you work with to create your products? Yeah, so there's a supplier who we've been working with for a while now. So I went over there and designed it together with them. So. Um, essentially, we just wanted to make something that was also in line with our uh, motive of having a sustainable, you know, of having sustainable products. So we still use organic cotton, still use latex instead of using PU foam and uh, polyester on, on the bed base. Yeah, brilliant. Now, I think I know the answer to this one as well, because you're probably a little bit biased in this department. But sleep, I don't think it, it gets enough importance that it deserves to get. Do you think in general society, certainly Western society at this point in time, is getting enough sleep? And, you know, maybe it's a question more for our, our health presenter, Andy Liu, but I mean, what are the, pres the benefits around getting that extra night's sleep, the extra few hours in a night? Yeah, so I think definitely people are not getting the sleep they need. And it kind of makes sense where, you know, the society's kind of evolved uh, you know, over recent times to be a lot busier during the day. You know, people are spending more time with social activities, they have more going on with the work. Um, just in general, a lot of things are eating up at their time. And so what tends to be left on the wayside is sleep. And so people tend to think, let me sleep less, you know, um, it, it's, it's going to be okay. But really, 
the important thing is you know you can't catch up on your sleep once you lose sleep you know it's it's gone and so that's going to impact your life expectancy it's going to impact your quality of life you know you're not going to be able to focus as well in the day there's so it's linked to so many uh, things in your life that you've got to be looking after your sleep. It's so important. Um, and, you know, I see our company as being able to really spearhead that and push people towards better sleep. And, you know, what better place to start than your bedroom, your mattress, your bed? That's really where, where it all begins. Well, Migs, I'm just having a look at yourself. You're glowing on camera. It's quite clear that you've been getting a good night of sleep, that's for sure. Now, just before I let you go, why Peacely instead of some of the other brands? I know you were talking about other mattresses that come in different boxes, whether it be Koala or whatever else. We've seen them there. Aside from the sustainability argument, why is your brand the one to pick? Yeah, so what's interesting is, you know, and some people don't realise, but um, polyurethane foam, so memory foam is a polyurethane foam with added chemicals. Um, and PU foam is you know, generally used uh, in other mattresses as well. But those uh, materials can off-gas over the course of time that you spend on it. So let's say you know, you're sleeping on your mattress for eight to ten years. Over that time, you know, when there's heat uh, in your mattress, the compounds break down. That actually um, exudes into the air atmosphere, and it's going to actually you know, affect you. So mm. people don't realize that, and it's not you know, super, super high risk all the time unless there's actually really harmful chemicals in there. But in general, it's not something that you should be having. So, you know, with this natural latex, um, there's natural material. So there's no off-gassing in that way. Um, so that's one thing. It's, it's not toxic. It's not going to be off-gassing in your room. Uh, it's got a 25-year warranty. which lasts way, way longer. It's better for the environment. Um, it sleeps cooler, so especially in the Australian market. You know, cooler sleeping is going to be you know, much more beneficial. So there's a whole variety of benefits there but people just don't realize that uh, latex is as good as it is because of the marketing towards you know memory foam and PU foam so um, yeah and peacefully using latex is um, there trying to help you out so move things back well look you've sold it to me I'm keen on one that's for <laughs> sure I, just the uh, the coolness of the mattress sleep alone my partner always likes to put on the second doona. I can't stand it. There shouldn't be such a thing called a summer doona in Australia. So look, I think between the tech you've got, the cool mattress base, the lack of toxins too. Get rid of the salt lamps. We don't need them anymore. It's all there in the bed. Look, you've made a sale to me. Megara, thank you so much for your time. Sounds like you're doing incredible stuff with Peace Lily. No worries. Thank you so much, James. Thanks for having me. Mate, absolute pleasure. And yeah, if you want to check them out, just before I let you go, what is the website? Peacelily.com. Perfect. Well, thank you very much, Megara. Cool. Catch you later. See ya. That's Megara Tenekun, the founder and CEO of Peacefully. And if you missed any of that chat or you'd like to check out the rest of our expert talks, it's as easy as heading across to our YouTube channel, Kalkine Media. Stay tuned for more of the latest business and finance news. I'm James Preston for Kalkine TV. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calkine TV. What more could this man have done? This was the question posed by Judge Anthony Kelly, the judge presiding over tennis world number one Novak Djokovic's case to have his visa reinstated. This case has frankly been an embarrassment for Australia, who had perhaps been determined to display their tough stance on COVID vaccinations. Mr Djokovic's lawyer, Nicholas Wood SC, argued this morning that Djokovic had done everything that he thought was required in order for him to enter the country. Not only that, but Djokovic provided the evidence required to support his declaration when he applied for the exemption. Mr Wood said as a result of Djokovic providing sufficient evidence, the federal government initially granted him a visa. 
So clearly, something has gone seriously wrong in the time between then and when Djokovic landed in Melbourne, where he has since been detained and threatened with deportation, which has resulted in protest in front of his current hotel confinement and scathing commentary from Serbia's president. It doesn't stop there though. Even Judge Kelly admitted his own agitation this morning, telling the court the Serbian was correct in assuming his medical exemption was indeed valid. Djokovic had applied for a medical exemption from having the COVID vaccination administered, and Tennis Australia did indeed confirm that exemption had been granted following a rigorous and blind process, meaning that the identity of the applicant was unknown to the two separate independent panels. Then, last Tuesday evening, Djokovic announced via his Instagram that he would indeed be heading down under following his medical exemption approval. One has to wonder if he hadn't have made that announcement, whether we'd be here right now. The topic has, like much of the discussion surrounding COVID, vaccines and various governments over the past two years, caused an enormous split right down the centre of the country. Many were furious at the decision to allow Djokovic into the country to compete, citing elite privilege and that money talks. Perhaps their derision could have instead been aimed at Dan Andrews and Scott Morrison, the two people who have actually created this situation in the first place. Prime Minister Scott Morrison of course got involved, saying Djokovic would be on the next plane home if he couldn't provide sufficient evidence as to why he was unable to be vaccinated. But here's the problem, which seems even more evident now. Djokovic already had provided sufficient evidence, and this is where the finger pointing started with a Mexican standoff between Tennis Australia, Home Affairs and the federal government, all of them pointing a gun at one another like the end of a Tarantino film. Following Morrison's comment, Home Affairs Minister Karen Andrews said that just because the Victorian government and Tennis Australia permitted a non-vaccinated player to compete in the Australian Open, it doesn't actually mean the federal government won't enforce different requirements at the Australian border. which begs the question Judge Anthony Kelly asked in court this morning. What more could Djokovic have done? So what's the likely outcome from here? There are plenty of signs pointing to a verdict in Djokovic's favour. By the same token, the federal government has further outlined that even in that scenario, they could theoretically once again deny Djokovic a visa. One thing is for certain though, this is a royal stuff up from three parties, and none of them have the name Novak. Pape is a Binance Smart Chain driven crypto that's setting the charts on fire. Hey, and thanks for tuning in. Holly Shields here for Calcone Media. On a day when the majority of the crypto market was at a loss, the Pape token was seeing zooming up over 300%. Aside from the price surge, it also saw a massive volume spike by 150%. Pape has been on the up and up so far as it topped the charts with over 1,000% in gains last week and over 600% in gains on Monday of this week. The stellar growth has made it a worthy opponent to the likes of other metaverse tokens and those which offer crypto payment tools. Launched in April of 2021, Pape Crypto aims to be one of the leading projects which offer crypto payment services on the internet. With the growth of digital currencies, the importance of crypto-related activities has gained traction. And as a community-driven project, Pompey focuses on the development and transparency aspect. Holders of the token are provided with a redistribution of 5% of the transaction fees. Pompey also boasts a strong liquidity mechanism, as with each transaction, 2% of BNB is automatically added onto its liquidity platform. Users of the token can also earn passive income and transact in a faster, safer and more secured manner. Pape is governed by its native token of the same name and is ranked number 4081 on CoinMarketCap. And as the token is up by over 323% this week, it's not just the investors who are working overtime to capitalize on this rally. In the past 24 hours, several fake accounts have been opened under the name Pape, which is causing quite a bit of confusion. But thankfully, the developers of the project have been vigilant enough to distinguish the genuine tokens from the copycats. 
So what's your take on Pop Bay? Let us know in the comments and check out some of our other videos to stay up to date on crypto. This has been Hall Shields for Kalkai Media. With the advent of a pandemic, innovations in the field of medical healthcare and biotechnology have gained serious momentum. The need of the hour and a strong dependence on the medical system pushed these sectors to a new high. The biggest benefactors of the recent rally are the healthcare, technology and wellness solution related players who have been involved in exploring, developing and operating such beneficial projects. And in Calcone Media's upcoming InvestNest webinar, you'll get the chance to discover the different innovations in the biotech and healthcare space from a host of experts. The Beyond Science Future of Biotech and Healthcare Harnessing Inventive Approaches webinar on January 28 will give you the opportunity to hear from and have your questions answered by esteemed leaders in the healthcare and biotech space who are valued clients of Calcone Media. That includes the CEO and Managing Director of PainCheck, Philip Daffis, CEO and Managing Director of Prescient Therapeutics, Stephen Yutomi Clark, and Executive Chairman and MD and CEO of Holista Coltec, Dr. Regin Marnika Vasagar. Why wait? Register now and book your space for Calco Media's upcoming InvestNest webinar on January 28, 2022 at 12.30pm Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. The registration link is mentioned in the video description below. We hope to see you there and remember to stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkai Media. Pape is a Binance Smart Chain driven crypto that's setting the charts on fire. Hey, and thanks for tuning in. Holly Shields here for Kalkai Media. Today, when the majority of the crypto market was at a loss, the Pape token was seeing zooming up over 300%. Aside from the price surge, it also saw a massive volume spike by 150%. Pape has been on the up and up so far as it topped the charts with over 1,000% in gains last week and over 600% in gains on Monday of this week. The stellar growth has made it a worthy opponent to the likes of other metaverse tokens and those which offer crypto payment tools. Launched in April of 2021, Pape Crypto aims to be one of the leading projects which offer crypto payment services on the internet. With the growth of digital currencies, the importance of crypto-related activities has gained traction. And as a community-driven project, Pape focuses on the development and transparency aspect. Holders of the token are provided with a redistribution of 5% of the transaction fees. Pape also boasts a strong liquidity mechanism, as with each transaction, 2% of BNB is automatically added onto its liquidity platform. Users of the token can also earn passive income and transact in a faster, safer and more secured manner. Pape is governed by its native token of the same name and is ranked number 4081 on CoinMarketCap. And as the token is up by over 323% this week, it's not just the investors who are working overtime to capitalize on this rally. In the past 24 hours, several fake accounts have been opened under the name Palpe, which is causing quite a bit of confusion. But thankfully, the developers of the project have been vigilant enough to distinguish the genuine tokens from the copycats. So what's your take on Palpe? Let us know in the comments and check out some of our other videos to stay up to date on crypto. This has been Hall Shields for Calcine Media. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calkine TV. James Preston for Kalkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? 
Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. Pape is a Binance Smart Chain driven crypto that's setting the charts on fire. Hey, and thanks for tuning in. Holly Shields here for Calcone Media. On a day when the majority of the crypto market was at a loss, the Pape token was seeing zooming up over 300%. Aside from the price surge, it also saw a massive volume spike by 150%. Pape has been on the up and up so far as it topped the charts with over 1,000% in gains last week and over 600% in gains on Monday of this week. The stellar growth has made it a worthy opponent to the likes of other metaverse tokens and those which offer crypto payment tools. Launched in April of 2021, Pape Crypto aims to be one of the leading projects which offer crypto payment services on the internet. With the growth of digital currencies, the importance of crypto-related activities has gained traction. And as a community-driven project, Pompeii focuses on the development and transparency aspect. Holders of the token are provided with a redistribution of 5% of the transaction fees. Pompeii also boasts a strong liquidity mechanism, as with each transaction, 2% of BNB is automatically added onto its liquidity platform. Users of the token can also earn passive income and transact in a faster, safer and more secured manner. Pape is governed by its native token of the same name and is ranked number 4081 on CoinMarketCap. And as the token is up by over 323% this week, it's not just the investors who are working overtime to capitalize on this rally. In the past 24 hours, several fake accounts have been opened under the name Pape, which is causing quite a bit of confusion. But thankfully, the developers of the project have been vigilant enough to distinguish the genuine tokens from the copycats. So what's your take on Pape? Let us know in the comments and check out some of our other videos to stay up to date on crypto. This has been Hall Shields for Calcine Media. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV. I'm Sage and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. Radix touched the $1 mark. Let's take a closer look. Hey, and thanks for tuning in. Holly Shields here for Calcine Media.
Linux Crypto is the first layer one protocol, which means it's easy for the developers to build and scale decentralized finance, reducing congestion and smart contract leaks. As Radix optimizes cross shard synchronicity, it's able to seamlessly execute smart contracts through its system. And with its unique protocol, Radix takes care of four key issues, which developers often face while building DeFi and DLT applications. So what makes it unique? Well, first of all, it was founded by Dan Hughes, and Radix Crypto uses the Byzantine fault-tolerance-based Cerberus consensus protocol, which allows the DeFi to scale without any friction. This helps the crypto to do all the transactions automatically across multiple shards. Radix also offers the developers incentives to ensure that the applications are properly deployed on the protocol and the automated rewards function helps them to create a decentralized autonomous marketplace for Radix components. On top of that, users can also stake the tokens and gain rewards in the process. The crypto is available for trading on the leading crypto exchange Bitfinex and is expected to be listed on other exchanges as well. So how is Radix faring? XLD Crypto is ranked number 3,340 on CoinMarketCap, and even though Radix hasn't gained much momentum, it could become one of the strongest DeFi tokens by 2026. The listing on multiple exchanges should help the token to grow further, but for now, with just one exchange, some feel that its range is too limited. Its first goal is to ensure a decent rally in the market so that the investors can gain some confidence in the token. What's your take on Radix? Share your thoughts in the comments and check out some of our other videos to stay up to date. Holly Shields for Kalkine Media. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Kalkine TV. Please subscribe to the channel, press the bell icon to be notified of the latest videos. Today we're covering why is Splinter Shards or SPS crypto gaining popularity? Stay watching till the end to find out. Sage here for Kalkine Media. Splinter Shards Crypto has been gaining traction in the market after experts gave a bullish view on the token. And on Tuesday morning, it was trading flat at US $0.2195. So what are Splinter Shards? Splinter Shards tokens are governance tokens for the SPS Decentralized Autonomous Organization, or DAO. They were launched in July 2021. It mainly represents the game named Splinterlands, which is rapidly gaining popularity and earning investors' attention. Splinterlands is a digital collectible card game based on blockchain technology. It's inspired by similar games like Magic the Gathering, Hearthstone, etc. In the competitions, players build a card collection with different attributes and battle with each other and other players in matches based on skills. In the Splinterland game, players can buy, sell or trade digital currencies just like they could do in games like Magic the Gathering, Pokemon, etc. It was started back in May 2018. Splinterlands was created as a solution to players who could not own assets as the games became digital. So with the aid of blockchain technology, the players can hold and trade digital assets freely. In addition, it maintains transparency in the game, meaning all the cards of the game have a verified supply and historical record. The players battle with each other by choosing different battles, like ranked battles and practice battles. The ranked battles help players to increase their rating. And on the plus side, the beginners can also play the ranked battles without any trouble, as rating below 100 does not lose any ranking points. The battles generally happen between players having similar strengths. And in the game, the players from both sides must choose six monster cards and one summoner card for the battle. One can win the contest by destroying all the opponent's monster cards. The game, in general, is free to play, but the players must buy the summoner's spellbook for 10 US dollars to unlock the complete game. With the summoner's spellbook, 
players can assess several other features that could be redeemed for real currency. The game's daily users are over 0.3 million and according to DAP Radar, it is one of the most popular games on any blockchain. In addition, the game doesn't promote itself, so its popularity comes from word of mouth. Pricing and other details of Splinter Shard's SPS token. So the SPS token was up 0.47% to reach 0.2195 US dollars on January 4th. Its market cap is US $76.58 million and its fully diluted market cap is $658.62 million US dollars. Its 24-hour trading volume through Tuesday morning was $2.64 million US dollars, up 39.95%. The SPS token saw the highest price of US $1.27 and the lowest price of US $0.132 in the last 52 weeks. It reached an all-time high of US $1.27 on July 28, 2021. In conclusion, the Splinter Shards SPS token gave an 18.94% return in the 12 months. It has traded on exchanges like PancakeSwap version 2, Gate.io, etc. Its maximum supply is 3 billion. Around 7,000 people check out the free basic game daily, of which about 3,000 people opt to pay 10 US dollars for the additional features. Its growing popularity is catching investors' attention. And if you do like this information, let us know by liking, sharing, commenting on the video below. Subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon. You'll be advised every time Kalkine has a new video. But for more information like this, there's a website, kalkinemedia.com. Please have a look. Thanks for watching. Stay here for Kalkine Media. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calkine TV. The Morrison government first started a pandemic leave disaster payment back in July 2021. With surging infections of coronavirus now, Prime Minister Scott Morrison has reminded fellow Aussies about financial help for people affected by COVID. I'm Rachel and this is Kalkine Media. So how can you claim this $750 payment for COVID-19 isolation? Well, firstly, you need to download and complete the claim for pandemic leave disaster payment from servicesaustralia.gov.au. The COVID-19 assistance provides $750 a week for a person under isolation, quarantine or for care of a COVID-19 infected patient. The eligibility criteria means you have to be above the age of 17 years and an Australian resident or a visa holder with a work permit. If a person needs the payment after seven days, they need to submit a new claim every week. Initially, the scheme was set out at $1,500 for a 14-day period. However, this has been changed to weekly support of $750 since the 9th of December. The person claiming the money must also be unable to attend work or earn any income. The condition also includes claimants not having any sick leave entitlements, pandemic sick leave or personal or carers leave. If couples claim the assistance together, there's no need to fill out separate forms. The support is taxable, which means people will need to include it in their tax returns that they file. Now, if you like the information in this video, you can like, share and comment on it and you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can also press the bell icon to get notifications for our latest videos. I'm Rachel signing off for Kalkai Media. With the advent of a pandemic, innovations in the field of medical healthcare and biotechnology have gained serious momentum. The need of the hour and a strong dependence on the medical system pushed these sectors to a new high. 
The biggest benefactors of the recent rally are the healthcare, technology, and wellness solution related players who have been involved in exploring, developing, and operating such beneficial projects. And in Kalkai Media's upcoming InvestNest webinar, you'll get the chance to discover the different innovations in the biotech and healthcare space from a host of experts. The Beyond Science Future of Biotech and Healthcare Harnessing Inventive Approaches webinar on January 28 will give you the opportunity to hear from and have your questions answered by esteemed leaders in the healthcare and biotech space who are valued clients of Kalkai Media. That includes the CEO and Managing Director of PainCheck, Philip Daffis, CEO and Managing Director of Prescient Therapeutics, Stephen Yutomi Clark, and Executive Chairman and MD and CEO of Holista Coltec, Dr. Regine Marnika Vasagar. Why wait? Register now and book your space for Calcar Media's upcoming InvestNest webinar on January 28, 2022 at 12.30pm Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. The registration link is mentioned in the video description below. We hope to see you there and remember to stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkai Media. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calkine TV. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Calkine TV. Watch the Crypto Buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. Thank you for watching Kalkine TV. We have some breaking news to share with you. I'm Sage. Some mining giants have paused their mining production amid heavy rainfall in southeastern Brazil. The heavy rain has caused floods in the northeast and has also resulted in the harvest delay in the Midwest. Rainfall is forecasted to remain heavy this week. And let us look at the regions affected by this rainfall in more detail. Minas Gerais, the top mining state, is going through heavy rains, causing deadly floods with railways and roads blocked. Over the weekend, the canyon rock face collapsed, leading to the death of 10 people visiting the waterfall. Rainfall is forecasted to remain heavy this week. The northeastern state of Bahia reported displacement of over 50,000 families and deaths of approximately two dozen during the holidays. These companies are suffering due to heavy rainfall. Vale SA, a Brazilian multinational corporation, is the second largest producer of iron ore. The company reported that it has partially suspended its operations at its southern and southeastern iron ore system due to heavy rain. Campania Siderurgica Nacional and Usiminas are Brazilian steelmakers and have also announced Operation Halts. A joint venture between Anglo-Australian multinational BHP and Vale. Samarco also reported that its Germano complex is presently operating at 50% capacity because of bad weather. And since the dike is overflowing after heavy rainfall over the weekend, France's Valerec also paused its operations at Pau Branco Mine. So to sum it up, the iron ore producers are significantly affected by the heavy rain in Brazil, which is predicted to continue this week. Companies have updated the shareholders that yearly targets will be met despite the heavy rain. Let's see how the year goes for the mining giants. Thanks for joining us on the report. Please keep watching Calcine TV for further market updates and expert interviews. Sage signing off.
Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. Will we see stagflation in 2022? Well, let's take a look. I'm Rachel Jones and this is Calci Media. Amid changing headwinds, the inflation forecast for Australia remains complicated. The country has now entered another year marked with uncertainty. While inflation anxiety is dominant among some economists, other experts believe that inflationary expectations might be overblown. These diverging views come as uncertain policy changes lie in the backdrop. The Reserve Bank of Australia has hinted at the possibility of a rate hike. However, the bank has has not given a clear timeline. The supply constraints taking shape globally have also contributed to the uncertainty around inflation in the coming months. The Australian property price journey has been unmatched by any other sector within the country. Housing prices have risen at an alarming rate, perpetually reaching new highs. However, it's important to note that an interest rate hike might put downward pressure on inflation. A rise in interest rates would have a direct impact on housing prices. As lending becomes expensive, the housing sector is expected to cool off, especially as buyers develop expectations of further rate hikes. Stagflation is a combination of low economic growth, as well as rising unemployment and extremely high levels of inflation. It can be assumed that stagflation may not be a realistic possibility for Australia in 2022, though a proportion of experts are speculating inflation could persist. The indications for the job market seem positive. Rising job ads have provided a better than expected outlook for 2022. Even as surging Omicron cases loom in the background, the predictions for employment remain upbeat. Data by Australia and New Zealand banks suggests that job ads rose by 7.4% in November 2021, and this momentum is expected to continue in 2022 as well. So in a nutshell, economic recovery is expected to continue into the new year, with the labour market developing resilience along the way. Additionally, a recovery in wages could further bring out a radical change in policy action. If wages growth exceeds inflation growth, then and it's highly likely that contractory policy measures would be adopted. Now, if you like the information in this video, you can like, share and comment on it. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel and you can press the bell icon to get notifications for our latest videos. I'm Rachel for Calci Media. Good afternoon, great to have your company for another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks. I'm James Preston and in this discussion I'll be touching on the one thing we probably need more of and that is sleep. Peace Lily is a company that manufactures high quality yet affordable non-toxic products made from natural latex and covered with certified organic cotton. The company aims to increase the sleep quality of all Aussies through the use of sustainable products. Megara or Migs Tenakoon is the founder and CEO of Peace Lily. He did indeed create the company back in 2018 and to talk more about its continuing growth, he joins me live on the show now. Migs, hopefully we can hear each other and if so, a very good afternoon to you. Thank you. Good afternoon to you. It seems like uh, you know we're all in the clear now, so that's great. Yeah. Oh, look, let's uh, let's knock every piece of wood surrounding us. Make sure that we can get through this one. But look, great to have your company on the program now. Look, first and foremost, I've been scrolling on the phone today. I've seen all sorts of ads for the likes of koala mattresses, spinalies, pillows, all sorts of fancy tech related to sleeping. But can you put an end to the debate for us? What is the best material for mattresses? 
Right. So I would say latex. So when I first came into this industry, I didn't really know about uh, mattresses, didn't know about the materials that went into them. So essentially, uh, latex, uh, memory foam, EU foam, and spring are the primary materials that go into mattresses. Um, and a lot of customers don't really know about the differences between them. So when I first entered, I was trying to figure out, okay, what is the best mattress material? So when I started doing my research, I figured out that you know natural latex, uh, performance-wise, and for a lot of other reasons, is benefit more beneficial than memory foam, which is what is normally in the uh, other mattress in the box uh, companies that you see out there. So you know Koala, Koza, Eva, all those other ones. So what natural latex is is it's a uh, natural material made from rubber sap from rubber trays, and uh, it's far more durable. So we have a 25-year warranty on our products. It's uh, better for the environment, um, and it's non-toxic. So in general, the performance of the latex is superior to memory foam. It's just that people don't really know about it. There's a lot of marketing towards memory foam and you know spring, uh, but I would definitely say um, natural latex is, is the best material that you can use for mattresses. Oh, no. I've lost the audio, James. Uh, I'm imagining for yourself, back in the day, potentially had quite a poor mattress. Is that what set you on this path to creating the world's most comfortable mattress, essentially? Did you have a, a story that really made you get into gear to get into this line of work? Yeah, so I was consulting for a bedding company uh, here in Australia. And uh, when I was consulting for them, I found out that uh, you know there was quite a lot of practices which I didn't see as really positive for the customer. So it wasn't really about providing the best quality sleep for a customer. It was more about how can I market this product to make it sell more. And, you know, you see all the uh, discounts out there, the salesmanship, you know, 50% off, 40% off. And uh, there's a lot of smoke and mirrors. You don't really know what you're getting as a consumer, which is a bit of a shame. And so, you know, when I first entered, I realized, you know, I can really try and um, change things up here and uh, you know, provide more transparency and really try and provide uh, a better sleep experience for the customer. So yeah, that's where I came at it from, just seeing that there were some flaws in the industry and um, realizing that I could help out. Um, yeah. Now you talk about transparency there, Migs. What kind of information do you provide when someone purchases one of your products? Are they listed sort of what goes into creating the product, how much material is made up from it, and the, the actual processes? What kind of information do you supply? Yeah, correct. So we try and provide as much information as possible. So we list out all our products. We try and list out all the specs uh, for the materials within our products. Um, so for example, we use organic cotton. It has a GOTS certification to certify that it is organic. Our natural latex has its own certifications. So we try and back up everything that we provide um, with certifications uh, and showing you know, the origination of those uh, materials as well. Um, so yeah, we try and source the highest quality materials, yet we try and provide a price point which is still affordable for most customers. So we're trying to give the best of both worlds. High quality, yet still a good price point. Yeah, brilliant. So why the focus specifically to use sustainable materials in the products? Right, yeah, well, as you know, someone who's seen uh, you know, how many negative impacts there are on the environment these days, uh, it feels like using sustainable materials, sustainable products, running a sustainable business should be the basis of what people are doing. I don't see it as something that's, you know, totally out there. It should just be what everyone's doing because, you know, we should all try and contribute to the environment in our own way. So um, that's the basis of our company. We have sustainable products. We're trying to better the environment. But of course, our aim is to improve the sleep quality of, of people because that's the industry we're in. But I just think that you know companies should be looking to have sustainable supply chains no matter what. Um, so yeah, that's it's just the basis of our company. Now you're 100 percent right. I mean, yesterday we were having a chat with a member of the uh, Sustainable Schools Education Resources Program, essentially, which looks to provide that uh, beginning to end sort of supply chain, making sure that it's as sustainable as possible, that it's contributing to a green economy. So I think you're right on the money there. There's a huge push across all industries to get into that greener space. So I commend you for getting ahead of the curve in that sense. What are the different kind of products that your company offers? Got it. So our flagship product is our mattress. So uh, 
Uh, it's an all latex mattress uh, which has adjustable firmness. So when you flip it, it changes from medium to firm uh, and has a 25 year warranty. We have an adjustable bed base. So you may have seen them out there, which you know, and they're mainly for seniors or they have been in the past. So we've tried to recreate that to make it a little bit more modern and something that's suitable for all age ranges. So essentially an adjustable bed, uh, you can adjust the foot, adjust the head position. There's also massage features in it. Uh, so it's a bit of kind of like a techie, uh, techie bed base, but it's something that's suitable for all age ranges. And then on top of that, we've got the regular uh, bedding products like pillows, mattress protectors uh, and toppers. And, uh, but the mattress and the bed base are our flagship products. Now look, I know there's plenty of tech that goes into designing these bed bases and the mattresses itself, but I can't help but think about when you're talking about adjustable positioning of the mattress, it's very much Homer Simpson, bed goes up, bed goes down, bed goes up, bed goes down. <laughs> but no, that's incredible, the tech that's behind it. So how, how do you actually get that to work though? Is there software that runs through the mattress or is it all very mechanical? It's mechanical. So there's a linear actuator, essentially um, there's two motors on the head and the foot. So the head and the foot can uh, lift when you use a remote. And uh, yeah, you can select the position that you would prefer. So some people who um, you don't know, prefer their head being raised a bit, it can help mm. with um, you know, snoring. So in certain cases, depending on uh, you know, the kind of body that you have, but there's varying benefits for uh, different kinds of sleep positions. So zero gravity is one that we have. So mm. it gives you kind of a weightless feeling. So the head is tilted up a bit, the foot is tilted up a bit, and it feels like you're almost weightless, which is kind of cool. Uh, and also, you know, for people, uh, athletes with injuries, you know, if you lift your feet and you've got some kind of foot injury, it helps with your circulation. So, um, yeah, it's varying benefits with, with the adjustable leg. Yeah, it's brilliant for athletes too. I mean, I remember back to the, the PE days, we always talked about RISA, which is rest, ice, compression, elevation, referral. So we've certainly got the elevation there. So making sure that it's basically covering all bases. It's, it's pretty incredible tech. How do you put it all together? Is there a big warehouse or something that you, you work with to create your products? Yeah, so there's a supplier who been we've been working with for a while now. So I went over there and designed it together with them. So. Um, essentially, we just wanted to make something that was also in line with our uh, motive of having a sustainable, you know, of having sustainable products. So we still use organic cotton, still use latex instead of using PU foam and uh, polyester on, on the bed base. Yeah, brilliant. Now, I think I know the answer to this one as well, because you're probably a little bit biased in this department. But sleep, I don't think it, it gets enough importance that it deserves to get. Do you think in general society, certainly Western society at this point in time, is getting enough sleep? And, you know, maybe it's a question more for our, our health presenter, Andy Liu, but I mean, what are the, the benefits around getting that extra night's sleep, the extra few hours in a night? Yeah, so I think definitely people are not getting the sleep they need. And it kind of makes sense where, you know, the society's kind of evolved uh, you know, over recent times to be a lot busier during the day. You know, people are uh, spending more time with social activities, they have more going on with the work. Um, just in general, a lot of things are eating up at their time. And so what tends to be left on the wayside is sleep. And so people tend to think, let me sleep less, you know, um, it, it's, it's going to be okay. But really, the important thing is, you know, you can't catch up on your sleep once you lose sleep. You know, it's, it's gone. And so that's going to impact your life expectancy. It's going to impact your quality of life. You know, you're not going to be able to focus as well in the day. There's so, it's linked to so many uh, things in your life that you've got to be looking after your sleep. It's so important. Um, and, you know, I see our company as being able to really spearhead that and push people towards better sleep. And, you know, what better place to start than your bedroom, your mattress, your bed. That's really where, where it all begins. Well, Migs, I'm just having a look at yourself. You're glowing on camera. It's quite clear that you've been getting a good night of sleep, that's for sure. Now, just before I let you go, why Peacely instead of some of the other brands? I know you were talking about other mattresses that come in different boxes, whether it be Koala or whatever else. We've seen them there. Aside from the sustainability argument, why is your yeah. brand the one to pick? Yeah, so what's interesting is, you know, and some people don't realise, but... Um, polyurethane foam, so memory foam is a polyurethane foam with added chemicals um, and PU foam is you know, generally used uh, in other mattresses as well but those uh, materials 
can off-gas over the course of time that you spend on it. So let's say you know, you're sleeping on your mattress for eight to 10 years. Over that time, you know, when there's heat uh, in your mattress, the compounds break down, that actually um, exudes into the air atmosphere and it's gonna actually you know, affect you. So mm. people don't realize that and it's not you know, super, super high risk all the time unless there's actually really harmful chemicals in there. But in general, it's not something that you should be having. So you know, with this natural latex, um, there's natural material. So there's no off-gassing in that way. Um, so that's one thing, it's, it's not toxic. It's not gonna be off-gassing in your room. Uh, it's got a 25 year warranty, just lasts way, way longer. It's better for the environment. Um, it sleeps cooler, so especially in the Australian market, you know, cooler sleeping is going to be you know, much more beneficial. So there's a whole variety of benefits there, but people just don't realize that uh, latex is as good as it is because of the marketing towards you know, memory foam and PU foam. So um, yeah, and peacefully using latex is um, there trying to help you out, so move things back. Well, look, you've sold it to me. I'm keen on one, that's for sure. I, just the, uh, the coolness of the mattress sleep alone. My partner always likes to put on the second doona. I can't stand it. There shouldn't be such a thing called a summer doona in Australia. So, look, I think between the tech you've got, the cool mattress base, the lack of toxins too. Get rid of the salt lamps. We don't need them anymore. It's all there in the bed. Look, you've made a sale to me. Megara, thank you so much for your time. Sounds like you're doing incredible stuff with Peace Lily. No worries. Thank you so much, James. Thanks for having me. My absolute pleasure, and yeah, if you want to check him out, just before I let you go, what is the website? PeaceLily.com. Perfect. Well, thank you very much, Megara. Cool. Catch you later. See ya. That's Megara Tenakoon, the founder and CEO of PeaceLily. And if you missed any of that chat or you'd like to check out the rest of our expert talks, it's as easy as heading across to our YouTube channel, Kalkine Media. Stay tuned for more of the latest business and finance news. I'm James Preston for Kalkine TV. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Kalkine TV. Hello there, Sage here, and great to have your company once again on Kalkine TV. This is the Daily Crypto Catch, brought to you by Crossgate Capital. And let's now catch up on the past 24 hours from the crypto space. And Bitcoin analysts are in the midst of a debate determining the future for the value of the world's premier digital currency. Bitcoin has made a slight recovery in the past 24 hours or so after the token dropped below 40,000 US dollars for the first time since September last year. Bitcoin has recovered 2.5% in the past 24 hours to a touch below 43,000 US dollars where it currently lies. And despite the overnight growth, traders' opinions are divided over whether this week's drop to below 40,000 US dollars will in fact be the bottom. One argument for Bitcoin's latest small surge lies in U.S. Federal Reserve Jerome Powell's announcement regarding changes to the U.S.'s fiscal policy and the market's subsequent adoption or absorption of that information. And Powell's announcement on Tuesday saying that the central bank would continue to raise interest rates if inflation continues to rise at high levels. However, what may have pleased the investors was Powell's comments later, which said it was time for the US economy to move away from the pandemic settings and return to a level of normalcy. And Bitcoin bulls have expressed their belief that Bitcoin is now entering a buy zone, which chart analysts determine 
by comparing price to spending behaviour. And these technical developments, the bulls say, indicate that Bitcoin's price has reached the bottom. However, other analysts remain less optimistic regarding Bitcoin's growth over the short term and warn investors that a pattern currently forming known as the death cross has historically been an accurate indication of a future bear market. In fact, the last time a death cross pattern appeared on Bitcoin's price chart, in June 2021, the coins of value dropped by more than 20% over the following month. For now, it seems crypto traders and investors will have to sit tight and see whether the market continues to dip or whether it reverses its course. And now we've reached the time for a short break, but we'll be back with the news in the altcoin space as well as today's biggest winners and losers, so stay tuned. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV. Welcome back to the Crypto Catch from Calkine TV brought to you by Crossgate Capital. And let's now take a look at the altcoin space just as promised. Moving on to today's winners and losers. In the face of Bitcoin and Ethereum's downward trend, some altcoins have performed extremely well, with Oasis Network climbing an impressive 23.5% in the past 24 hours to hit 45 cents US. And meanwhile, the DeFi crypto phantom jumped around 18% to reach $2.62 US over the same 24-hour period. On to the losers and 78th ranked crypto Dash dropped 4% while Chainlink also dropped 4%. And thanks for your company on that report. But that's all for today's Daily Crypto Catch. Stay tuned to Calkine TV for the latest market updates, business news and exclusive interviews. Sage signing off for now. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV. Good morning and thanks for joining us. Holly Shields here for Calkine TV. Welcome you all to another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks. The show where we bring you industry leaders, successful business owners and market experts all under one roof to help you discover the latest economic insights. On today's show, we're joined by Kurt Sandman, the Managing Director of Tractor, a company that lives and breathes agribusiness to help businesses bring greater depth to their communication efforts. Welcome to the show, Kurt. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Thanks for having me on board. Great to have you on. So to kick things off, we know that the future generations depend on companies like yours to extract greater value from natural produce. To achieve this, I'm told Tractor has five distinct pillars. Could you please explain what they are? Yeah, sure. I think um, just to kick off, you know, the, the statement um, that huge generations depend on us to extract greater value, well, you know, that, that in itself is really, um, I think, you know, the agricultural environments in both Australia and New Zealand at present is experiencing quite a heavy amount of disruption, um, whether it's regulation, um, whether it's environmental um, pressures or uh, technolo technological disruption as well. I think that, you know, there's quite a significant um, or complex environment that they're all facing. And, yeah, it's really, um, as agricultural marketers, we feel that, um, you know, we've, both New Zealand and Australia have high-quality products um, that they provide to the world. And I think that, you know, we believe that we in the markets that they're operating in at the moment are heavily price-driven and there's not much sort of brand or quality that stands behind it. So our job at Tractor is to really 
extract more value for these uh, producers and growers who are really telling their stories and, um, you know, putting more brand on front of the products that they sell so they're worth um, to provide greater value to export markets. So within that, you know, we've got five distinct colours that um, are our, is our service model that we step behind to help them do that. And the first one's obviously quality of research. So all of our communications um, is informed by some sort of market research. And I think that We've got a really strong network of um, rural people across New Zealand and Australia that we work with to obtain insight before we start um, planning and developing and executing communications. So we very much specialise in the positive research space. So we run a lot of focus groups, um, in-depth interviews and um, customer journey mapping. And then from there, um, we also offer strategic services. So we work with um, a lot of clients on advertising strategy, communication strategy, marketing strategy, and right up to business strategy for small business. And it's really just helping them sort of develop a plan to really, um, you know, navigate that complex environment that I talked about earlier and get their product to market, um, whether it's nationally or internationally. And then from there, we'll then develop um, either uh, full advertising or communications plans or digital tools that help, um, you know, create a direct servicing model um, to really help them grow their, grow their product base. So, yeah, all of that's kind of underpinned by our creative offering, which is obviously developing the messages and the look and feel that, yeah, filters for all those channels. So we've got the research, we've got the strategy, we've got the advertising, um, and we've also got the creative and the digital to, to put them together. So we really are a one-stop shop for agricultural marketing. Right, and they sound really key as well to the business's success. Yeah, yeah, I think um, it really depends to what level that our clients want to employ us to, to help them on. But, you know, I looked through and we were talking today with a, with a startup business that was um, about to launch their product um, in international markets. And, yeah, it's a pretty exciting space. Like, um, I think there's a lot of disruption happening, but with that disruption, um, there's a lot of opportunities. So, yeah, we're, our job is to really help those businesses navigate that, and I think that's one of the Absolutely. And how are you managing to navigate that disruption? It's not that easy at the moment. Um, I think that, it's, you know, there's a lot of different factors at play. Um, the main one being the political side of things. I think that, um, you know, we always might try to stay ahead of the curve by doing a lot of insight work. So we speak to a lot of farmers, we speak to a lot of industry leaders, we attend a lot of events. Um, and yeah, just try and get a general sense of yeah, where the market's going, and we try and take our uh, our clients along along that journey. So, yeah, it's I, don't, I actually think uh, New Zealand and Australian agriculture has never experienced so much disruption than what it's experiencing currently. So yeah, it's probably half of my week at the moment is just trying to keep up with what's going on. Well, that is quite surprising there, but um, seems like you've uh, you're tackling it quite well. And I understand that you have a project called Revealus Irrigation. I apologize if I'm saying that incorrectly. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, sure. Revealus is a global, it's actually a company, it's a global irrigation giant um, company that's actually based in, out of Israel that we've been working with for a number of years. And yeah, we've done a number of campaigns and work with them, but um, I think the project you're referring to was the um, Vegetables Love Revealus um, project. and. It was a really interesting one because um, it was it was targeted or it was irrigation um, communications that was targeted at growers, and we had a look at um, com competitors and what they'd been doing in the space, and they very much focused on talking about what I'd call the rational side of um, customer justification. So they're talking about the return on investment their products gave, they're talking about the quality and durability and and all those sorts of features that their products had, and. We kind of looked at it and there was four or five competitors all saying the same thing. So in the way we went to market with it is we actually communicated the fact that um, we, we focused on the emotional side and the, the whole tagline which is vegetables love rivulus um, with a really sort of um, good looking creative behind it. And yeah, it's, it's worked really well. So I think that at the end of the day, you know, the inside is farmers pride themselves, farmers and girls pride themselves on the vegetables that they produce, not the tip lines that they, that they produce them. So, yeah, we very much focus on that factor and it, it paid off well. <laughs> that's really good to hear. So that's sort of part of how you distinguish yourself from your competitors. Yeah, very much so. I think that, um, you know, we operate in the only in the agricultural space and there's not many um, agencies that actually do that. And that really helps us um, create a 
a strong point of difference. And, you know, we only, all of our clients are in the same sector, so we get a lot of sort of cross-pollination of insight into different subsectors that make up the ag game, and I think that it really helps set us apart from um, those other agencies that sort of dip their toes in with one or two clients. All of our clients are in the one sector, so, yeah, we get a pretty good insight into how the industry operates as a whole. I don't doubt that. And um, in the past, brands like Suzuki Marine, KPMG, and many more have worked with you. Could you maybe shed some light on your current clientele? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, we've got a pretty good um, mix of clientele across the agricultural landscape. So we work with um, everyone from agricultural, uh, ag chem suppliers, to fertilizers, and machinery, to um, uh, vet, veterinary, to Pretty much all aspects we've, we've got some some form of client at the moment. I've actually got a monopoly board with um, all of the different sectors in ag, and I think there's probably about ten percent that we haven't either worked work with now or we haven't worked with in the past. So, yeah, we, we've got a pretty broad mix, and um, I think you know with some of those clients we work with them um, very on a very in-depth basis. So we do all of their strategy and their planning and their research and their execution. And then other clients, we just do um, execution work for. So we might develop a tool or a website or an advertising campaign. But yeah, um, we, we kind of mix who we work with depending on their needs. All right. It sounds like you've got a very diverse client base there as well. Yeah, we do. And I think that, um, you know, they are diverse, but they are all in the same sector. Um, but it does allow us, like one of the things we're really looking at at the moment, back to trying to help navigate through that complex landscape is how can we bring our clients together um, so they can actually form kind of groups and collective, um, yeah, to have a collective understanding of where the market's going instead of operating in silos. So there's a few sort of exciting things that we've got planned at the moment to really help help kind of steer the agricultural market in the right way. Well, that sounds very promising. Now, just to touch on another of your projects, reconnecting with growers. What would you say is the mission and vision of that project? Um, that is a really interesting project because we that's for inside to fertilize one of our biggest um, tractor and they are a fertilizer company and you could argue that a fertilizer supplier is primarily operating in a commodity market. Um, and yeah, when we when they came to us and we looked at planning an initiative, we we sort of did a bit of an analysis of the market and spoke to a few farmers. And what was very clear to us was at the time, you know, farmers were crying out for partnerships and they were crying out for support um, and understanding of what they were going through because it was actually um, when the Australian droughts were on and there was, you know, a lot, they were, there was a lot, they were getting hit with a lot of sort of tough things. And if you looked at any sort of industry or um, agricultural publication, you'd see all the same advertising where they were offering deals and services and um, trying to sort of, what I'd say, put out a hook to get them in and just sell them something. So at the time we thought, well, what's, you know, what's Insitec's biggest um, point of difference? And, you know, it was their people. And we knew that the, the industry actually was crying out for partnerships. So all we really did was we went out to market with a campaign that heroed the Insitec pivot um, fertilizers staff and people, you know, down to their first name. And, you know, it really helped resonate with the farmers because that's what they wanted. They didn't want to see a deal in front of them. They wanted to, you know, associate with someone that actually had the care for them, their operation and what they're doing. So in a way, we were just reconnecting growers with, you know, with people that actually wanted to have a proper partnership with them. And that's why it was called reconnecting with growers. Right. So you were essentially filling a need that was unmet by other industry personnel. Yeah, yeah, I think the ag game particularly um, has a few stuff in want is to general, um, what I'd call sort of in general advertising, you know, like um, we know that the agricultural um, market, they're, they're slow to trust, but once they've got a partnership, you, you can have a very sticky tenure, so they last a long time and they're very loyal customers. And I think a lot of agricultural brands get it wrong because they try and do a hard sell up front. Um, whereas, you know, like the initiative of IPF, they're actually putting the people up front and saying, hi, my name is you know, um, Tom, for example, and I actually want to get to know you. I don't just want to come in and facilitate a transaction and then walk away. So, yeah, I think that's one of the main, I'm giving a bit away here, but, you know, that's one of our main mandates here at Tractor is let's help build brands that want to get to know their customers, not just go and sell them something. Would you say then that customer loyalty has been really key to your success? Um, yeah, in terms of the um, farming market or our clients? 
farming market? Yeah, definitely. I think that, um, you know, in the marketing game, there's obviously two kind of um, facets to it. There's what we call acquisition, which is getting customers in the door, and then there's um, retention, which is which is keeping them. And, yeah, I think, you know, the, the acquisition side of agricultural marketing is quite difficult because, yeah, it's the earlier farmers have got loads of trust, but farmers have got loads of trust, loads of trust. But as long as you've got the quality product and you have a convincing story, they will come. And as long as you do your job and, you know, it goes well, they'll continue to buy off you. And, yeah, that's definitely something that we really pride ourselves in. Like, um, there's been a lot of talk around whether we're a B2B or a B2C agency. And my honest view is we're not really either. I don't really believe in splitting B2B and B2C because, you know, if you have a customer, you have a customer. And as long as you can service them in the way that they want it, doesn't really matter what their background is. Um, if you can keep them, they're going to remain a customer. Definitely, and I think I can imagine that's helped you build those long-lasting client relationships. Now, currently, you're settled. Your business is settled in uh, New Zealand and Australia. Do you have any plans for expansion on the horizon? Yeah, well, we kind of fell into Australia, really. We, we started in New Zealand and um, we went quite well. And then we picked up one Australian client. And then now that's turned into sort of eight to 10 Australian clients. And now we have over, yeah, well over half of our um, revenue is derived out of Australia. So it's funny how that kind of came about. And um, yeah, that being said, I think that um, we, we've got quite a strong footprint in both countries now. And we are potentially on the future looking into Asia, um, given that there's quite a close connection there as well. But um, yeah, it's early days and yeah, I think it's just a case of keeping up with the growth. <clears throat> Absolutely. Well, that'll be really good to see and we look forward to your potential expansion to Asia. So keep an eye out viewers. And on that note, it is just about time to wrap up, but I've got to say thanks so much for your time today, Kurt. It's been a great to hear insights. No problem. Thanks for having me. Okay. Pleasure, to have, pleasure to have you with us. And thanks for your time as well, viewers. Stay tuned for more live updates. As we say here, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Sage and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. What more could this man have done? This was the question posed by Judge Anthony Kelly, the judge presiding over tennis world number one Novak Djokovic's case to have his visa reinstated. This case has frankly been an embarrassment for Australia, who had perhaps been determined to display their tough stance on COVID vaccinations. Mr Djokovic's lawyer, Nicholas Wood SC, argued this morning that Djokovic had done everything that he thought was required in order for him to enter the country. Not only that, but Djokovic provided the evidence required to support his declaration when he applied for the exemption. Mr Wood said as a result of Djokovic providing sufficient evidence, the federal government initially granted him a visa. So clearly, something has gone seriously wrong in the time between then and when Djokovic landed in Melbourne, where he has since been detained and threatened with deportation, which has resulted in protest in front of his current hotel confinement and scathing commentary from Serbia's president. It doesn't stop there though. Even Judge Kelly admitted his own agitation this morning, telling the court the Serbian was correct in assuming his medical exemption was indeed valid. Djokovic had applied for a medical exemption from having the COVID vaccination administered, and Tennis Australia did indeed confirm that exemption had been granted following a rigorous and blind process, meaning that the identity of the applicant was unknown to the two separate independent panels. Then, last Tuesday evening, Djokovic announced via his Instagram that he would indeed be heading down under following his medical exemption approval. 
One has to wonder if he hadn't have made that announcement, whether we'd be here right now. The topic has, like much of the discussion surrounding COVID, vaccines and various governments over the past two years, caused an enormous split right down the centre of the country. Many were furious at the decision to allow Djokovic into the country to compete, citing elite privilege and that money talks. Perhaps their derision could have instead been named at Dan Andrews and Scott Morrison, the two people who have actually created this situation in the first place. Prime Minister Scott Morrison of course got involved, saying Djokovic would be on the next plane home if he couldn't provide sufficient evidence as to why he was unable to be vaccinated. But here's the problem, which seems even more evident now. Djokovic already had provided sufficient evidence, and this is where the finger pointing started, with a Mexican standoff between Tennis Australia, Home Affairs and the federal government, all of them pointing a gun at one another like the end of a Tarantino film. Following Morrison's comment, Home Affairs Minister Karen Andrews said that just because the Victorian government and Tennis Australia permitted a non-vaccinated player to compete in the Australian Open, it doesn't actually mean the federal government won't enforce different requirements at the Australian border. Which begs the question Judge Anthony Kelly asked in court this morning. What more could Djokovic have done? So, what's the likely outcome from here? There are plenty of signs pointing to a verdict in Djokovic's favour. By the same token, the federal government has further outlined that even in that scenario, they could theoretically once again deny Djokovic a visa. One thing is for certain though, this is a royal stuff up from three parties, and none of them have the name Novak. Hi there, James Preston for Kalkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. With the advent of a pandemic, innovations in the field of medical healthcare and biotechnology have gained serious momentum. The need of the hour and a strong dependence on the medical system pushed these sectors to a new high. The biggest benefactors of the recent rally are the healthcare, technology and wellness solution related players who have been involved in exploring, developing and operating such beneficial projects. And in Kalkai Media's upcoming InvestNest webinar, you'll get the chance to discover the different innovations in the biotech and healthcare space from a host of experts. The Beyond Science Future of Biotech and Healthcare Harnessing Inventive Approaches webinar on January 28 will give you the opportunity to hear from and have your questions answered by esteemed leaders in the healthcare and biotech space who are valued clients of Kalkai Media. That includes the CEO and Managing Director of PainCheck, Philip Daffis, CEO and Managing Director of Prescient Therapeutics, Stephen Yutomi Clark, and Executive Chairman and MD and CEO of Holista Coltec, Dr. Regin Marnika Vasagar. Why wait? Register now and book your space for Calco Media's upcoming InvestNest webinar on January 28, 2022 at 12.30pm Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. The registration link is mentioned in the video description below. We hope to see you there, and remember to stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkine Media. Hi, 
I am Sage and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Calkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal. What's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. The Morrison government first started a pandemic leave disaster payment back in July 2021. With surging infections of coronavirus now, Prime Minister Scott Morrison has reminded fellow Aussies about financial help for people affected by COVID. I'm Rachel and this is Calcine Media. So how can you claim the $750 payment for COVID-19 isolation? Well, firstly, you need to download and complete the claim for pandemic leave disaster payment from servicesaustralia.gov.au. The COVID-19 assistance provides $750 a week for a person under isolation, quarantine, or for care of a COVID-19 infected patient. The eligibility criteria means you have to be above the age of 17 years and an Australian resident or a visa holder with a work permit. If a person needs the payment after seven days, they need to submit a new claim every week. Initially, the scheme was set out at $1,500 for a 14-day period. However, this has been changed to weekly support of $750 since the 9th of December. The person claiming the money must also be unable to attend work or earn any income. The condition also includes claimants not having any sick leave entitlements, pandemic sick leave or personal or carers leave. If couples claim the assistance together, there's no need to fill out separate forms. The support is taxable, which means people will need to include it in their tax returns that they file. Now, if you like the information in this video, you can like, share and comment on it and you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can also press the bell icon to get notifications for our latest videos. I'm Rachel signing off for Calkine Media. Hello, I'm Rachel Jones and you're watching the IPO Corner Show live from Sydney. Now Afterpay shares will be suspended from trading on the ASX from January the 19th. Block CDIs will start trading on the ASX under the symbol SQ2 <coughs> on January the 20th. Block, formerly known as Square, has received approval from the Bank of Spain regarding its acquisition of Afterpay. Now, the approval marks the final step in the transaction, meaning the acquisition is fully unconditional and will be implemented without the need for further shareholder or court approval. Afterpay's chair, Alana Rubin, says that Afterpay, its leadership and team, have shown that groundbreaking fintech innovation built in Australia 
can reach global proportions. The team are incredibly excited at the prospect of starting an extraordinary next phase with Block and look forward to implementation on the 1st of February 2022. Now let's look to the first listing of 2022, Green Tech Metals. Their shares surged higher on its debut session on the ASX. The company's shares were up 32.5% after just over an hour of trading. The company had raised $5 million at 20 cents a share as part of its initial public offering. Green Tech is an exploration and development company established to discover, develop and acquire Australian and overseas projects containing minerals and metals that are used in the battery storage and electric vehicle sectors. The company currently owns projects focused on unexplored nickel, copper and cobalt in the West Pilbara and Fraser Range provinces. Moving on in my foodie box, a rapidly expanding food technology business in WA prepares and delivers meal kits and has closed its oversubscribed IPO having raised $6 million. It started trading on the ASX on the 7th of January. It was the second IPO of 2022. Now my foodie box sources, prepares and delivers quality local ingredients straight to the doorsteps of its customers with technology platforms. With a focus on provenance, the meal kits are sourced from ethically responsible local farmers and producers and delivered in compostable, recyclable and reusable packaging. The meal kits are offered on a weekly subscription-based model with the price per meal ranging between $8 to $13 plus a standard delivery charge. Customers can also add staple pantry items as well as add-on fruit and snack boxes for their delivery. My Foodie Box now intends to expand both its offerings and its markets. Now, Friday this week is a big IPO day for the ASX. We potentially have three new listings. Chemex Materials set to list on the 14th of January. Now, they specialize in high purity alumina, a specialized product used in lithium ion batteries and LED lights and other things. Under the ticker code CMX, they currently have a dual focus exploring the Air Peninsula Halloi site. Kaolin and Magnes project in developing its upstream high pure HPA processing tech. They're set to raise $8 million. Next due to list on Friday is Far East Gold. They're set to raise $8 to $12 million at 20 cents per share. Now this explorer has a growing gold resource at the Wanaguri project in Indonesia and Moila, a project previously held by Barrett Gold and Newcrest. They also have early stage projects in Australia. And lastly, set to list on Friday is Resilience Mining Mongolia under the ticker code RM1. They raise $6 million at 20 cents a share. They're searching for large copper and gold deposits in Mongolia. They acquired their products from Kinkora Copper, which will receive a 9.9% interest in the stock on listing. The assets are close to Rio Tinto's world-class Oya Tolgoi Copper and Gold Mine. And to finish off, rumours are spreading that Canva could be interested in going public, but its lofty valuation and large implied market cap may make a U.S. capital market's present more desirable. Block's listing this month will herald the start of a strong pipeline of new faces for 2022, although the extraordinary number of IPOs in 2021 is unlikely to be repeated. Last year was a record year for jumbo stocks, those worth more than $1 billion, with eight listings, including GQG Partners, APM Human Services, PEXA Group and Latitude Financial Services getting across the line. Now, just a reminder to invest in an IPO. Prospective investors need to be registered with a participating broker or lead manager. Investors can also apply themselves by filling the application form attached to the company's prospectus. Those who've missed out need to register with a share trading platform or a broker who has access to the ASX. However, before investing in IPOs, investors must check the credibility and the track record of the company. The risk appetite level varies by investors. And they will need to consider factors such as an analyst view, brokerage ratings, industry outlook, financial performance and the peers review before making an investment decision. 
Well, that's all for now on the IPO Corner Show. Stay tuned to Calkine TV. We have many more shows lined up for you with live updates across the economy, markets and sectors. This is Rachel signing off for now. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calpine TV. Sage and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. Hello everyone, I'm Rachel and I welcome you all to Executive Corner Expert Talks. Today I'm with Robert Briffer. Robert is the Business Development Manager at Efficiency Works. They help to optimize business performance through people and process. Here at Calkine, we bring you industry leaders, successful business owners, market and equity advocates, all under one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock market and help you understand how you can create multiple passive income streams. Welcome to Robert from Efficiency Works. Uh, thank you. Now, first up, Robert, can you tell us about Efficiency Works and what you do? Yeah, sure. Uh, Efficiency Works is a business transformation company. Uh, we help businesses uh, through the path to operational excellence and uh, yeah, being at world class. And we do that through uh, consultancy and training. Excellent. And Robert, you've been delivering industry-leading developmental programs since 2007. Now, in your mm -hmm. opinion, why are developmental programs necessary? Yeah, sure. Well, development programs are very necessary um, because the only constant in our world is change. Uh, if we do not develop, uh, changes will obviously occur around us. Uh, and uh, will you know, then stagnate and uh, eventually decline. And there's uh, plenty of examples of that uh, in, in recent times. Well, yes, a lot of businesses have been suffering through the COVID outbreak now. Um, mm. Can you tell us, Robert, about your unique approach that results in immediate efficiency improvements to teams and organisations? Yeah, sure. Uh, our approach is to look at transformation holistically. Uh, so many organisations uh, just look at uh, people and culture uh, separately from process improvement. Uh, process uh, changes uh, are driven by people. Uh, and uh, you would only get accelerated growth in activity uh, uh, adaptivity uh, comes from organizations ability to resolve that is to find solutions and gain results uh, imagine there's discovery and new ideas uh, alignment through values and engagement and to analyze through information and proof so you really need you know, to uh, develop uh, people and then your processes uh, and you'll find to be far more successful uh, than just doing one or the other. And if we could go into a little bit more detail now, what are the range of industry leading training packages that you offer? Yeah, sure. Uh, our company, Efficiency Works, uh, we provide training in the areas of process improvement, of course, uh, and leadership. 
uh, process improvement training uh, is underpinned by lean methodologies. Uh, this, obviously, this is not unique. Uh, it's been around for about 70 years now. Uh, however, Efficiency Works approach is to deliver training that aligns with strategic goals and training that relates to real problems and gaining immediate results. Uh, we don't believe in doing training for training sake. Uh, process improvement product uh, and training that we have developed uh, is called Green Stream Planning. Uh, this training allows organisations to understand uh, where, where they will see the biggest effect of training uh, and hence apply the training to those these areas uh, as a priority. Uh, again, leadership training is not unique. Uh, however, what we deliver uh, is our training focuses on neuroscience and uh, and change management. Uh, so these are the these are the areas that we really focus on. Again, like I said, through people and, and process. And Robert, could you share your strategies and tools that you use to deploy to engage and motivate frontline workers? Yeah, sure. And this is the biggest challenge that uh, we find that uh, all companies have. You have very easy to motivate uh, the leadership group, well, it should be, uh, but uh, the the front line is is where the uh, where the rubber hits the road. Um, and, and our approach uh, is to understand the strategic objectives of the organisation, and then to diagnose the the organisation's ability to enact change. Uh, through assessments uh, like the uh, organization growth indicator. Uh, another one is the uh, growth leadership indicator. We have thinking intention profiles. We use the synergy values fit assessments. All of these to diagnose operational effectiveness uh, through lean maturity assessments, through probe, we really believe this is how you need to start the consultation process is to diagnose what the problems are. Um, we need, and doing that, we'll understand the current state. Uh, Efficiency Works can then map out exactly what is required to reach the strategic goals. And then we provide specific consul consultancy and training for an organization's development and process improvement where it is needed and not just a broad brush. Obviously, there are very many different strategies that you use, but how do you help organizations assess and maximize their returns? Um, we, we're looking at the in, engagement um, that comes through communication, and, and that comes from the feeling of, uh, of, of belonging. And self-motivation uh, comes from uh, what you do, or in other words, the the role uh, does a role fit with natural behaviours and cognitive ability. Uh, Efficiency Works uses uh, job fit uh, technology um, to to ensure that that personal and team development uh, is done uh, quite precisely. Uh, we can also measure engagement and exactly what is needed to improve uh, and where. Uh, other strategies we have at our disposal, uh, a strategy deployment through uh, a lean methodology called Hoshan Canary, uh, and neuro, neuro leadership of frontline and, and managers uh, in short course and uh, sort of certified course form. So this is how we, we really get to how to uh, to uh, engage those uh, frontline leaders uh, and uh, or frontline workers, and uh, and that's where you'll get your maximum benefits from. Robert, it sounds like such a fascinating space to be in to be helping workers and businesses to achieve their best. Yes. Thank you for your time today, and thanks for the chat. No problems at all. Thank you. Now, with that, I'll sign off for now. Watch this space for more. Till then, stay abreast and invest wise with Calkine.
Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Calkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Calkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Calkine TV. So will we see stagflation in 2022? Well, let's take a look. I'm Rachel Jones and this is Calkine Media. Amid changing headwinds, the inflation forecast for Australia remains complicated. The country has now entered another year marked with uncertainty. While inflation anxiety is dominant among some economists, other experts believe that inflationary expectations might be overblown. These diverging views come as uncertain policy changes lie in the backdrop. The Reserve Bank of Australia has hinted at the possibility of a rate hike. However, the bank has has not given a clear timeline. The supply constraints taking shape globally have also contributed to the uncertainty around inflation in the coming months. The Australian property price journey has been unmatched by any other sector within the country. Housing prices have risen at an alarming rate, perpetually reaching new highs. However, it's important to note that an interest rate hike might put downward pressure on inflation. A rise in interest rates would have a direct impact on housing prices. As lending becomes expensive, the housing sector is expected to cool off, especially as buyers develop expectations of further rate hikes. Stagflation is a combination of low economic growth as well as rising unemployment at extremely high levels of inflation. It can be assumed that stagflation may not be a realistic possibility for Australia in 2022, though a proportion of experts are speculating inflation could persist. The indications for the job market seem positive. Rising job ads have provided a better than expected outlook for 2022. Even as surging Omicron cases loom in the background, the predictions for employment remain upbeat. Data by Australia and New Zealand banks suggests that job ads rose by 7.4% in November 2021, and this momentum is expected to continue in 2022 as well. So in a nutshell, economic recovery is expected to continue into the new year, with the labour market developing resilience along the way. Additionally, a recovery in wages could further bring out a radical change in policy action. If wages growth exceeds inflation growth, then it's highly likely that contractory policy measures would be adopted. Now, if you like the information in this video, you can like, share and comment on it. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel and you can press the bell icon to get notifications for our latest videos. I'm Rachel for Calcine Media. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Calkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Calkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Calkine TV.
Good afternoon and sorry for that interruption. Thank you once again for joining us. Holly Shields here for Calcine TV. Welcoming you all to another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks. On today's show, we're joined by Charlie Gunningham, Managing Editor and Startup News, a digital publishing service dedicated to celebrating the achievements and successes of Western Australian startups and entrepreneurs. Welcome to the show, Charlie. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you, Holly. It's great to be here. Pleasure's all mine. Great to have you on. So to kick things off, in today's pandemic-induced volatile climate, many businesses are struggling to get by. Though despite this, Startup News and perhaps you yourself take pride in supporting startup spirits in WA. So what was your inspiration behind launching this company? Well, thanks, Holly. I'm not the original founder. I took over in 2018, but it was started in 2013 by a couple of startup guys here in West Australia um, who'd found that it quite difficult to get the news of the Perth startup scene out to normal startup channels that tend to focus on eastern states. There is actually a flourishing startup scene over here in Perth, West Australia. I actually did a startup myself back in 1999. If you remember the dot coms, I, I set up a, um, I suppose, a bit like realestate.com before realestate.com, a one called aussiehome.com back in the day. And we ran it for 10 years before we were acquired. And um, so I've had 20 years in the startup scene here in Perth. It's a flourishing ecosystem, I'm glad to say. All right. So it's flourishing, which is good to hear. And um, mm. how would you describe the co-working spaces in Western Australia? Yeah, probably the first uh, co-working space of, of the sort of modern type was Space Cube that's set up in 2012 by Brody McCulloch. But there are now actually 55, would you believe, 55 co-working spaces around Western Australia and Perth. And about 40% of them are outside Perth, are in the regions. So uh, it's become a way of, um, I suppose, getting your startup going, not just to hire a seat or uh, a table or an, or an office, but really it's the community that is around the co-working spaces. And Space Cubed have been one of the most successful at that. They've now got, uh, I think, five, six, or even seven different locations that they either own or manage around Perth and uh, the CBD and also outside of Perth. So there's a good ecosystem here. I've, I've plotted it on Startup News. If you go to startupnews.com.au and click ecosystem, we've actually got 147 different co-working spaces, funding groups, accelerator programs and the like that service the tech startup early stage sector. That's incredible. It sounds like a really thriving ecosystem you have there. Mm. It and is. And it's great to see. I've sort of grown up in it myself the last 20 years. Right. So you've seen it evolve, I imagine. Definitely so. There was no co-working space, uh, Holly. There were no accelerators when I started my startup 20 years ago at all. In fact, we had to go around and try and find like-minded, crazy dot-com entrepreneurs such as ourselves uh, to get together. And we formed something called eGroup, which still meets to this day. In fact, that's one of the, the groups that meets up to give each other emotional support and advice about getting your startup going. Um, and now there's some angel groups, um, not just one in Perth, but one in Bunbury called Southwest Angels. There's a little bit of VC, not a lot of venture capital. Um, there's one group called Better Labs, and there's a, a few others now bubbling along and others I've heard that are getting going. Um, but it's, it's a good positive scene. I suppose we're used to being isolated in Perth, and so we look after our own. We look after each other. Well, that is always good to hear. So in your opinion, what are the factors that are currently posing a challenge for those startups? Well, a couple, probably, Holly. Um, over the last year, obviously, we've had the pandemic. Um, at the time it hit, I was working for a federal government startup fund called Accelerating Commercialization, and we um, rang around all the companies that we'd given federal government money to in forms of a grant to make sure that they were okay. And we found broadly, that a third of them were unaffected by COVID. A third of them were affected a little bit, but within a few months they were fine. And a third of them were severely affected and it was sort of almost life-threatening for the business. But I'm sad to say, glad to say that within a few months, sort of this time last year, um, once we're two or three months into COVID, most of those had got over the worst, as in fact had 
the state and we've been relatively unaffected by COVID even though last week we had a um, lockdown and this week we're all wearing masks uh, even though we're back in the office. Um, so that's sort of one thing. The other thing that probably is unique to Perth is a lack of early stage venture funding. We don't have the venture capital that you'd have and you'd see on the eastern seaboard and um, Perth is a great place Holly if you want to fund a mine or if you want to do commercial property development but if you're trying to fund a startup it's pretty much few and far between. Um, I looked at uh, the total amount of money that was invested in WA companies last year which was around eight billion dollars in WA companies. Um, I'm very sad to say only 0.3 percent of that 0.3 percent went to early stage private sector tech businesses so it's it's woefully small and um, it needs it we need more early stage fund not every startup needs funding but uh, though some do and those that do need the rocket fuel to fuel their growth well those figures are certainly surprising there in your opinion mm. how can we get that rocket fuel for the growth what needs to change for that to happen Oh, Holly, if only I knew the answer. Someone could tell me the answer. I've been looking at it for 20 years and it hasn't got much better. Um, you know, back in the dot-com days, it was maybe weirdly easier to raise money. I was a school teacher and set up a crazy dot-com but raised a couple hundred thousand dollars in a few weeks. Look, there is money around. Perth's a fairly wealthy place, I think. I heard a stat. I'm, no long, I'm not sure if this is true, but I'll keep repeating it. But I think Perth has more self-made millionaires than any other city in the world. Um, we have a average income, I think is 30 or 35% higher than the Australian average. So we're a fairly wealthy community, um, but we're just not used to making money in tech or funding early stage tech. We're used to making money in mining and in property. Nothing wrong with that, nothing wrong with that at all. That, that fires a lot of innovation. There's lots of good mining tech and prop tech businesses around, but um, people I suppose aren't used to making money by um, investing early in tech and therefore because they're not used to doing it they don't do it and because they don't do it they don't have good experiences from it and therefore the wheel hasn't really turned but I think it's changing slowly um, and there's now talk of more funds being set up but um, for, for your average plucky early stage startup entrepreneur it's still pretty lean pickings mm, all right. well, that is quite unfortunate to hear but hopefully we do get that shift that you're hoping for yeah, I think so. Um, I think more and more people are aware of the sector. They just don't know how to start. They don't know how to value a business and they haven't had experience of doing it. So, that, I mean, nor did I when I started, nor does any investor before they start. So, I mean, the thing to do is to get started, I suppose, and go down to Space Cubed and get involved in some accelerator programs and maybe some angel groups and, and start investing and, and seeing how you can help. because. For startups, as you know, Holly, it's not just the money, it's the mentoring, it's the advice, it's the opening doors. And someone like me, an old startup guy like me, um, I've been through the, out, the other side and been successful. I think it's important for those people then to give back and mentor the next generation. So we're seeing more of that happening. We're still early. I'm impatient, but it, it is happening slowly. And I'm sure the more we get successes, you know, we claim Canva as one of ours. I remember Mel and Cliff from Canva when they started in 2012 and they're now worth $20 billion. Um, um, obviously they moved to Sydney almost immediately. We couldn't keep them, but they stayed in Australia. And there are some good startups coming out of Perth and that, you know, Health Engine and others and Sector have done well. And there's others like Isatana and IntelliCare that have listed on the stock market in the last 12 months. So there is more happening. And as more of those succeed, then I suppose that'll give more confidence to the investors coming through for the next round. All right. Yep. Fingers crossed there. And um, just on that note, with uh, with kickstarting the startups, how would you suggest people position their startups for success? Well, I think the most important thing, Holly, is to think about the customer. I think um, too many people do whinge about, like me, whinge about oh, there's no money around and we can't raise money for our startup. Look, the best money always is from customers. So if you have a if you're a founder out there and you reckon you've seen a customer problem that can be solved elegantly elegantly with technology uh, and the the best thing is you know just build something 
work with your early customers, get them paying you something, try and uh, spin it out and, and scale it up organically. The best funding for any business, of course, is customer income, is customer revenue, making sales. So if you can do that, then by the time if you do need money, you're going to be worth more, you're going to be giving less of your money away. So I always tell clients, look, um, those in the tech businesses, work with your customers, love them to bits, knock their socks off, wow them, five star stuff, um, and then hopefully they'll come along with you for the ride as you scale and grow and you'll get more and more customers on. You know, love, love the ones you're with, I suppose, and, and work hard on getting that product market fit with your customers. Absolutely. I think that's really solid advice there. Now, I understand you do a podcast, Startup West. Could you tell us a bit about that? I do. So Startup News is a site where you can, if you look at the, if you want to be interested in WA startups, we, we publish stories on startups. Nothing unusual about that. And then three years ago, um, when I took over the Startup News in 2018, because I'm an ex-property media guy. In fact, my latest venture is is the Property Tribune, which is property and media combined. So I took over Startup News. One thing I wanted to do was a podcast and get the startup founders in WA to tell their stories, partly as inspiration to people who are doing it tough on their own, that there's other people like me struggling with these issues too, and also to put them on a pedestal and, and highlight some of the better ones. So if wherever you get your podcast from, Holly, or the people listening to this, you just plug in Startup West, Startup West, you will get to our podcast. So I think we've had about 50 or so episodes. They're not too long. They're just a commute, about 30 minutes. So you can listen to it on a commute. And it's uh, quite fun, uh, different ones. We've had Health Engine on, we've had Sector on, we've had Functionally and other ones that I think are coming up, the next rung of successful WA startups. So if you want to hear from some of them, hear some of their stories, some of their challenges, some of their mistakes, things they wish they'd known when they started, then Startup West Podcast is the place to go. That's terrific. And I think it's obviously really important to hear from the best. Hmm, absolutely right. Yeah, it's inspiring for the for the for everybody else, right? And um, you know, I've done it myself, so I've made loads of mistakes, got the badge, got the T-shirt, and it's important to maybe help those others coming through, not to make the same mistakes you did, and to <laughs> highlight some of the gaps and things that they can improve on. Definitely, definitely. But apart from the podcast, do you have anything else coming up at uh, Startup News that our audience could look forward to? Yes, well, one thing we've done is plot the ecosystem. So if you, that, that's quite interesting. So as I say, at the moment, it's rather a boring Airtable. Uh, I don't know if you know Airtable, but it's one way. It's like glorified, webified uh, spreadsheets. So it's a bit of a boring list at the moment, but you can filter it, and that's quite clever. We want to really map out the ecosystem with who's involved and who's in the zoo. And that would make anyone hitting the ecosystem um, aware of uh, what's going on. Um, we've launched a new website for the podcast, startupwest.com.au. That just la launched last week. Um, but just more of the same, really, in um, throwing a light on the interesting and wonderful and quite um, quite large um, Perth ecosystem in, re in regards to startups over this part of the world. Right, definitely. First of all, congratulations on the launch of Startup West. And um, I hope to see that expansion of the new startups on your map. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in, love the sector and uh, really enjoy giving back and also promoting, very proud of the sector. And there's lots of people doing that, not just me, uh, that give back and mentor and advise. And um, I think I, you talked to my good friend, Peter Van Brookham recently, uh, what he does at Tech Board is great. Um, but there's a lot of people pushing the sector and really helping, uh, helping kicking it along and hopefully finding the next Canva. Right. <laughs> well, that is always good to hear, and we'll definitely be keeping an eye on that, especially Startup West. So on that note, it's just thank about you. time to wrap up. But I've got to say thank you so much for joining us today. It's been great to hear insights. Great to win you, Holly, and thanks for everything you do as well for the business community. Great to have you on. And thanks for your time as well, viewers. Stay tuned for more live updates. And as we say here, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine.
Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calpine TV. Can Radix touch the $1 mark? Let's take a closer look. Hey, and thanks for tuning in. Holly Shields here for Calpine Media. Radix Crypto is the first layer one protocol, which means it's easy for the developers to build and scale decentralized finance, reducing congestion and smart contract leaks. As Radix optimizes cross shard synchronicity, it's able to seamlessly execute smart contracts through its system. And with its unique protocol, Radix takes care of four key issues, which developers often face while building DeFi and DLT applications. So what makes it unique? Well, first of all, it was founded by Dan Hughes, and Radix Crypto uses the Byzantine fault tolerance-based Cerberus consensus protocol, which allows the DeFi to scale without any friction. This helps the crypto to do all the transactions automatically across multiple shards. Radix also offers the developers incentives to ensure that the applications are properly deployed on the protocol, and the automated rewards function helps them to create a decentralized autonomous marketplace for Radix components. On top of that, users can also stake the tokens and gain rewards in the process. The crypto is available for trading on the leading crypto exchange Bitfinex and is expected to be listed on other exchanges as well. So how is Radix faring? XLD Crypto is ranked number 3340 on CoinMarketCap and even though Radix hasn't gained much momentum, it could become one of the strongest DeFi tokens by 2026. The listing on multiple exchanges should help the token to grow further, but for now, with just one exchange, some feel that its range is too limited. Its first goal is to ensure a decent rally in the market so that the investors can gain some confidence in the token. What's your take on Radix? Share your thoughts in the comments and check out some of our other videos to stay up to date. Holly Shields for Kalkine Media. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. Morrison government first started a pandemic leave disaster payment back in July 2021. With surging infections of coronavirus now, Prime Minister Scott Morrison has reminded fellow Aussies about financial help for people affected by COVID. I'm Rachel and this is Kalkine Media. So how can you claim the $750 payment for COVID-19 isolation? Well, firstly, you need to download and complete the claim for pandemic leave disaster payment from servicesaustralia.gov.au. The COVID-19 assistance provides $750 a week for a person under isolation, quarantine, or for care of a COVID-19 infected patient. The eligibility criteria means you have to be above the age of 17 years and an Australian resident or a visa holder with a work permit. If a person needs the payment after seven days, they need to submit a new claim every week. Initially, the scheme was set out at $1,500 for a 14-day period. However, this has been changed to weekly support of $750 since the 9th of December. The person claiming the money must also be unable to attend work or earn any income. 
The condition also includes claimants not having any sick leave entitlements, pandemic sick leave or personal or carer's leave. If couples claim the assistance together, there's no need to fill out separate forms. The support is taxable, which means people will need to include it in their tax returns that they file. Now, if you like the information in this video, you can like, share and comment on it, and you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can also press the bell icon to get notifications for our latest videos. I'm Rachel, signing off for Kalki Media. Hi, and thanks for joining us. Great to have your company here on Kalkine TV. I'm Holly, and you're watching The Buzzing Trends. Today, we'll be shedding some light on the impact of the Omicron variant on aviation and travel stocks. While things have started to look optimistic after Australia lifted border restrictions, the surge in the Omicron variant cases has been casting shadows on the recovery of the Australian travel sector. The past couple of weeks saw a smashing rise in the number of COVID cases with Australia witnessing over half a million in the past week. Although aggressive lockdowns and tough border restrictions have kept a check on infections in the past, the country is witnessing record infection cases in its effort to push through, as indicated by PM Scott Morrison. As a response to the massive surge in coronavirus cases, Virgin Australia has slashed one-fourth of all of its flights from its schedule in January and February. The staffing challenges and reduced demand have been the major factors driving this decision. Amidst the once again changing dynamics, all eyes are on the Australian travel sector that's been hit the hardest by the pandemic and is gradually making a comeback. So let's dive into how the Omicron variant is impacting these stocks. Well, the first one to look at is Qantas. Over the past few months, the boost in travel activity has partially offset the COVID-19 impact from the months of lockdown. Qantas had earlier highlighted that uncertainty regarding the Omicron variant slowed demand and momentum for both the domestic and international flights in November. The airline witnessed improvement over the Christmas and summer period. However, the company has indicated that Omicron is clearly impacting the confidence of travel, especially when it comes to booking international flights. The rising number of hospitalizations could also reflect the travel demand. Qantas is trading at $5.21 a share at the moment. And the next stock to have a look at is Flight Center Travel Group. The COVID-19 pandemic has had a lasting impact on Flight Center's operational landscape as more and more customers shift from brick and mortar stores to online channels. Driven by the growing relevance of the strengthening online presence, the company has acquired 100% ownership of Compli AI, a Texas-based business. The industry-first browser extension Shep developed by Compli AI will be integrated into the company's FCM travel management business. And Flight Center Travel Group is trading at $18.59 per share. Well, the last stock to have a look at now is Air New Zealand. The New Zealand government recently outlined a phased border reopening plan from early 2022, which will suggest a potential pathway to reopening the country for international travel. However, the rise in Omicron cases across the world has continued to impact these circumstances. With this in mind, Air New Zealand has indicated that it's been considering financial support requirements during the period up to the first quarter of 2022, when an equity raising is planned. The airline has entered into a revised crown support package consisting of additional 500 million New Zealand dollars of additional liquidity, which would be better positioning the company during the period up till its recapitalization. At the moment, Air New Zealand is currently trading at 1.43 per share. And that is all for now on the buzzing trends, but we'll be back for more next time only on Calkine TV. This is Holly Shields signing off. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved 
In the Space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Calcine TV. Hello and welcome to another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks on Calkine. I'm James Preston and in this episode we're taking a close look at the Supply Chain Sustainability School, which enables socially, environmentally and economically sustainable supply chains for all Australian and New Zealand organisations through open access to educational resources. To talk us through exactly how that all works is the CEO of Supply Chain Sustainability School, Hayley Jarrick. Hayley, a very good afternoon to you. Good afternoon, thanks for having me. Great to have you here. Now Hayley, first and foremost, what exactly is the Supply Chain Sustainability School and how does it help organisations in building their skills of their supply chain? Yes, yeah, so we're an industry-wide collaboration of organisations who are collaborating together to develop educational resources about sustainability for the future. Um, so effectively what we do um, is we have 40 fellow organisations who pull together to operate our business and we develop free online training for everybody to access and learn. Wow, it sounds like there's plenty of work that goes in behind the scenes. How big is that sort of research <laughs> team? I know you mentioned 44 different affiliates in there, but how many people exactly are involved in, in creating these resources? So it varies depending on the type of resource. So we have a number of different working groups from those 40 organisations uh, with individuals that are represented based on subject matter expertise. Um, and then those industry experts collate together to create all uh, the content behind what we do. Um, and then we have a very small uh, head of operating team um, as a not-for-profit organisation to manage to collate all that together and get it running online. Um, the reason why we can run so lean is because we really do work on that collaborative framework of everybody mm. getting together and doing the work so that we don't have a massive operating expense. Well, look, it's not just the affiliates. You've also got more than 2,000 member companies, which to me suggests it's definitely a resource of value. Why do these companies jump on board and is it typically you approaching them or do they come to you? Oh, look, it can come both ways. So we get um, some sort of like organic traffic um, coming through to our site and sometimes a lot of organisations refer other organisations. Uh, so the way that we're set up is that uh, because we are a free online resource, um, you can tell everybody in your supply chain to come on board and do training with us and they can access all of that information for free. So often a lot of our fellow organisations will um, send out the links and require all of their supply chain to come on board and learn, as well as all the people inside um, their internal bodies can jump on board and learn as well. Um, there's a reason why, you're right, there's, there's a lot of people that come on board and, and do training with us. Um, I think there's a few reasons, I the four main ones that come to mind. I think the first one is that we're industry led. So all of the information that we provide is, is, is not theoretical information, it's based on real world things that you'll need to do your jobs today, um, coming from industry experts in the field. Um, and we really rely on our fellows and all the volunteer aspects in their organisations to really ensure that that, relevant, that content is really relevant. I think the second reason is because it's free. <laughs> I think especially in the current climate, a lot of people are looking to upskill in different areas, but mm. they may have been laid off or just don't have the budget to get on board and do a lot of the education and training that they wish they could do. Um, so it's really great that we can be there to help those people that are looking to upskill in different areas in that way. We also have different ways that you can learn. Um, so we acknowledge that everybody's different. Um, you know, we have people that come to our site. Um, if you sign up, you can do a benchmarking assessment and we can give you a custom action plan of things that you should learn. Or you can enrol in a course that's already there that you're interested in and do, um, do some work that way. Or you can just straight out browse the catalogue of just things that you're interested in and start searching around and viewing things as well. Um, but I think the other way is that we cater for different ways that, that people learn. So in most of our resources, we have five levels of competency. We do everything from e-learning modules to just viewing through infographics and videos or reading documents or coming to events. So I think the variety of the resources that we have is probably the other reason why it's so popular. Now you mentioned events there, have you had to change the way that you run those? I mean obviously with the, the pandemic being in the background for the past 18 months, has there been a big shift from your organisation to more virtual events? 
Probably not as big of a shift as what you would think. So one of the benefits of having an online organization is that we used to run a lot of online events. Now for us that just means that we can uh, geographically spread the diversity of who can access those resources. Um, we had a lot of feedback that from some organizations that just don't have the time to be able to travel to a capital city to go to an event to view something um, previously and now even more so it's been a, a physical barrier to, to travel and, and geography to be able to get there but it just means that we can open up the, our events to everybody um, who has an internet connection basically to attend um, and, and from that aspect we haven't had to um, spin and adapt more easily um, I think the way that people want to go to events is online has definitely changed in the past sort of two years so Gone are the days where you sort of rock up and somebody speaks at you for an hour. People want to interact and engage socially in an online event um, as opposed to just sitting there and watching somebody. So I think that um, spinning everything online definitely hasn't been the angle, but we definitely have had to change and, and play up how we interact online. Well, you're not wrong. I think there is a real push to have that interactive sort of thing. Every time I think that I just get those dreaded memories of, no, you have to turn on your Zoom camera. You can't just sit there and be a passive watcher. So, uh, look, just excuse me for a moment whilst I cringe about that myself. But, look, it sounds fantastic what you guys are doing there. Let, let's just have a look at an industry-specific sort of way that you approach your clients. Obviously, there's so many different things. It could be a baker. It could be someone with a clothing shop. Maybe it's in the concreting industry. Let's take a clothing shop, for example. What kind of resources are in place for them to help improve everything that they do? Yes, yeah, so there's a lot of generic resources about sustainability. So everything from what is sustainability and the dreaded S word, <laughs> um, and whether you want to use that or not, um, all the way through to just being smart business and getting on board with things. So one thing that we found is um, our organisation started for the construction sector um, and sort of and helping that whole industry out. But very quickly we learned that a lot of the materials around sustainability and sustainable procurement, sustainable business are very generic. Um, so we're currently working through expanding our markets and industry spaces so all of those generic materials that we have created um, become more relevant to different industries. So we have different working groups working in different areas to try and customise those for those specific industries. Uh, but there's definitely all of the generic material available there for everybody. So talking about your, uh, your clothing store operator, um, there's definitely different things. Learn about waste management, learn about sustainable procurement, Learn about why there's different materials. Understand all your social responsibility changes, like modern slavery and human rights. All of these aspects are all around sustainability. Um, and we really want to get those resources out there for everybody, uh, for businesses big and small. You know, we've had some really small businesses that said, after going through and doing some basic training, they were able to adapt their business models, um, which meant that just instead of bidding on really small jobs with local governments, they're able to start bidding on state governments and bigger and win bigger mm. work for their business. So there's definitely opportunities to expand your business in what is a very growing market um, around sustainability. Now you also mentioned in there sustainable procurement. Now can you break it down for us exactly what does that mean? <laughs> well, I can, and for those interested, you can come online and we've got an e-learning module on this exact topic. So don't feel like I'm not going to do it justice in a few seconds. But, <laughs> um, but to, to very basically um, break that down, and there's an ISO standard on this as well for those that don't love the detail about this sort of thing. Um, but basically, you want to do less harm and more good right across the full spectrum of environmental, social and economic areas as you're purchasing, and then ensure that that procurement decision works over the lifespan. So it's not just the time that you buy it or um, the point in time at which you decide you want a resource. Think about how that then plays out over how, how you use it and is it going to cost you money over how you use it, what impacts is it going to have on the environment and socially as you use it. Um, and then at end of life, what are you then going to do with that resource as you buy it as well? Right, okay, so like the complete life cycle of any material that you might be using, that's, that's quite interesting. Now, just before I let you go, Hayley, one, what do you have in your near-term pipeline? And also, if we want to have a look at some of these resources, what's the best way to do so? What is the website? Yeah, so please come and see us at supplychainschool.org.au. Um, if you've got ideas for new resources, please email them through to us. We love 
expanding everything as we've got as we've got going on. Um, like I mentioned before, we're currently in a period of expansion. So we're taking a lot of our resources that we have there, reviewing them, modifying them, generating a whole lot of new content in new, more specific topic areas, um, and then customising them for specific industries to make sure that we're hitting every mark across every Australian New Zealand industry from construction to retail services to arts and recreational services and agriculture um, utility services right across the full spectrum. Um, so we're growing. I mean, you know, I've got a giant smile on my face because I love going to work every day um, <laughs> and, and getting across and sending these messages out there to everybody. Um, and we're more than happy to have lots of people come along and, and, and join us on the journey. So if you're looking to try and just learn a few things, then please jump on the website and, um, and have a look at a few things and tell us what you think. Um, and if you'd like to come on board and do more with us, then happy to talk to you as well. Look, Hayley, that's wonderful. Always so great to see someone who is so incredibly passionate about what they do. So I really appreciate you for joining us here at CalCon today. Thanks for having me. Yeah, well, hopefully we can catch up in the future. But that is Hayley Jarrick, CEO of Supply Chain Sustainability School, helping lead the way for a cleaner supply chain moving forward. If you missed any part of that interview or you'd like to check it out, our complete catalogue of expert talks are all available on our YouTube channel, Kalkine Media. I'm James Preston for Kalkine. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calkine TV. Please subscribe to the channel, press the bell icon to be notified of the latest videos. Today we're covering why is Splinter Shards or SPS crypto gaining popularity? Stay watching till the end to find out. Sage here for Kalkai Media. Splinter Shards Crypto has been gaining traction in the market after experts gave a bullish view on the token. And on Tuesday morning, it was trading flat at US $0.2195. So what are Splinter Shards? Splinter Shards tokens are governance tokens for the SPS Decentralized Autonomous Organization, or DAO. They were launched in July 2021. It mainly represents the game named Splinterlands, which is rapidly gaining popularity and earning investors' attention. Splinterlands is a digital collectible card game based on blockchain technology. It's inspired by similar games like Magic the Gathering, Hearthstone, etc. In the competitions, players build a card collection with different attributes and battle with each other and other players in matches based on skills. In the Splinterland game, players can buy, sell or trade digital currencies just like they could do in games like Magic the Gathering, Pokemon, etc. It was started back in May 2018. Splinterlands was created as a solution to players who could not own assets as the games became digital. So with the aid of blockchain technology, the players can hold and trade digital assets freely. In addition, it maintains transparency in the game, meaning all the cards of the game have a verified supply and historical record. The players battle with each other by choosing different battles, like ranked battles and practice battles. The ranked battles help players to increase their rating. And on the plus side, the beginners can also play the ranked battles without any trouble, as rating below 100 does not lose any ranking points. The battles generally happen between players having similar strengths, and in the game, the players from both sides must choose six monster cards and one summoner card for the battle. One can win the contest by destroying all the opponent's monster cards. The game, in general, is free to play, but the players must buy the summoner's spellbook for 10 US dollars to unlock the complete game. With the summoner's spellbook, players can assess several other features that could be redeemed for real currency. The game's daily users are over 0.3 million, and according to Dapp Radar, it is one of the most popular games on any blockchain. In addition, the game doesn't promote itself, so its popularity comes from word of mouth. Pricing and other details of Splinter Shards SPS token. 
So the SPS token was up 0.47% to reach 0.2195 US dollars on January 4th. Its market cap is US $76.58 million and its fully diluted market cap is $658.62 million US dollars. Its 24 hour trading volume through Tuesday morning was 2.64 million US dollars, up 39.95%. The SPS token saw the highest price of US $1.27 and the lowest price of US $0.132 in the last 52 weeks. It reached an all time high of US $1.27 on July 28, 2021. In conclusion, the Splinter Shards SPS token gave an 18.94% return in the 12 months. It has traded on exchanges like PancakeSwap version 2, Gate.io, etc. Its maximum supply is 3 billion. Around 7,000 people check out the free basic game daily, of which about 3,000 people opt to pay 10 US dollars for the additional features. Its growing popularity is catching investors' attention. And if you do like this information, let us know by liking, sharing, commenting on the video below. Subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon. You'll be advised every time Kalkine has a new video. But for more information like this, there's a website, kalkinemedia.com. Please have a look. Thanks for watching. Stay here for Kalkine Media. So will we see stagflation in 2022? Well, let's take a look. I'm Rachel Jones and this is Calchi Media. Amid changing headwinds, the inflation forecast for Australia remains complicated. The country has now entered another year marked with uncertainty. While inflation anxiety is dominant among some economists, other experts believe that inflationary expectations might be overblown. These diverging views come as uncertain policy changes lie in the backdrop. The Reserve Bank of Australia has hinted at the possibility of a rate hike. However, the bank has not given a clear timeline. The supply constraints taking shape globally have also contributed to the uncertainty around inflation in the coming months. The Australian property price journey has been unmatched by any other sector within the country. Housing prices have risen at an alarming rate, perpetually reaching new highs. However, it's important to note that an interest rate hike might put downward pressure on inflation. A rise in interest rates would have a direct impact on housing prices. As lending becomes expensive, the housing sector is expected to cool off, especially as buyers develop expectations of further rate hikes. Stagflation is a combination of low economic growth as well as rising unemployment at extremely high levels of inflation. It can be assumed that stagflation may not be a realistic possibility for Australia in 2022, though a proportion of experts are speculating inflation could persist. The indications for the job market seem positive. Rising job ads have provided a better than expected outlook for 2022. Even as surging Omicron cases loom in the background, the predictions for employment remain upbeat. Data by Australia and New Zealand banks suggests that job ads rose by 7.4% in November 2021, and this momentum is expected to continue in 2022 as well. So in a nutshell, economic recovery is expected to continue into the new year, with the labour market developing resilience along the way. Additionally, a recovery in wages could further bring out a radical change in policy action. If wages growth exceeds inflation growth, then it's highly likely that contractory policy measures would be adopted. Now, if you like the information in this video, you can like, share and comment on it. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel and you can press the bell icon to get notifications for our latest videos. I'm Rachel for Calchi Media. Good morning everyone, welcome back to Kalkine TV. This is Sage, your host for today's Executive Corner Expert Talks. And we're very lucky to have with us today Mr. Anthony Kwok, the CEO of Zilio. 
Have you ever bought something online and found it just doesn't fit right or look different on the website? Well, you're not alone. And in today's show, we're going to learn more about how technology and fashion can fuse advantageously, creating a 3D fitting room for online shopping. And in today's show, we have Mr. Anthony Kwok, the CEO of Zilio. Welcome, Anthony. Hey, Sage. Thank you for a lovely introduction. Nice <laughs> to meet you guys. Excellent. Well, being a mover and shaker in the fashion e-commerce industry, I'm keen to share your insights on the show. Thank you for joining us. Sure. Thank you for so having me. First things first, a big salute to you for rising above all the challenges thrown at you. Our audience must know that Anthony has suffered two strokes after his retirement from professional kickboxing, but emerged fitter, stronger and hungrier. Please tell us what inspires you, Anthony. Well, love the uh, first deep questions, jumping straight into the deep end. But um, yeah, when I was younger, I was, for a very long time, I was bullied. So for as long as I can remember, um, I, I felt ashamed and I felt weak. I felt like a disappointment to my family, to my parents, you know, my mum and my dad. So so I started martial arts to learn to defend myself. And I became a professional fighter to take control of the situation with my own hands by force and ever since same with the stroke ever since i've just been fighting in life and you know, going through challenges the same, same way amazing uh anthony i don't know what to say but i think the way that you've taken control of the situation that is the most inspiring for me and the technology that you use allows shoppers to see exactly how clothes fit on their bodies when shopping online. Now that sounds amazing. I don't think I've ever seen that before. I may have seen change your hairstyle or change your eye color, but I haven't seen clothes actually 3D being fitted onto bodies. So what was your inspiration behind launching Zilio, please? I mean, I can start off by saying the business inspiration, which is, you know, we're, we're solving a trillion dollar problem, but my, my real inspiration about it is I used to work in fashion retail and um, more, David Jones specifically. Um, and there'd be clients or customers that come in who's looking for a, an outfit for the first date, the first job interview, the prom, the formal, something life changing. And they're always, you know, a lot of them are always lacking in confidence or self esteem. And when we put them in the perfect fitting outfit, and they look in the mirror and they see themselves like that. It's magical, like just the change in them. It's like they're a whole different person. And it was something I related to because the fashion and the sense of style did the same to me. So I guess that empowerment through fashion is what is what inspires me. Amazing. And the fact that you are actually genuinely sharing that experience with those girls who came shopping in your store, that's just truly remarkable. So you are changing the game of online shopping, obviously. How does Zilio's AR technology help businesses and customers? Yeah, so like I said before, we're solving a trillion dollar problem, right? And this fashion e-commerce problem of, like online shopping has been blowing up. It has been before COVID and now with COVID it's blowing up like no tomorrow. So, and what we see is that, you know, people either buy 10 things online just to return eight religiously because of sizing and fit, or they avoid shopping online just to avoid the hassle of buying the wrong sizes. And the numbers back this up, up to 30% of everything bought online is returned with sizing and fit being the number one biggest reason. Only 3% of all online traffic is actually converted into sales right sit with that for a second if you have a store and a hundred people go into your store and only three people buy like you don't have a business right? your products are shut down but that's what it looks like for every single online fashion store and on top of that up to 70 percent of all cut all online shopping carts are abandoned so by letting and you know with sizing and fit being the number one biggest reason letting more and the numbers show this so by showing shoppers how the clothes fit in their bodies, you know, with their own 3D avatar, and by giving them that confidence, they'll have the confidence to buy more online and to return less. Therefore helping the businesses and also helping the shoppers have a better experience. Absolutely, and sometimes postal times can take more than a couple of weeks depending where it's being posted to and from. So it's really 
adding extra benefits there because I know it's just such an inconvenience when something doesn't fit properly. So yeah. what do you think are the biggest challenges and opportunities today in the online shopping segment? Biggest opportunity I like to start with is social media, right? A lot of experts are talking about this topic, how if you're trying to build a brand on social media, you better do it now. You better do it well because in three, two or three years' time, like Kerwin Ray you know, says all the time, we've got three years till D-Day. Most of the money spent on marketing in the world, in the global market, is on TV. And, and not much of it is spent, and that's why big corporations and not much is spent on social media at the moment. But in a few years' time, social media is going to you know, be what SEO became or like you know, Google search, search words and stuff. So um, in a few years' time, you, you won't have the opportunity anymore to build a brand unless you have a lot of capital behind you. The biggest challenge I'd say is sustainability, the environmental factor of um, online shopping, right? And there's two there's two parts to that. One of them that directly directly relates to us. The high amount of returns and yeah, the high amount of returns from online shopping. Most of them don't get you know go end up back on the um, on the shelves. They either get burnt or they end up in landfill. And on top of that, the emissions, out emissions from deliveries going back and forth. The numbers, if you look into it, are crazy. It adds up a lot, and yeah. Um, the second part is that because of our culture of buying so much and, and, and throwing away so much new clothes, the, the production process and creating those clothes and the landfill, like the the whole process environmentally, um, is killing our world. And I don't think we found a solution for it. I don't think there's enough awareness for it around it. So without you know the whole world giving it attention. That it deserves it's not an, a problem that's easily fixed absolutely having a more efficient process can definitely stop wastage and and reduce our carbon footprint so anthony you mentioned about changing those site visits and clicks into actual sales i wish there was some magic theory that we could apply and i love that advice you gave our viewers to act now don't delay and enter into their social media shopping um, plans and yeah. goals because soon it might be too late unless you have a lot of capital behind you. So yeah. in your opinion, we have to start winding up now, but hopefully we can get a little bit more of your insights shared on the show. In your opinion, what makes Zilio unique in the market? So in a nutshell, a lot of people have tried to solve this trillion dollar problem, but no one's been able, no one in the world's been able to pull it off. What makes us different is our solution is really like our technology is very very scalable which means that we can we can digitize garments in 3d on the spot allowing us to launch into fashion labels at a very fast rate and like uh, yeah and this is we this hasn't been seen in the industry before on top of that we have a solution that actually provides a lot of value and a lot of like information about the fit all our all our users we've spoken to everyone said that after using Zilio they fully understand how the garment fits and they'll use it every single time they shop because it just wouldn't make sense not to. So having these two you know, elements, having a product that uh, you know, shoppers love and also having the technology that is scalable with what's available in the world right now is what makes us different. And these days it's not just about serving customers, is it Anthony? It's about a shopping experience. And it sounds like you're really making some major advances in that area. So before we wind up, are there any last closing comments or near pipeline goals you'd like to share with us? Are there any major clients who've jumped on with Zilio yet or brand partners? There have been, there have been. So we've signed up, we haven't launched commercially yet. We've launched our pilot, you know, um, but we've signed up nine fashion labels. And if you want to jump on our website, they're all listed there. But one of the biggest ones is by Bettina Liano, the Jean Queen. I'm not too sure if you if you know if you're aware, but um, massive names like Madonna, Britney Spears, they've all worn her worn her designs, and she's one of our fashion mentors and and early supporters. Um, and we have lots of brands like that. Um, and with yeah, with our technology, you'll be able to make your own 3D Zillia avatar, and you'll be able to see the fit of garments with coloured heat maps showing you where it's loose and where it's tight. Garment outlines showing you where it starts in the body or where it ends or how far the sleeve goes down in your arm and specific fit measurements of the garment on every single area of your body in 3D.
Thank you so much for joining us. And yes, Bettina Liano, I absolutely know about her, helping to make denim the sixth element in Victoria. Yes, yeah. um, absolutely. She's got a lovely shop in Flinders Lane, I believe. Um, yes, yes, I think Street. yes. And yeah. thank you so much for joining us today, Anthony. Really appreciate the time and the thought you gave our discussion. And yeah, viewers, if you've just joined us, we just had a very inspiring in discussion with Anthony Kwok, the CEO of Zelio. And you can check out his website. Uh, Anthony, before you go, do you mind sharing your website with our viewers? Of course. It's www.zilio.com.au. Perfect. Thank you so much. And you can check out the full discussion on our YouTube channel, Kalkine Media, later today. And please stay tuned as we've got more expert talks and live market updates coming up for you. And as we say, stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkine. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. What more could this man have done? This was the question posed by Judge Anthony Kelly, the judge presiding over tennis world number one Novak Djokovic's case to have his visa reinstated. This case has frankly been an embarrassment for Australia, who had perhaps been determined to display their tough stance on COVID vaccinations. Mr Djokovic's lawyer, Nicholas Wood SC, argued this morning that Djokovic had done everything that he thought was required in order for him to enter the country. Not only that, but Djokovic provided the evidence required to support his declaration when he applied for the exemption. Mr Wood said as a result of Djokovic providing sufficient evidence, the federal government initially granted him a visa. So clearly, something has gone seriously wrong in the time between then and when Djokovic landed in Melbourne, where he has since been detained and threatened with deportation, which has resulted in protest in front of his current hotel confinement and scathing commentary from Serbia's president. It doesn't stop there though. Even Judge Kelly admitted his own agitation this morning, telling the court the Serbian was correct in assuming his medical exemption was indeed valid. Djokovic had applied for a medical exemption from having the COVID vaccination administered, and Tennis Australia did indeed confirm that exemption had been granted following a rigorous and blind process, meaning that the identity of the applicant was unknown to the two separate independent panels. Then, last Tuesday evening, Djokovic announced via his Instagram that he would indeed be heading down under following his medical exemption approval. One has to wonder if he hadn't have made that announcement, whether we'd be here right now. The topic has, like much of the discussion surrounding COVID, vaccines and various governments over the past two years, caused an enormous split right down the centre of the country. Many were furious at the decision to allow Djokovic into the country to compete, citing elite privilege and that money talks. Perhaps their derision could have instead been aimed at Dan Andrews and Scott Morrison, the two people who have actually created this situation in the first place. Prime Minister Scott Morrison of course got involved, saying Djokovic would be on the next plane home if he couldn't provide sufficient evidence as to why he was unable to be vaccinated. But here's the problem, which seems even more evident now. Djokovic already had provided sufficient evidence, and this is where the finger pointing started with a Mexican standoff between Tennis Australia, Home Affairs and the federal government, all of them pointing a gun at one another like the end of a Tarantino film. Following Morrison's comment, Home Affairs Minister Karen Andrews said that just because the Victorian government and Tennis Australia permitted a non-vaccinated player to compete in the Australian Open, it doesn't actually mean the federal government won't enforce different requirements at the Australian border. which 
begs the question Judge Anthony Kelly asked in court this morning. What more could Djokovic have done? So, what's the likely outcome from here? There are plenty of signs pointing to a verdict in Djokovic's favour. By the same token, the federal government has further outlined that even in that scenario, they could theoretically once again deny Djokovic a visa. One thing is for certain though, this is a royal stuff up from three parties, and none of them have the name Novak. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calpine TV. What more could this man have done? This was the question posed by Judge Anthony Kelly, the judge presiding over tennis world number one Novak Djokovic's case to have his visa reinstated. This case has frankly been an embarrassment for Australia, who had perhaps been determined to display their tough stance on COVID vaccinations. Mr Djokovic's lawyer, Nicholas Wood SC, argued this morning that Djokovic had done everything that he thought was required in order for him to enter the country. Not only that, but Djokovic provided the evidence required to support his declaration when he applied for the exemption. Mr Wood said as a result of Djokovic providing sufficient evidence, the federal government initially granted him a visa. So clearly, something has gone seriously wrong in the time between then and when Djokovic landed in Melbourne, where he has since been detained and threatened with deportation, which has resulted in protest in front of his current hotel confinement and scathing commentary from Serbia's president. It doesn't stop there though. Even Judge Kelly admitted his own agitation this morning, telling the court the Serbian was correct in assuming his medical exemption was indeed valid. Djokovic had applied for a medical exemption from having the COVID vaccination administered, and Tennis Australia did indeed confirm that exemption had been granted following a rigorous and blind process, meaning that the identity of the applicant was unknown to the two separate independent panels. Then, last Tuesday evening, Djokovic announced via his Instagram that he would indeed be heading down under following his medical exemption approval. One has to wonder if he hadn't have made that announcement, whether we'd be here right now. The topic has, like much of the discussion surrounding COVID, vaccines and various governments over the past two years, caused an enormous split right down the centre of the country. Many were furious at the decision to allow Djokovic into the country to compete, citing elite privilege and that money talks. Perhaps their derision could have instead been aimed at Dan Andrews and Scott Morrison, the two people who have actually created this situation in the first place. Prime Minister Scott Morrison of course got involved, saying Djokovic would be on the next plane home if he couldn't provide sufficient evidence as to why he was unable to be vaccinated. But here's the problem, which seems even more evident now. Djokovic already had provided sufficient evidence, and this is where the finger pointing started, with a Mexican standoff between Tennis Australia, Home Affairs, and the federal government, all of them pointing a gun at one another like the end of a Tarantino film. Following Morrison's comment, Home Affairs Minister Karen Andrews said that just because the Victorian government and Tennis Australia permitted a non-vaccinated player to compete in the Australian Open, it doesn't actually mean the federal government won't enforce different requirements at the Australian border. Which begs the question Judge Anthony Kelly asked in court this morning. What more could Djokovic have done. So, what's the likely outcome from here? There are plenty of signs pointing to a verdict in Djokovic's favour. By the same token, the federal government has further outlined that even in that scenario, they could theoretically once again deny Djokovic a visa. One thing is for certain though, this is a royal stuff up from three parties, and none of them have the name Novak.
Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. With the advent of a pandemic, innovations in the field of medical healthcare and biotechnology have gained serious momentum. The need of the hour and a strong dependence on the medical system pushed these sectors to a new high. The biggest benefactors of the recent rally are the healthcare, technology and wellness solution related players. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. What more could this man have done? This was the question posed by Judge Anthony Kelly, the judge presiding over tennis world number one Novak Djokovic's case to have his visa reinstated. This case has frankly been an embarrassment for Australia, who had perhaps been determined to display their tough stance on COVID vaccinations. Mr Djokovic's lawyer, Nicholas Wood SC, argued this morning that Djokovic had done everything that he thought was required in order for him to enter the country. Not only that, but Djokovic provided the evidence required to support his declaration when he applied for the exemption. Mr Wood said as a result of Djokovic providing sufficient evidence, the federal government initially granted him a visa. So clearly, something has gone seriously wrong in the time between then and when Djokovic landed in Melbourne, where he has since been detained and threatened with deportation, which has resulted in protest in front of his current hotel confinement and scathing commentary from Serbia's president. It doesn't stop there though. Even Judge Kelly admitted his own agitation this morning, telling the court the Serbian was correct in assuming his medical exemption was indeed valid. Djokovic had applied for a medical exemption from having the COVID vaccination administered, and Tennis Australia did indeed confirm that exemption had been granted following a rigorous and blind process, meaning that the identity of the applicant was unknown to the two separate independent panels. Then, last Tuesday evening, Djokovic announced via his Instagram that he would indeed be heading down under following his medical exemption approval. One has to wonder if he hadn't have made that announcement, whether we'd be here right now. The topic has, like much of the discussion surrounding COVID, vaccines and various governments over the past two years, caused an enormous split right down the centre of the country. Many were furious at the decision to allow Djokovic into the country to compete, citing elite privilege and that money talks. Perhaps their derision could have instead been aimed at Dan Andrews and Scott Morrison, the two people who have actually created this situation in the first place. Prime Minister Scott Morrison of course got involved, saying Djokovic would be on the next plane home if he couldn't provide sufficient evidence as to why he was unable to be vaccinated. But here's the problem, which seems even more evident now. Djokovic already had provided sufficient evidence, and this is where the finger pointing started with a Mexican standoff between Tennis Australia, Home Affairs and the federal government, all of them pointing a gun at one another like the end of a Tarantino film. Following Morrison's comment, Home Affairs Minister Karen Andrews said that just because the Victorian government and Tennis Australia permitted a non-vaccinated player to compete in the Australian Open, it doesn't actually mean the federal government won't enforce different requirements at the Australian border. Which 
begs the question Judge Anthony Kelly asked in court this morning. What more could Djokovic have done? So, what's the likely outcome from here? There are plenty of signs pointing to a verdict in Djokovic's favour. By the same token, the federal government has further outlined that even in that scenario, they could theoretically once again deny Djokovic a visa. One thing is for certain though, this is a royal stuff up from three parties, and none of them have the name Novak. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. Good afternoon, James Preston with you live from Kalkine's Sydney studios and it's great to have your company for the Penny Picks, a show that focuses exclusively on penny stocks. After Tuesday's selling route, which dragged the benchmark ASX 200 down by 0.77%, markets have been much kinder to investors today. The ASX 200 has parred all the losses from Tuesday and was trading 0.84% higher by noon on the 12th of January 2022. Small caps are outperforming markets as the ASX Small Ordinaries Index was up by 0.92%. The smallest of the lot, penny stocks are also making noise today. So with that said, let's take a look at three ASX penny stocks that are doing wonders for their investors, beginning with Pac Gold. Pac Gold is an Australian gold exploration company with its flagship Alice River Gold project in North Queensland. The company has a market cap of $24.18 million and reported a net loss of $858,000 in the 2021 financial year, significantly up from a loss of a mere $3.75,000 in 2020. On Wednesday, the company announced that there had been a significant expansion of the newly discovered high-grade gold zone at its Alice River project. This result in one of the drill holes represents a pivotal advance for the Alice River project. It's providing compelling indications that pack gold have just intersected the top of a large, high-grade gold system only 100 metres below the surface. The company have achieved rapid success applying the gold mineralisation model based on the T1 Donlan Gold Deposit in Alaska. It suggests potential higher grades as they transition deeper into the system. And the news helped pack gold's shares catapult to an all-time high of $0.08, cents, gaining 62.24% in today's session as of noon. Time now for a very short break before we take a look at two other penny stocks that are performing very well today. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Kalkine TV. Welcome back to the Penny Picks. We're taking a look at penny stocks that have performed exceptionally on the ASX today. We've already analysed Pack Gold. Let's now take a look at Imuron. Imuron is a Melbourne-based biotechnology company listed on the ASX and the NASDAQ. The company's primary focus is to research and develop polyclonal antibodies that can address significant unmet needs. In the 2021 financial year, the company massively increased its net loss to 8.38 million Aussie dollars from 2.93 million in 2020. 
Imiron shares have rallied 29.03% to 12 cents in today's session so far on the back of a high volume of over 4.7 million shares after the company announced that it had been awarded 6.2 million Aussie dollars from the US Department of Defence to evaluate a military strength dosing regimen for travelling clinically. This new project will expand the company's clinical development program and it also represents the first of several significant clinical trials which the company expects to undertake with the US military in 2022. The US Naval Medical Research Center plans to clinically evaluate the protective efficacy of the new oral therapeutic this year in two controlled human infection model clinical trials. And our last penny stock to focus on is Novati Group. Novati is a software company with a market cap of 97.85 million Aussie dollars. It enables businesses to pay and be paid, and the company caters to every business from a corner store to a startup to even a global organization. At noon, Novati shares had surged 22.03% to 36 cents after retracing a bit from the day's high of 38 cents apiece, a piece, should I say, which is also the highest level since the 24th of November 2021. The stock has also clocked a much higher volume of 1.44 million shares than a 20-day average of 473,000 shares. Last month, Novati Group announced the appointment of Abigail Cheel as a non-executive director of the company and chair of the company's Audit and Risk Committee. Ms Cheadle is a chartered accountant with 30 years experience working across Asia, Europe, the Middle East and also Australia. During this time, she led professional services practices for a number of leading firms, including EY, Deloitte and Corda Mentha, with a focus on corporate strategy and risk management. All right, well, that's all for now on The Penny Picks. Hope you enjoyed the show. Make sure to stay tuned to Calkine TV for the latest market insights, business news and exclusive interviews. I'm James Preston for Calkine. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calpine TV. So will we see stagflation in 2022? Well, let's take a look. I'm Rachel Jones and this is Kalkai Media. Amid changing headwinds, the inflation forecast for Australia remains complicated. The country has now entered another year marked with uncertainty. While inflation anxiety is dominant among some economists, other experts believe that inflationary expectations might be overblown. These diverging views come as uncertain policy changes lie in the backdrop. The Reserve Bank of Australia has hinted at the possibility of a rate hike. However, the bank has has not given a clear timeline. The supply constraints taking shape globally have also contributed to the uncertainty around inflation in the coming months. The Australian property price journey has been unmatched by any other sector within the country. Housing prices have risen at an alarming rate, perpetually reaching new highs. However, it's important to note that an interest rate hike might put downward pressure on inflation. A rise in interest rates would have a direct impact on housing prices. As lending becomes expensive, the housing sector is expected to cool off, especially as buyers develop expectations of further rate hikes. Stagflation is a combination of low economic growth as well as rising unemployment and extremely high levels of inflation. It can be assumed that stagflation may not be a realistic possibility for Australia in 2022, though a proportion of experts are speculating inflation could persist. The indications for the job market seem positive. Rising job ads have provided a better than expected outlook for 2022. Even as surging Omicron cases loom in the background, the predictions for employment remain upbeat. 
Data by Australia and New Zealand banks suggests that job ads rose by 7.4% in November 2021, and this momentum is expected to continue in 2022 as well. So in a nutshell, economic recovery is expected to continue into the new year, with the labour market developing resilience along the way. Additionally, a recovery in wages could further bring out a radical change in policy action. If wages growth exceeds inflation growth, then it's highly likely that contractory policy measures would be adopted. Now, if you like the information in this video, you can like, share and comment on it. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel and you can press the bell icon to get notifications for our latest videos. I'm Rachel for Calchi Media. Good morning and thanks for joining us. Holly Shields here for Calkine TV, welcoming you all to another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks, the show where we bring you industry leaders, successful business owners and market experts all under one roof to help you discover the latest economic insights. On today's show, we're joined by Chris Stewart, CEO of Q Music, Queensland's Music Development Association, aka the backbone of the state's contemporary music economy. Welcome to the show, Chris. It's a pleasure to have you with us. I'm excited to be here. Great to have you on. Before we get started, I've just got to say congratulations on your appointment as CEO. It's been a very fresh three weeks, I believe. Yeah, that's right. Previous, I was uh, in the live entertainment industry, sort of more from the venue and festival perspective. I uh, was heading a Brisbane powerhouse, which is sort of a major venue here in, in Brisbane. But the opportunity to sort of come to a, an organisation like Q Music that sits across the entire industry, I think is really exciting and will give me hopefully a great chance to, to affect some change and really support some, some people. Absolutely. It sounds like you're just getting started. Just is exactly yes. the right word, just. <laughs> So to kick things off, for those who might not know, what are the various ways Q Music supports artists and the live music industry? Yeah, so Q Music's the peak body for uh, live music here in Queensland, and it sort of has a couple of different ways it helps. One is as you know, a traditional peak body which works closely with government and other stakeholders, making sure they understand what the reality of the live music industry is at the moment, both in in challenges, but also what it's able to do for for the economy here in Queensland, especially the nighttime economy. So we work closely with those as a as a sort of information source, you know, sometimes lobbying and applying pressure when it's needed, certainly making sure government understands. And the other side is there's a whole bunch of programs that we do, which uh, ranges from things that are quite grassroots. They may be grants programs, there's awards programs, there's scholarships, there's some international exchanges that we help facilitate. There's uh, Q Music Connect, which is an industry development and support program that we do across all of Queensland, helping uh, the music industry, especially early career artists, with understanding how to best maximise uh, existing opportunities in, in the music industry. Uh, and that's a really interesting program because Queensland is such a decentralised state to sort of both be working on the Gold Coast and Cairns is a really big footprint for an organisation to try and cover. So that's one thing that's really important to us is making sure that we are present in, in all of those cities. Uh, we also have a bunch of festivals that we do. We work very closely with, with the city of Brisbane, with events such as Valley Fiesta. We have winter sessions, uh, a large uh, multi-venue festival that we're delivering for the city coming up in a few weeks. And probably like the, the most important thing we do in, in some ways of measuring it is an event called Big Sound, which is the largest music industry event in the Southern Hemisphere. It's all about sort of uh, discovery of new ideas and new talent. You know, it's a way for the industry to come together to, to sort of discuss where we currently stand and help chart, you know, some relationships that can help take them forward and discover a lot of new talent as well. There'll be, you know, hundreds of artists that get presented across all of the venues of Fortitude Valley during Big Sound. Right, well, it sounds like you have a lot on offer, not just for artists, but uh, for music enthusiasts as well. Yeah, I think that's really 
important for what the value of the organization is that the music industry is a very big tent it's you know there's the there's the part that i think the general public sees which is obviously the artists those very live events but what supports that is a really big network of uh live venues of people working back of house of of it's an industry where a lot of that iceberg is sort of unseen because of that it contributes you know hundreds of millions of dollars to the australian economy to the queensland economy and i think is a very uh important part of making sure precincts such as fortitude valley are, are vibrant all year round you know we want to give people reasons to come in that that is really diverse you know and i think engaging with the live music industry is a really exciting part of that Absolutely. And what do you see as the challenges for the industry at the moment? Well, there's probably one big challenge that you've maybe heard of that's sort of going on at the minute. I think the real, look, I think uncertainty is a, is a real challenge for, for live music at the moment. If we're speaking directly about Queensland, uh, a few, a couple of weeks ago, we were very confident. We were moving from most of our live music venues sitting at about 50% capacities. We were hoping to get that to 75 we were in a process of, of restrictions easing when uh, we hit this current set of lockdowns. And even as we came out of that, most venues are back to sort of 20% capacities. If you're working at a one person every four square metres, most venues are just shutting down in that context. There's, there's no real way for it to be commercially viable uh, once you're working under those sort of pressures. So how we come out of COVID is is a really interesting, you know, the, the recovery. I, I think a lot of the industry had hoped we would be much deeper into recovery now. I think they had hoped we would be like a lot of under, other industries. But the one thing we've really learnt from lockdowns especially, but also border closes, is they don't hit every industry in the same way. And the live music industry, the food and beverage industries, uh, a lot of those hospitality-based industries, a lot of small businesses are taking much more of the financial and economic burden that comes with COVID closures and lockdowns. And I think that's one of the messages that we really hope government and others sort of understand, that, that there are a lot of industries that I think are actually able to, to trade through a lot of COVID challenges without massive financial impacts. But for the music industry, it's completely devastating. And I think one of the the biggest fears at the moment especially with the current you know these late june early july lockdowns that have come with the the delta uh variant i think a lot of us are really worried that there may be a few straw that broke the camel's back moments for some venues and some artists it's almost one last bridge too far 15 months into the lockdown there's a lot of money has been lost by this industry and i think how we support people through that because I think the the value of the live music industry is enormous and we definitely need it to still be there uh, three, six, nine months, five years from now. Absolutely. And you mentioned that the money lost just then. The $7 million in funding that the industry was mm. awarded in the budget, has that at all put a dent in the, in the financial losses? Well, we certainly... That's certainly the intention. And a lot of the the conversations we've been having and the work we've been doing with the state government has been about how to make sure uh, as much of that water as possible gets on the plants that need it. I mean, that's the sort of situation we're facing. So I think there's probably two stages that we're going to look to work with the state government on happening reasonably urgently. One is uh, part of that money uh, pretty quickly being able to be accessed by venues. There's a lot of venues that I think are, are right at a point of of solvency issues if we don't step in and, and give them a path through this that period post job keeper there was i think this uh sense that businesses were able to trade at a hundred percent again and maybe if you were harvey norman you were but a lot of food and beverage operators a lot of uh music venues just weren't that the, the the capacity issues meant that they were still running at losses and i think uh, an immediate injection from that $7 million to help uh, key music venues is probably one of the, the, the very first steps that uh, we will hope to help facilitate happening with the state government. It's, I know it's right on their mind. The other one that we're exploring a lot with them at the moment, and we hope there's a path forward, is 
how we can help individual musicians, how we can help practice, because I think they're uh, a section that there's a lot of growing visibility on how much individual damage there's been uh, and how much kind of financial stress is still happening for those. And that'll be a supply chain problem. If that breaks down, then, you know, we, we need to solve things on both sides. If there we start to lose venues, we lose the platforms for the music industry to sort of commercialise and monetize to make money. But equally, if we don't have those artists ready to step into those venues and perform, then it doesn't matter how many venues we keep open, that, that, that supply chain will have been broken. So we need to sort of look at how we can support both fronts at a very critical time to make sure we survive this and we return and recover as successfully as possible. That's definitely the hope and um, I agree with you that the, the money needs to go where it's needed. Especially I think for those young artists who've suffered the most challenges under COVID. Yeah, I think one of the things it's being an emerging artist is always a challenging thing. It's, you're, there's probably not too many mums encouraging their children to spend a lifetime in live music. It's, a, it's got to be a difficult game at the best of times. It's, you know, there's that, what's that thing they say, you, are, you can make a killing, but you can't make a living. It's a very challenging practice to be in live music. Um, but that being said, it's probably the area we need to give most attention to because we need to keep renewing from the ground up that there might be successful bands that have stayed on retainers. There might be people that have other sources of income coming through. But for a lot of emerging artists and early career artists, the money they earn from live performance is often the first line of income for you. It's the first way you start running a sustainable and viable music business. So making sure that returns and we support them is really important. We don't want to lose those guys. We, we don't want to lose a generation of musicians due to COVID. So that is a really critical thing for us going forward. Absolutely. I, I definitely agree there. And um, you mentioned earlier the festival you have coming up, Winter Sessions, mm. for this coming August. Speaking of all these COVID issues, how are you planning the event to be seamless amid the restrictions? Yeah, it's really interesting. I think our, at the moment, we're sort of planning on a few different fronts simultaneously. The ideal version will be within the next few weeks, we get to where the government hoped we would be a few weeks ago, which is uh, some restrictions that have been eased. Uh, venues being run probably closer to where live sporting venues and other live venues are, which is uh, much more practical capacities. So the venues can be run commercially. Obviously, there's a lot of stringent COVID safety practices that we need to do no matter what, and is sort of a non-negotiable. And what we are hoping is the evidence of that flows through to the restrictions being eased as the plan was a few weeks ago. That's sort of, I guess, the most positive practical scenario we can hope for. The next one is getting to where restrictions were just before that, which is that one person per two square metres, which, look, is is challenging, very challenging, and is still not probably that practical for, for those venues. But we hope with some of the financial support we can bring to the festival and the partnerships we've built with people such as the city, the city of Brisbane, that, that, that will still be something that will work for the artists and the venues. I don't think audiences are the problem. I think audiences have demonstrated their willingness to return and want the clear demand that there is for live music. So I think that isn't going to be the challenge. Probably the, the version that will be most difficult would be if it maintains what it is now with borders closed. So it's a challenge to get artists in from interstate. That's obviously an issue. Um, and equally, if we maintain it at one person per four square metres, which is what they're holding uh, live music venues, food and beverage venues too at the moment. So that would be the most critical challenge, not insurmountable, but obviously of the, the, the different scenarios we're preparing for, the one that will be most difficult for us to be able to work with the venues and musicians through, but still one we are, we're committed to seeing through. All right, and hopefully we get the best possible outcome there with limited restrictions. Just before we wrap up, what else can we expect to see from Q Music in the near future? 
Yeah, well, obviously, Big Sound is, is coming up for us in September, and then the Valley Fiesta is almost straight after that in October. So from now through to the end of the year, there's a lot of live performance that we're trying to do. We see that that's probably where we can really benefit uh, the industry really strongly. The other thing that's sort of coming up a lot is there's a lot of movement on a national level around um, uh, safety and harm minimisation. There's a lot of questions around equity and access that we're looking to really positive be a, a partner in. That's really a question not just for Queensland but for all of Australia to look at about how we make sure that sort of um, harm and harassment minimisation can happen both within our venues, but also within our industry, within the business of music. We need to start getting better and better in that. The music industry, I think, probably needs to hold its hand up and say it hasn't always had best practice for how it can support uh, people of colour, women. Um, there's been people that have had challenges in, in the past in the industry, and we need to sort of have a tell a bit of truth to ourselves about that and start doing better. So we're looking at a bunch of things that can happen nationally in that space as well, because this idea of recovery for our industry isn't just financial recovery, it's for how we can build a better music industry going forward. And we have a very big responsibility, I think, uh, to be a positive participant in that. And that's something else that's really right uh, as a big key discussion for us and, and something we really hope we can really help some success happen. Absolutely, and that is a really good point. Probably not something that too many people think about when they think about the recovery of the industry. But on that note, however, that is just about all we have time for. So I have to say, Chris, thank you so much for joining us. Your insights have been invaluable. Thank you. Great to have you on. And thanks for your time as well, viewers. Stay tuned and we'll be back with more live market updates. Holly Shields signing off. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. What more could this man have done? This was the question posed by Judge Anthony Kelly, the judge presiding over tennis world number one Novak Djokovic's case to have his visa reinstated. This case has frankly been an embarrassment for Australia, who had perhaps been determined to display their tough stance on COVID vaccinations. Mr Djokovic's lawyer, Nicholas Wood SC, argued this morning that Djokovic had done everything that he thought was required in order for him to enter the country. Not only that, but Djokovic provided the evidence required to support his declaration when he applied for the exemption. Mr Wood said as a result of Djokovic providing sufficient evidence, the federal government initially granted him a visa. So clearly, something has gone seriously wrong in the time between then and when Djokovic landed in Melbourne, where he has since been detained and threatened with deportation, which has resulted in protest in front of his current hotel confinement and scathing commentary from Serbia's president. It doesn't stop there though. Even Judge Kelly admitted his own agitation this morning, telling the court the Serbian was correct in assuming his medical exemption was indeed valid. Djokovic had applied for a medical exemption from having the COVID vaccination administered, and Tennis Australia did indeed confirm that exemption had been granted following a rigorous and blind process, meaning that the identity of the applicant was unknown to the two separate independent panels. Then, last Tuesday evening, Djokovic announced via his Instagram that he would indeed be heading down under following his medical exemption approval. 
One has to wonder if he hadn't have made that announcement, whether we'd be here right now. The topic has, like much of the discussion surrounding COVID, vaccines and various governments over the past two years, caused an enormous split right down the centre of the country. Many were furious at the decision to allow Djokovic into the country to compete, citing elite privilege and that money talks. Perhaps their derision could have instead been aimed at Dan Andrews and Scott Morrison, the two people who have actually created this situation in the first place. Prime Minister Scott Morrison of course got involved, saying Djokovic would be on the next plane home if he couldn't provide sufficient evidence as to why he was unable to be vaccinated. But here's the problem, which seems even more evident now. Djokovic already had provided sufficient evidence, and this is where the finger pointing started, with a Mexican standoff between Tennis Australia, Home Affairs and the federal government, all of them pointing a gun at one another like the end of a Tarantino film. Following Morrison's comment, Home Affairs Minister Karen Andrews said that just because the Victorian government and Tennis Australia permitted a non-vaccinated player to compete in the Australian Open, it doesn't actually mean the federal government won't enforce different requirements at the Australian border. Which begs the question Judge Anthony Kelly asked in court this morning. What more could Djokovic have done? So, what's the likely outcome from here? There are plenty of signs pointing to a verdict in Djokovic's favour. By the same token, the federal government has further outlined that even in that scenario, they could theoretically once again deny Djokovic a visa. One thing is for certain though, this is a royal stuff up from three parties, and none of them have the name Novak. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calpine TV. Hello everyone, I'm Rachel and I welcome you all to Executive Corner Expert Talks. Today I'm with Mo Jello. Mo is the CEO and co-founder of Zimri. Now Zimri is an innovative blockchain music platform and artist token exchange connecting passionate music artists and fans. Here at Calkine, we bring you industry leaders, successful business owners, market and equity advocates all under one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock market and help you understand how you can create multiple passive income streams. Welcome, Mo. How are you today? I'm good, thank you. Thanks very much for having me. Good to speak with you today. Now, first off, could you just let our viewers know how does your music blockchain technology work and how does it benefit artists? Uh, so at Zimri, we're specifically focusing on tokenization. Uh, that is the use of digital tokens and NFTs to develop and drive fan engagement by enabling artists to create a community or exclusive fan clubs for holders of their music tokens. Uh, music artists are able to offer unique rewards to encourage music fans to engage with the artists and create a dialogue and build a relationship. Uh, this could be offering unique virtual or physical gig experiences through to offering one-off collectibles through the issuance of uh, NFTs. We also provide the mechanism through our music artist token exchange for music fans to trade music artist tokens incentivized by the rewards on offer. At the same time, the music artists can also benef uh, benefit from this, with the artists also receiving ongoing residual income when their music artists uh, token is sold by their fans. Excellent. It sounds absolutely fascinating. So how does Zimri help musicians develop their careers and also provide them with innovative mechanisms to grow their own global brand? Well, according to the latest IFPI uh, Global Music Report, streaming now represents 62% of total global music record recorded music revenues today. So it's a significant percentage 
which represents a dominant, uh, dominant music business model today. But unless you're a global music artist, it's generally accepted that the vast majority of music artists don't make, make that much money from uh, streaming. The Broken Record Initiative are happening in the UK right now, where artists from the Rolling Stones through to Van Morrison are urging changes by the UK government on how artists are compensated is, uh, is testament to that. We believe by using different technologies, it's possible for music artists to create and develop stronger, deeper relationships with their fans, which has been lost through the era of streaming where music is now seen as more of a commodity. By tapping and leveraging the support that fans have with their artists, uh, through the artists they follow, through different business models, we can recreate that artist-fan relationship and passion, leading to artists being uh, compensated at a fair value for their creative endeavors. Now, Mo, you're obviously so immersed in this space. What do you believe is the significance of a new music economy in today's world? Well, in today's world, we're dealing with a number of uh, turbulent events which are impacting not simply the music industry, but the creative industries as well. It's not a shock to people that COVID-19 has had a massive impact on the, the music industry, in particular live music, uh, where uh, uh, the companies which rely on live music industry, industry to survive have also suffered as well. But also the impact of digitization, uh, new business models, such as the rise of streaming, and emerging technologies such as blockchain and AI are causing shifts in the manner in which music is not only consumed and distributed, but also in the way that the music value is transmitted between different stakeholders. And that's mainly between artists and fans, but also can include stakeholders such as uh, producers and publishers. So a new music economy is looking at how these shifts are impacting how, for example, music artists engage with their fans, whether that's through social media or through emerging use of tokenization and NFTs. These shifts impact how music artists can remove themselves from the traditional roots of getting a record label, releasing records, through to actually using these shifts to be more independent and be more successful. It can also relate to how bands and artists utilize new tools to, uh, to book shows, accrue audiences, uh, sell tickets to fans, and broadcast performances through online uh, platforms, through to how they perform in creative venues such as vineyards and through virtual worlds such as uh, Second Life. And in this fast-paced world, how do you believe technology is propelling the music industry currently? Well, the rise of NFTs is a really uh, interesting space. Uh, music artists have suffered financially through the pandemic and so this use of uh, these types of digital assets or tokens has enabled music artists to capitalize on this growing interest. Uh, not just music artists, but also creative artists such as Beeple and Grime have also been able to sell digital art as NFTs, in some cases for millions of dollars, thereby creating a new uh, creative asset class. With regards to music, uh, Kings of Leon, Weezer, uh, The Weeknd, have also released uh, NFTs and I think the interest in the space from the music industry is only going to grow further and can develop into areas, uh, interesting areas such as uh, smart collectibles. And can you talk me through how you closed the seed investment for Simri? Uh, we, we, we're out to the market. Uh, we'll use our tap to our network uh, and um, uh, told our story. Uh, and uh, eventually uh, we had some interest in people who were interested in the concept that were, and the aims of what the, uh, the firm is trying to do. Um, I wouldn't say it's an easy process, but I think if you have a strong vision, uh, a strong team behind you, uh, that makes the process a lot, uh, a lot easier. And just finally, Mo, what do you believe makes Zimri unique to the market? Well, I think, I mean, we come across many startups in the, um, in the blockchain space who tend to focus their efforts on talking about the bits and bytes and the technology, the tech aspects of blockchain, as opposed to what the benefits of blockchain are to their end users. Uh, we specifically try and avoid talking about blockchain too much because uh, most music artists are interested in how they release more records, um, um, sell more music and uh, make more money. We want to marry the benefits of blockchain to those end user needs. 
Um, another aspect that makes us unique is we allow music artists to release not only NFTs, but also physical items such as merchandise, music instruments that music fans can acquire by being a holder of a token. So we combine NFTs with a fan club approach by using the music artist token as a passport to unlock unique music items offered by those artists. You must find it a very fast-paced space to be working in. It's been really great to chat with you today, Mo. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. And with that, I will sign off for now. Watch this space for more. Till then, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Kalkine TV. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the current... Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. Please subscribe to the channel, press the bell icon to be notified of the latest videos. Today we're covering why is Splinter Shards or SPS crypto gaining popularity? Stay watching till the end to find out. Sage here for Kalkine Media. Splinter Shards Crypto has been gaining traction in the market after experts gave a bullish view on the token. And on Tuesday morning, it was trading flat at US $0.2195. So what are Splinter Shards? Splinter Shards tokens are governance tokens for the SPS Decentralized Autonomous Organization, or DAO. They were launched in July 2021. It mainly represents the game named Splinterlands, which is rapidly gaining popularity and earning investors' attention. Splinterlands is a digital collectible card game based on blockchain technology. It's inspired by similar games like Magic the Gathering, Hearthstone, etc. In the competitions, players build a card collection with different attributes and battle with each other and other players in matches based on skills. In the Splinterland game, players can buy, sell or trade digital currencies just like they could do in games like Magic the Gathering, Pokemon, etc. It was started back in May 2018. Splinterlands was created as a solution to players who could not own assets as the games became digital. So with the aid of blockchain technology, the players can hold and trade digital assets freely. In addition, it maintains transparency in the game, meaning all the cards of the game have a verified supply and historical record. The players battle with each other by choosing different battles, like ranked battles and practice battles. The ranked battles help players to increase their rating. And on the plus side, the beginners can also play the ranked battles without any trouble, as rating below 100 does not lose any ranking points. The battles generally happen between players having similar strengths. And in the game, the players from both sides must choose six monster cards and one summoner card for the battle. One can win the contest by destroying all the opponent's monster cards. The game, in general, is free to play, but the players must buy the summoner's spellbook for 10 US dollars to unlock the complete game. With the summoner's spellbook, players can assess several other features that could be redeemed for real currency. 
The game's daily users are over 0.3 million, and according to Dap Radar, it is one of the most popular games on any blockchain. In addition, the game doesn't promote itself, so its popularity comes from word of mouth. Pricing and other details of Splinter Shard's SPS token. So the SPS token was up 0.47% to reach 0.2195 US dollars on January 4th. Its market cap is US $76.58 million and its fully diluted market cap is $658.62 million US dollars. Its 24-hour trading volume through Tuesday morning was $2.64 million US dollars, up 39.95%. The SPS token saw the highest price of US $1.27 and the lowest price of US $0.132 in the last 52 weeks. It reached an all-time high of US $1.27 on July 28th, 2021. In conclusion, the Splinter Shards SPS token gave an 18.94% return in the 12 months. It has traded on exchanges like PancakeSwap version 2, Gate.io, etc. Its maximum supply is 3 billion. Around 7,000 people check out the free basic game daily, of which about 3,000 people opt to pay 10 US dollars for the additional features. Its growing popularity is catching investors' attention. And if you do like this information, let us know by liking, sharing, commenting on the video below. Subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon. You'll be advised every time Kalkine has a new video. But for more information like this, there's a website, kalkinemedia.com. Please have a look. Thanks for watching. Sage here for Kalkine Media. Who have been involved in exploring, developing. With the advent of a pandemic, Innovations in the field of medical healthcare and biotechnology have gained serious momentum. The need of the hour and a strong dependence on the medical system pushed these sectors to a new high. The biggest benefactors of the recent rally are the healthcare, technology and wellness solution related players who have been involved in exploring, developing and operating such beneficial projects. And in Kalkine Media's upcoming InvestNest webinar, you'll get the chance to discover the different innovations in the biotech and healthcare space from a host of experts. The Beyond Science Future of Biotech and Healthcare Harnessing Inventive Approaches webinar on January 28 will give you the opportunity to hear from and have your questions answered by esteemed leaders in the healthcare and biotech space who are valued clients of Kalkine Media. That includes the CEO and Managing Director of PainCheck, Philip Daffis, CEO and Managing Director of Prescient Therapeutics, Stephen Yutomi Clark, and Executive Chairman and MD and CEO of Holista Coltec, Dr. Regin Marnika Vasagar. Why wait? Register now and book your space for Calco Media's upcoming InvestNest webinar on January 28, 2022 at 12.30pm Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. The registration link is mentioned in the video description below. We hope to see you there and remember to stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkai Media. The Morrison government first started a pandemic leave disaster payment back in July 2021. With surging infections of coronavirus now, Prime Minister Scott Morrison has reminded fellow Aussies about financial help for people affected by COVID. I'm Rachel and this is Kalkai Media. So how can you claim the $750 payment for COVID-19 isolation? Well, firstly, you need to download and complete the claim for pandemic leave disaster payment from servicesaustralia.gov.au. The COVID-19 assistance provides $750 a week for a person under isolation, quarantine or for care of a COVID-19 infected patient. The eligibility criteria means you have to be above the age of 17 years and an Australian resident or a visa holder with a work permit. If a person needs the payment after seven days, they need to submit a new claim every week. Initially, the scheme was set out at $1,500 for a 14-day period. However, this has been changed to weekly support of $750 since the 9th of December. The person claiming the money must also be unable to attend work or earn any income. 
The condition also includes claimants not having any sick leave entitlements, pandemic sick leave or personal or carer's leave. If couples claim the assistance together, there's no need to fill out separate forms. The support is taxable, which means people will need to include it in their tax returns that they file. Now, if you like the information in this video, you can like, share and comment on it, and you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can also press the bell icon to get notifications for our latest videos. I'm Rachel, signing off for Kalkine Media. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calpine TV. So will we see stagflation in 2022? Well, let's take a look. I'm Rachel Jones and this is Calcine Media. Amid changing headwinds, the inflation forecast for Australia remains complicated. The country has now entered another year marked with uncertainty. While inflation anxiety is dominant among some economists, other experts believe that inflationary expectations might be overblown. These diverging views come as uncertain policy changes lie in the backdrop. The Reserve Bank of Australia has hinted at the possibility of a rate hike. However, the bank has has not given a clear timeline. The supply constraints taking shape globally have also contributed to the uncertainty around inflation in the coming months. The Australian property price journey has been unmatched by any other sector within the country. Housing prices have risen at an alarming rate, perpetually reaching new highs. However, it's important to note that an interest rate hike might put downward pressure on inflation. A rise in interest rates would have a direct impact on housing prices. As lending becomes expensive, the housing sector is expected to cool off, especially as buyers develop expectations of further rate hikes. Stagflation is a combination of low economic growth as well as rising unemployment at extremely high levels of inflation. It can be assumed that stagflation may not be a realistic possibility for Australia in 2022, though a proportion of experts are speculating inflation could persist. The indications for the job market seem positive. Rising job ads have provided a better than expected outlook for 2022. Even as surging Omicron cases loom in the background, the predictions for employment remain upbeat. Data by Australia and New Zealand banks suggests that job ads rose by 7.4% in November 2021, and this momentum is expected to continue in 2022 as well. So in a nutshell, economic recovery is expected to continue into the new year, with the labour market developing resilience along the way. Additionally, a recovery in wages could further bring out a radical change in policy action. If wages growth exceeds inflation growth, then it's highly likely that contractory policy measures would be adopted. Now, if you like the information in this video, you can like, share and comment on it. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel and you can press the bell icon to get notifications for our latest videos. I'm Rachel for Calcine Media. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calpine TV.
Can Radix touch the $1 mark? Let's take a closer look. Hey, and thanks for tuning in. Holly Shields here for Calvine Media. Radix Crypto is the first layer one protocol, which means it's easy for the developers to build and scale decentralized finance, reducing congestion and smart contract leaks. As Radix optimizes cross shard synchronicity, it's able to seamlessly execute smart contracts through its system. And with its unique protocol, Radix takes care of four key issues, which developers often face while building DeFi and DLT applications. So what makes it unique? Well, first of all, it was founded by Dan Hughes, and Radix Crypto uses the Byzantine fault-tolerance-based Cerberus consensus protocol, which allows the DeFi to scale without any friction. This helps the crypto to do all the transactions automatically across multiple shards. Radix also offers the developers incentives to ensure that the applications are properly deployed on the protocol, and the automated rewards function helps them to create a decentralized autonomous marketplace for Radix components. On top of that, users can also stake the tokens and gain rewards in the process. The crypto is available for trading on the leading crypto exchange Bitfinex and is expected to be listed on other exchanges as well. So how is Radix faring? XLD Crypto is ranked number 3340 on CoinMarketCap and even though Radix hasn't gained much momentum, it could become one of the strongest DeFi tokens by 2026. The listing on multiple exchanges should help the token to grow further, but for now, with just one exchange, some feel that its range is too limited. Its first goal is to ensure a decent rally in the market so that the investors can gain some confidence in the token. What's your take on Radix? Share your thoughts in the comments and check out some of our other videos to stay up to date. Holly Shields for Calcine Media. With the advent of a pandemic, innovations in the field of medical healthcare and biotechnology have gained serious momentum. The need of the hour and a strong dependence on the medical system pushed these sectors to a new high. The biggest benefactors of the recent rally are the healthcare, technology and wellness solution related players who have been involved in exploring, developing and operating such beneficial projects. And in Calcine Media's upcoming InvestNest webinar, you'll get the chance to discover the different innovations in the biotech and healthcare space from a host of experts. The Beyond Science Future of Biotech and Healthcare Harnessing Inventive Approaches webinar on January 28 will give you the opportunity to hear from and have your questions answered by esteemed leaders in the healthcare and biotech space who are valued clients of Calcine Media. That includes the CEO and Managing Director of PainCheck, Philip Daffis, CEO and Managing Director of Prescian Therapeutics, Stephen Utomi Clark, and Executive Chairman and MD and CEO of Holista Coltec, Dr. Regin Marnika Vasagar. Why wait? Register now and book your space for Calcar Media's upcoming InvestNest webinar on January 28, 2022 at 12.30pm Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. The registration link is mentioned in the video description below. We hope to see you there and remember to stay apprised and invest wise with Kaokai Media. Hi there, James Preston for Kaokai TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkind's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkind TV. Boarding pass, please. Hi, I'm Holly Shields and I'll be your host for Calkind TV's new show, Travel Insights. 
Tune in to get the latest developments in the travel and tourism space. From updates on restrictions to travel guides to info about recreation and outdoor activities or tour guides to the financials of the sector. Though the travel industry has been hit hard from the pandemic, there is still potential left for a revival on the back of economic uptick and COVID safe travel measures. So if you want to know where the travel and tourism space is heading, dust off your passports, pack your bags and watch Travel Insights every Monday exclusively on Calkine TV. Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Calkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal. What's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. Thank you for watching Calkine TV. We have some breaking news to share with you. It's just been announced by the New South Wales Premier Dominic Perrottet that New South Wales residents will be fined $1,000 for not registering positive rapid antigen tests or rats for COVID-19. This is important news as all those who have tested positive using a rat from the 1st of January 2022 need to register their positive result using the Service New South Wales app or risk getting fined. People can register dependents positive rat test results for them using the app too. And this is in an attempt to gather accurate data in regards to COVID-19 for the state of New South Wales in order to project and predict the possible future outcomes of the current Omicron outbreak. Thank you for watching Calkine TV. Please continue to watch Calkine for further market updates, breaking news, expert talks and this is Sage. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Calkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Calkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Calkine TV. With the advent of a pandemic, innovations in the field of medical healthcare and biotechnology have gained serious momentum. The need of the hour and a strong dependence on the medical system pushed these sectors to a new high. The biggest benefactors of the recent rally are the healthcare, technology and wellness solution related players who have been involved in exploring, developing and operating such beneficial projects. And in Calcon Media's upcoming InvestNest webinar, you'll get the chance to discover the different innovations in the biotech and healthcare space from a host of experts. The Beyond Science Future of Biotech and Healthcare Harnessing Inventive Approaches webinar on January 28 will give you the opportunity to hear from and have your questions answered by esteemed leaders in the healthcare and biotech space who are valued clients of Calcon Media. That includes the CEO and Managing Director of PainCheck, Philip Daffis, CEO and Managing Director of Prescient Therapeutics, Stephen Utomi Clark, and Executive Chairman and MD and CEO of Holista Coltec, Dr. Regine Marnika Vasagar. 
Why wait? Register now and book your space for Calco Media's upcoming InvestNest webinar on January 28, 2022 at 12.30pm Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. The registration link is mentioned in the video description below. We hope to see you there and remember to stay apprised and invest wise with Calco Media. Hello and welcome to another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks. I'm James Preston and in this Expert Talk, I'll be shining the spotlight on X-Growth, a company dedicated to assisting B2B tech companies close more mid-market and enterprise deals. And in order to find out exactly how X-Growth does it, there's no one better to talk to than the founder and director of X-Growth, Shahin Hoda. Shahin, a very warm welcome to you. James, thanks for having me. Shaheen, great to have you here. Just before we get to the finer points of X growth, how is it down in Victoria at the moment? No COVID cases in six days, the Melbourne Grand Prix, though that's now apparently being cancelled and that's not until November. Is there a bit of confusion operating around at the moment? Is it affecting how you're running X growth? Not necessarily how we run X growth. I think we, uh, you know, we went as a company remote pretty early on in the, in the whole process of, uh, of, of COVID. And that's, uh, that's, that's served us well. And we were lucky to, to be able to go uh, remote. A lot of companies weren't able to. But there, there's definitely a little bit of confusion, uh, especially what is happening now across, the, uh, across Australia. That used to be us. And, uh, and now it's like every, everywhere else is going lockdown. And I feel like the Victorians are like, should we go in lockdown or not? Uh, what's, what's, what's happening? So uh, there's, there's definitely a little bit of confusion. No, I think you've um, had your Victoria. turn. You can certainly push it back onto us. It's our time for it. We don't want it either, but <laughs> well, that's just how it works. But good to hear that it hasn't really affected the business. Let's get stuck into the details itself now. How do you help businesses really? in rolling out an account-based initiative in their organizations? Yeah, I think, you know, and it, well, first of all, I think it's important to define why account-based and why is that important. I think a lot of organizations, and especially in the B2B space, the uh, when when businesses are selling to another business things have become a lot more complicated over over time and as a result uh, your your approach to the mar your marketing and sales need to get more and more sophisticated and uh, and that's where we kind of come in where we in a nutshell uh, compared to traditional marketing strategies where somebody would go and say you know what we're going to put our message out there to the whole market and make sure that everybody hears about it our approach is a little bit different where we say you know, let's identify the most important accounts for you, uh, and, uh, and and let's say there would be 50 accounts, and only market to those 50 accounts, and let's not waste our resources and, and energy for uh, for you know the wider market because that might not be a good fit. Uh, so uh, so that's that's the approach that we take, and that's that's why it's it's uh, a lot of organizations are picking that up, especially with COVID. Uh, it's become more important because resources are strained. Uh, in, in some organizations and, and a lot of businesses are, uh, are trying to become a lot more uh, targeted with their approach to market. Well, look, it seems quite streamlined and it's very specific as well in its, its focus as opposed to just casting a broad net. Why do you think there's not more businesses doing that kind of advertising? I think there are two challenges. One, it's a new field. It's a new area that, uh, that people are exploring. It really exploded in the US in, in about 2014, 2015, and it's, it's making its way to, uh, to Australia as well. And it's really in the past one or two years that, uh, that we're starting to see a lot of people talking about it here. So I think there's a little bit of brand, a little bit of market awareness uh, for, uh, for, for business owners or, or marketing professionals to get more familiar with it. Uh, but also, you know, it's a it's a very resource intensive approach because uh, and, and, it, and it's a it's a complex approach because you are you're going very deep into an account you want to do a lot of research so if somebody is looking at a, a massive telco like telstra they got to do a lot of research into mm -hmm. into telstra understand their initiatives and that makes it challenging for some of the smaller organizations to uh, to adopt it but you know the big public organizations the IBMs of the world, the, the Salesforce of the world, the Microsoft of the world, they've been, they've been doing this for a while. 
I'd imagine it's also a very different focus. I mean, if you're looking to advertise and market to the public, you know, you're, you're after a general consensus of potentially millions of people, whereas this is very much focused on uh, a specific sort of group of other businesses that you're trying to, I suppose, access in a different way. It, do you approach it differently? I mean, is there a significant level of difference in taking, for example, a major marketing campaign around state of origin or the AFL compared to, for example, no, we're trying to sell this business to this specific business. How, do, how does that differ? Uh, there, there are a couple of differences. One is a, a really high collaboration with sales where marketing pre previously were very independent and they would kind of do their own activity and maybe pass stuff to sales um, or, uh, or they're, they're kind of separate departments from sales. So a very high collaboration between sales uh, is, is one of the things that is different. The other thing is you start to leverage a lot of different channels, a lot of, a lot of different pathways to your customer. So uh, you would hear a lot about biz, uh, you know, a business guru talking about, hey, do you know how to run Facebook ads? And we are going to get you customers through Facebook or do SEO or do whatever. With an account-based strategy, you have to take all of that into, into account in order to be able to get, get a hold of uh, some of these accounts that you're trying to target. So leveraging your Facebook and LinkedIn and different types of ads, email, call, uh, maybe direct mail if, uh, if people are back in the office. So having that multi-channel approach is, is really key. And you just got to think about it. It becomes a lot more personal. It becomes extremely personal to the account that you're going after because you say, hey, there is, I'm trying to close, for example, Telstra, and there are 50 people in, in Telstra that are important for me, and I know them by name, and, I, and I'm going to have mm. a very personalized um, approach for them. Yeah, well, I guess as we get um, more segmented in, in many ways between things like you know, different streaming providers, everything gets broken down into small little pockets here and there. It's the same thing for business as well, same thing for marketing too. And we're in an age of conversion, so I suppose there are so many different elements you have to consider as well whenever you're doing one of these proposals. Could you give us a little more insight into your fully integrated customer acquisition pipeline? Yeah, so you know, one, one of the things that uh, businesses have realized, especially with, uh, with COVID, is the importance of, of your existing customers. So it's great. Everybody loves the hunt. Everybody loves to go out and, and acquire new customers and bring them on board. And um, that's, uh, that's a lot of fun. But it's very costly. And, and at the same time, with COVID, a lot of people realize that, that, is not, that they, that's not sustainable. They need to focus on existing customers because especially at the peak, no one was buying. No one was buying anything because everybody was scared and everyone was like, pause everything and we're not going to make any changes. So a lot of businesses realize that they need to start focusing on their existing customers and, and hey, how can we take this customer that is spending $200,000 with us to a million dollar customer or you know they're spending $5,000 with us to a $100,000 customer. So those strategies of, of implementing marketing uh, strategies on existing customers are a little bit different and that's why we we focus on on a lot of that we focus we we'll work with our clients in terms of acquisition an area again that everybody loves but also hey if they're in a uh, in, in b2b sales uh, cycles could be very long it could be six nine twelve months until you close a customer so what are we going to do with them in that process of uh, of turning them into a customer but also towards the uh, towards the other end when they are a customer, how do we, how are we going to approach them to delight them and make sure that we can increase our share of wallet? So that's a, you know, and that's what we, what, what we mean by a fully integrated process uh, for, uh, for marketing. Look, it almost sounds like it's a, a parallel with the dating world. You know, you've got to reel them in, do the courtship to start with, but then you've got to make sure you're keeping them on their toes, making sure the flowers keep coming in every six months or so. But I want to focus a little further that's on right. X Growth here with their. Uh, your, your previous work as well, particularly one space, because I mean, this is a company that you've worked quite closely with. You've turned them from having essentially no leads to now having their own sales pipeline of sorts. Could you walk us through the process with that particular client? Yeah, sure thing. So, you know, uh, that one space was an example where we uh, worked heavily with the, uh, with the management team. So there was, there was not a very strong, there was some marketing experience there, but there was not a lot. So we did a lot of work with the with the management team in terms of understanding the value proposition of that uh, solution to the market. So 
what is it exactly we're trying everybody to know and who is it exactly that we want to uh, to know about that. And once we, once we had a good understanding, in their case, it was the financial services, specifically the accounting firms that they were targeting. Once we had a good understanding about that, we went and created a, a series of assets, whether they were digital or offline assets, in order to get in front of those, uh, those uh, organizations to, to basically present that value prop to them, to those accounting firms that, that we're targeting. So that could look like an ebook, it could look like blogs, it uh, could be a, some, in some of the other clients, could be podcasts, it could be, there's a wide range of digital assets that one can create. So making sure those are created and then working very closely with the sales team in order to not only put that value from in front of the, uh, the, the customer through some of the digital channels, but also through the sales team uh, reaching out and, and putting this uh, useful material in front of them. And that was a process that we were able to create a, a pretty solid pipeline uh, for that team and a lot of other customers of ours. Now, you're mentioning there as well, there's plenty of different digital assets that you can touch on. Obviously, podcasting was one you mentioned. That's quite a niche sort of area there where it, I guess it does you know, require a fair bit of expertise around the audio space, how to set up acoustic treatments. With X-Growth, what services do you host in-house? Are there anything that you sort of outsource when it comes to maybe a more specialized field to help your clients? There, there definitely are certain areas that we do outsource. You know, as I said earlier, because every single approach that we take is a multi-channel approach, mm. you know, we are leveraging advertising, we're leveraging email, we're leveraging calls, we're leveraging direct mail. There are certain parts that we have uh, partners that we've been working on for a long time that we bring in to help us with those uh, with those channels. So, you know, we might have a partner that does the logistics for direct mail. Uh, we might, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example, we had uh, one client that we sent a box of cupcake to them, right? Mm -hmm. And on the cupcake, it said, Google your name. And once they did Google their name, we had, we had bought their name as, a, as an ad on Google with a dedicated wow. landing page for them that they would click on, they would go there, there would be a video and they would say, hey James, thanks a lot for, uh, for jumping on. You know, this is the reason we reached out to you. This is why we would like to have a chat to you. Uh, and this is our value prop. But you know, that direct mail piece is a, is a headache of logistics. So we would have partners that would help us with uh, making sure that that happens. But everything that we bring to the, uh, to the mix, we, we wanna make sure that it contributes that account based, uh, based approach. I was speaking with Shahin Hoda, who is the founder and director of X Growth for our Executive Corner Expert Talks. Now, Shahin, just before I let you go, what are the business outcomes that you drive for? For, for our clients, James, is that what you mean? Yeah, absolutely. So we, you know, we, then the number one metric that we measure, and I think everybody should, should look at when they're, when, when they're working in the B2B space and they are, uh, um, their, their revenue focus is how many meetings can I book for my uh, salespeople? That is, that is probably one of the closest metrics to revenue. And uh, unfortunately, in the marketing space, there are a lot of providers that would come in and they would say, hey, look at these impressions that we got and how many people looked at your ads. And, you know, these are here are some leads that we had for you. And uh, and those are, I think, in, in many ways, very misleading uh, metrics to uh, to look at. So the number one objective that we have whenever we work with our clients is did we get meetings with the right people? Were we able to put the sales team in front of the right people um, to have the right conversation with them? That's the that's number one goal that we have. Yeah, well, I mean, look, that should be any company's goal is always quality over quantity. So great to see that's your approach as well. Now, just before I let you go here, I know that you're doing a lot of stuff in the account-based marketing area, but you're also into a, a, a couple of other domains. What exactly do you have your fingers in? So, uh, so we have a community uh, called Growth Colony, and Growth Colony is a B2B community where we talk with uh, CMOs and marketing directors about a wide range of things that they're, they're doing, uh, about from marketing leadership to, uh, to some of the tactics that are in, in the, in the uh, relevant right now in the space to marketing strategy. We cover a wide range of things, and we've had people like CMO of Salesforce or from Cisco, some of these giant tech organizations that, uh, that kind of dominate the, the landscape, uh, the financial landscape and also other aspects of our life right there to, to talk about some of these components. So we have growth calling that we focus on. 
um, and that's uh, that includes our events and, and podcasts. We uh, we also do a fair bit of software development. That's again that's a piece that comes in quite often as part of the work that we're doing for our clients. There's there's a lot of software development work that mm. uh, that we need to address and our clients help need help with. Those are probably two areas that are a little bit different than um, than uh, or, or not 100% account based marketing focus that uh, that that I that take up a lot of my time uh, these days. Yeah, look, it seems like it's all systems to go for X growth moving forward. Shaheem, thank you so much for your time. Where can we get all the details? What's the website? You could uh, you could look us up on X growth. That's X G R O W T H dot com dot au uh, and uh, or growthcolony.org. Those are two uh, websites that you can get more information. Brilliant. Well, Shaheen, been a lot of fun, mate. Hopefully, we can do it again in the future. Sounds great, James. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Not a worry at all. That's Shahin Hoda, founder and director of X Growth. And if you missed any part of our conversation, you can check it out on our YouTube channel, Kaokai Media, along with all of our previous expert talks. I'm James Preston, reminding you to stay apprised and invest wise with Kaokai. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. The 72nd Ashes series has arrived and in this video I'll let you know how you can watch every single moment of it as well as a rundown of what to look out for. First, please subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon. It's the first series on home soil since the 2017 and 18 series and the first match is set to begin on December 8 and will run through until December 12. So how can you watch it? For Aussies there are a heap of options. Channel 9, of course, no longer holds the rights. Channel 7, however, will be broadcasting all five series fixtures on their digital channel as well as the 7 Plus app, though you will have to sit through ads for both. To watch on 7 Plus, you'll need to make a free account. You'll also be able to watch the series via subscription services Foxtel IQ, Foxtel Now and KO Sports. KO also includes a free 14-day trial. How can you listen to it? If you can't get in front of a screen, you can certainly still catch plenty of the action. ABC Grandstand's digital station is usually the best option for listening to the cricket. The ABC Listen app also offers comprehensive match commentary, and additionally, commercial radio outlets SEN and Triple M will also have radio coverage of the series. What is the schedule? The first test will be played in Brisbane at the Gabba between December 8 and December 12. The second test will take place at Adelaide Oval between the 16th and 20th of December. The third test will take place in Melbourne at the MCG on Boxing Day and will run until December 30. The Sydney test, which is typically the final test, will instead be played as the penultimate fixture. This will double as the pink test which features the use of a pink ball and helps to raise funds for the McGrath Foundation. The Sydney Test will be played from January 5 to January 9. And the fifth and final test will take place in Perth between January 14 to January 18. So what should you be looking out for in this series? Well, the big story ahead of this series is the appointment of a new captain in the form of Pat Cummins, our fast bowler, who has been appointed following the demotion of former captain Tim Payne because of his sexting scandal. Cummins, who was previously the vice captain, becomes the country's 47th test captain. The series also represents a further redemption story for former skipper Steve Smith, who has now been elevated to vice captain years after the sandpaper saga. Australia will be looking to keep their stranglehold of the urn intact. With the 2019 series drawn, Australia retained the Ashes, having won the 2017 and 18 series. 
Through more than 100 years of competition, the overall win and loss ratios remain incredibly close. After 71 previous series, Australia holds a 33 to 32 advantage with six series having been drawn. Now it does promise to be an incredible Ashes series and hopefully you'll be able to catch every Cummins Yorker, David Warner 6 and some incredible glove work from our new wicketkeeper Alex Carey. I am looking forward to it. If you enjoy the information contained in this video then please make sure to give us a sub. Don't forget to share, comment and like and of course press the bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Kalkine. For more information just head across to the website kalkinemedia.com. I'm James Preston reporting for Kalkine. With the advent of a pandemic, innovations in the field of medical healthcare and biotechnology have gained serious momentum. The need of the hour and a strong dependence on the medical system pushed these sectors to a new high. The biggest benefactors of the recent rally are the healthcare, technology and wellness solution related players who have been involved in exploring, developing and operating such beneficial projects. And in Kalkai Media's upcoming InvestNest webinar, you'll get the chance to discover the different innovations in the biotech and healthcare space from a host of experts. The Beyond Science Future of Biotech and Healthcare Harnessing Inventive Approaches webinar on January 28 will give you the opportunity to hear from and have your questions answered by esteemed leaders in the healthcare and biotech space who are valued clients of Kalkai Media. That includes the CEO and Managing Director of PainCheck, Philip Daffis, CEO and Managing Director of Prescient Therapeutics, Stephen Utomi Clark, and Executive Chairman and MD and CEO of Holista Coltec, Dr. Regin Marnika Vasagar. Why wait? Register now and book your space for Kalka Media's upcoming InvestNest webinar on January 28, 2022 at 12.30pm Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. The registration link is mentioned in the video description below. We hope to see you there and remember to stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkine Media. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. The Pump ETH token has jumped a record 6,000%. So is it worth exploring? Let's find out. Hey, and thanks for tuning in. All Shields here for Calcane Media. For some background, the token was launched on the 27th of November and has a current market cap of around 122 million US dollars. Pump EDH is a rebase token that provides high ETH rewards to the token holders. Also, it offers its services through a mobile app and rewards of up to 4% of token value to all the holders of BEP20 ETH. ETH reached an all-time high last week. However, the company said on its website that there is no need to worry if the token value falls because of rebasing procedures which can adjust the total supply to improve the chart. Pump EDH's main attraction is its flexible token pricing. The token's circulating supply automatically adjusts with the price fluctuations, making it less risky. Its expansion mechanism or contraction adjustment is called rebasing. The rebase token's price elasticity could be compared to stablecoins, for example. 
but rebase tokens have more flexibility due to their circulating supply adjustments. When the price is low, the supply of rebase tokens will increase and vice versa to keep the value intact in the user's wallets. So for example, the number of tokens may decrease after purchase, but the value will not change. The Pump EDH token provides 4% ETH, that is BP20, rewards to all its holders. Their development team aims to bring utility to the rebase market through its DApps platform with an integrated swap and iOS Android app. The buy and sell taxes are currently between 13 and 15%. At the moment, the Pump ETH token is ranked 3,373 based on the market cap, according to coinmarketcap.com. It's also listed on CoinGecko and Nomix and is available for trading on PancakeSwap. Now that you're up to speed, check out some of our other videos to boost your financial IQ and stay up to date. This has been Holland Shields for Calcine Media. Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Calkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal. What's in it? how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. Please subscribe to the channel, press the bell icon, you'll be notified when Kalkine has a new video. Stay here for Kalkine Media. Today we're covering how is Starship NFT wooing its investors. And Starship Crypto is a Binance Smart Chain run protocol that aims to bridge the gap between different businesses and users focusing on multiple products such as the Starship NFT, Starbase Wallet and Starship Visa. The Starship Crypto has managed to grab the attention of the investors on multiple fronts. But one of the main reasons it has grabbed eyeballs recently is its NFT game Starship. And Starship has been creating flutters after it tweeted the launch of six Starships models, which would be used during the game. And besides this, it also gave the breakdown of earning potentials of the Starship NFTs, which offers an opportunity to the gamers and investors to enjoy the game and earn at the same time. So how can players maximize their potential from the Starship? Starship is not like your regular NFT game. With the Starship NFTs, the players can venture into different galaxies and accumulate Knite gas traded on the WAX blockchain. And though it is still in the nascent stage, the concept and launch of collections have attracted the investors, and experts feel early investors can benefit from it. And with the pre-sale on, the investors can buy public NFTs, which also includes a space station. With the Starship Crypto, the users benefit from staking and offer the users rewards for holding the token. Now, the users can also benefit from using the Starbase wallet, which facilitates seamless transactions. And Starbase is designed in such a way that it vitalizes the future altcoin gems. It can safely store the token, but it can also send or swap tokens without the use of dApps. But is it worth considering? Let's take a look at that now. Starship is ranked 574th on coin market cap. With the advent of such play to earn games, the market has expanded and is booming. 
as many leading crypto giants are looking to enter the blockchain-based games, it couldn't be a more opportune time for investors to invest in such games and make the most of it. The very fact that Starship NFT has managed to see interest even before its official launch shows that its future could be a good one. If you like this information, please like, share, comment on the video below. Are you at present investing in NFT games? Do you play to earn? How's it going? Please let us know. And subscribe to the channel. If you press the bell icon, you'll be notified when Calcan has a new video. However, for more information and regular updates, there is a website. You can check it out at calcanemedia.com. This is Sage for Calcan Media. Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Holly and you're watching Kalkain TV live from our Sydney studios. Let's get on with our last show of the day, The Last Trade. Well, the Australian economy seems to be locked in between favourable and challenging conditions ever since the Omicron variant has started to spread. This has led to a series of highs and lows for major economic indicators and consequently, sinusoidal trends have continued in the share markets. On the domestic economic front, Australian job vacancies increased by 18.5% in the three months to November of last year. Then looking at the local bourses performance today, the ASX 200 closed up, gaining 48.80 or 0.66% and crossing above its 125-day moving average. The index has lost 1.68% for the last five days, but sits 2.54% below its 52-week high. Then on the sectoral front, 9 of 11 sectors ended higher. Energy was the best performer, gaining 2.84% and 3.08% for the last five days. As for shares, the best performer today was nickel mines, up 6.8%. And thanks to the 1% rise in the price of nickel overnight, it was followed by Life360, Liontown Resources, Imugene and Appen. And then in the unfortunate red zone today of the ASX 200, Domino's Pizza was the biggest laggard, down 4.4%. Other stocks that declined include Reese, Collins Food, Dexas and Metcash. And now for an acquisition update, Stealth Global is expanding its Australian retail footprint, buying power and market position through the acquisition of all the shares of United Tools Limited for 24,000 cash plus a deferred market subsidy of 1.25 million over the past of the next two years. The strategic addition of UTL to Stealth will significantly boost their position as a premier distributor in the Australian industrial MRO supplies marketplace. And today, Stealth Global stock responded to the news by soaring over 13%. In other news, COVID-19 worries continue. Allegiance Coal informed its shareholders that the New Elk mine has experienced a rapid number of COVID cases due to the escalation of the Omicron variant across the U.S. The mine is currently running a single production 10-hour shift per day with its available crew. And following this market update, Allegiance Coal shares fell by 2%. And a 5.1% rise in the price of nickel overnight to a seven-year high propelled shares in nickel mines to jump over 6%. National Australia Bank has attributed rising nickel prices to the mounting expectations of growing demand for electric vehicle production in 2022. And meanwhile, shares of Australian tech company, which operates in the building integrated photovoltaic sector, Clearview, Technologies marked a significant uptick of over 19% today after the company completed its design of an archetype model building of a 15,000 meter squared to demonstrate how Clearview products can achieve a net zero or near zero energy use building. Modeling was completed on a design in Toronto and notably the Toronto Green Standard is one of the toughest building standards in the world with a building code requirement in relation to energy use and building thermal envelopes stepping up in stages until 2030. And a specialty pharmaceutical company, Maine Pharma Group, has begun distribution of tacolimus ointment, a 0.1% in the U.S. 
Tacrolimus ointment is a generic version of Protopic, indicated for the treatment of atopic dermatitis. And according to IQVIA, the annual U.S. market sales for Taco Limus ointment were at 80 million U.S. dollars for the 12 months ending November 2021. Main Pharma shares traded up by nearly 2% today. And now before we take a look at some other trending updates, it's time for a short break. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. Welcome back to the last trade on Calcoin TV. Let's take a look now at the global market performance. First up, Asian stocks followed a rebound in the U.S. after the Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell reassured investors the central bank will challenge inflation to extend the economic expansion. Investors were comforted that Powell's testimony to the Congress did not include any major surprises. And MSCI's broadest index of Asia-Pacific shares outside of Japan rose 1% a one-month high, led by a 3.5% jump for tech stocks in Hong Kong. Meanwhile, Japan's decay rose as well, 1.9%, and then in China, inflation pressures moderated in December, giving the central bank's scope to cut interest rates to cushion the economy's downturn, just as most major nations look to tighten policy. The producer price index rose 10.3% from a year earlier. While the consumer price index increased 1.5 compared with 2.3 in November of last year. And then in the crypto sphere, cryptocurrencies traded in the green today. The global cryptocurrency market cap sits at 2.01 trillion US dollars, a 2.39% rise over the last day. Amid COVID-19 uncertainties, Bitcoin, Ethereum and other cryptos have garnered significant attention across the world. Many see digital currencies as the future of finance. However, in the absence of regulations, cryptos are currently reduced to being a speculative asset class with extreme volatilities. Well, that is a wrap for now on the last trade, but tune in next time for more only on Calcine TV. This is Holly Shields signing off for the day. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV.